Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O attic shape, fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain, in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. In 2012, shortly after Dark Souls 1 came out in 2011, I picked up a copy to try it out in my dorm room freshman year at university, having heard only good things. I was pretty immediately confronted with a few problems. Problem one was that the menus weren't overly intuitive and had a lot of confusing information, at least to a first-timer. Problem two was that back then, text guides were still the most common form of thorough and accessible gaming advice you'd find online, and as we all know, they can sometimes lead you astray, which is funny now, but wasn't always at the time. Problem number three, and this was the biggest one for me, was that I made a bad choice. I had read all about how rough this game was, and I wanted to pick a safe starting class. In an unfortunate fit of sanity, I chose the knight. Let me tell you something about Dark Souls. For the longest time, the prevailing wisdom on the Souls series was that the games were tough and unforgiving, so players were naturally incentivized, or so they thought, to make choices that presented them with the safest gameplay option. Greater risk could mean greater loss, resulting in losing your experience called Souls forever. In hindsight, this system was beautiful, but not all of us understood it. Poking from behind a shield while in heavy armor was a safer choice, so it was the choice a lot of players made. Much has been made of this gameplay mechanic, and clearly the developers have had some competing ideas for visions of what this game genre could do to overcome that problem. And make no mistake, it is a problem, because safest doesn't always mean most fun, and holding block generally means your stamina regenerates more slowly, unless you're playing Sekiro, so without the guard counters that would be later introduced in Elden Ring a full decade later, there isn't much incentive to poking from behind a shield in heavy armor, except for a desire to not take damage. However, the game also gives you a secret ability to avoid damage while also playing aggressively. The invincibility frames on the dodge roll. Let's be clear here, the game does tell you about dodge rolls and it shows you your equip weight. It's not that it's unfair, it's just a little obtuse about communicating how these things come together. If you're a normal, lucky person, you probably figure this out through trial and error. However, I was not normal and lucky and ended up putting the game down past a certain point because I didn't understand how important these mechanics were, and in my ignorance, I became frustrated. I worked my way through the Undead Asylum and had a good time figuring it out. Then I worked my way through Lordran and got pretty lucky. After being stuck in the Undeadburg for hours and hours, and after leaving the lower Undeadburg because I was scared of Miyazaki's dogs, I found the Taurus Demon, he killed himself on accident for me by jumping off the bridge, and cut the dragon's tail off for the Drake Sword. I don't remember how I knew about this. I might have read a tip about cutting tails off of things online and tried it with the bow instead, or I might have seen a friend do it. Either way, I was off to Darkroot Garden, which I then promptly left because Treebeard's children are terrifying. I got stomped by Havel, took forever to slay a Hydra, and was so tired of this game trying to clap my cheeks that when I made it farther up after retracing my steps, I summoned some helpful, jolly cooperators to help me beat the Bell Gargoyles. Okay, we're halfway done. I stomped my heavy metal boots down past New Londo and through Blight Town, where I got to kill Mildred to get her to help me beat Quelag. I might have summoned another player for this as well, but I can't remember. I then found Ceaseless Discharge, couldn't figure out how to beat him without getting stomped, and turned the game off. I wouldn't return to it until 2016. So, what did I do wrong that stopped me from enjoying what is otherwise considered an undisputed masterpiece? Well, I was fat rolling for starters, and I didn't know the roll had iframes. Maybe you could forgive me for not figuring that out since I was just using the weapons and armor that the game started me with. Had I known how much I'd have to level my endurance stat just to mid-roll, I'd have done that first, but I didn't know what I was doing wrong and didn't understand the significance. 
The online guides weren't crazy helpful in this regard, as all they talked about was turtling up and preparing to die. I didn't understand what made this game fun, and was sure everybody else was just crazy. But that was then, and this is now. We are the Hollow Men. We are the Stuffed Men. Leading together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass, or rats' feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion, those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. I'd like to do something a little uncharacteristic here and talk through the process of how the game plays and how its elements unfold. I've been down on that style of writing in the past, and generally still am, but I do feel that talking through an RPG in this way makes some sense, because it marries breakdowns of the game with descriptions of my gameplay experience, using footage for reference. In order to write this video, I felt I had to tell you all a story. The footage you're watching is from a playthrough of Dark Souls that I did over a couple days because I had been thinking about doing an essay like this, but was prompted to get started by Demon Mama's recent Dark Souls streams. If you haven't seen those, they should be on her channel, so feel free to check them out. I also have videos of these games on my second channel where I do different gimmick runs and play with friends, and we just have a lot of fun, so I think it's a good time. What you're watching is part of my attempt at creating a character for this run. My stats ended up a little odd for a while because it took me a while to settle on using the Bandit class's starting weapon. I chose the Master Key as a starting gift because it opens up more of the world. I named and sculpted my ideal character for this run, and crucially, I ended up going with a class that could light roll with their armor and starting weapon equipped. We'll get more into rolling and equip load in a moment. Other starting equipment of note are the black fire bombs, which are very strong in the early game, and a ring that allows us to speak to one of the hidden NPCs in the game. Our options for character creation also include magic or caster builds. Caster builds, also referred to as magic builds, enable three main playstyles. Pyromancer is our starting class for Pyromancy, naturally, and is also a soul level 1 build for challenge runs that can increase its damage by upgrading its Pyromancy flame without dumping stats into the usual caster stats, Intelligence and Faith. Our Intelligence build starting class is the Sorcerer, who uses, again, sorceries. They start off with some soul arrows, and they tend to be the more offensive magical build between Intelligence and Faith builds. Our Faith starting class is the Cleric and it takes quite a bit of investment to level a faith build into using strong offensive miracles, so if you want to play that way, it might be best to temper your expectations. Other starting classes allow for building around stats like Strength and Dexterity, which the game tends to be designed around a bit more closely in terms of boss encounters. There's rarely ever a situation where a Strength build doing physical damage is sidelined in the way that an Intelligence build might be in certain encounters, but on balance, intelligence builds are still strong because they have intelligence scaling melee armaments and powerful ranged options. In addition to the three caster starting classes, I'd argue that the strongest picks here are the warrior and bandit classes, with others like the knight being clunky and having a weapon with poor range, or the thief and hunter classes having weapons with not only poor range but also poor raw damage output or the Wanderer having a suboptimal damage type in physical slash damage. If you're determined to play the game with restrictions, like using your starting weapon only, then these are definitely bad choices, although their stat distribution in cases like the Wanderer, Hunter, or Thief could allow you to easily wield, say, a strong dexterity weapon quite early on if you grab one. Our game's opening cutscene here opens on the Age of Ancients with arch trees and everlasting dragons. At the advent of the first flame, we see the rise of minor beings from the dark. Gwyn, Nido, Isolith and her daughters, and the furtive pygmy all reach for lord souls in the new flame. What's interesting about this opening is that it sets the pygmies and the gods on the same level to begin with, and it implies it was the following events and histories, as well as their decisions, that set them apart in the order of things. 
We'll return to this in time. For now, we see the war with the dragons, including the introduction of Seath, who lacks scales of immortality that made the dragons ageless. The Age of Ancients gives way to the Age of Fire, and humans slowly begin to become undead and hollow, as nothing gold can stay. We are told through implication, but not explicitly, and this is crucial, that the Dark Sign is simply a sign of the fading of the fire, which places it in a neutral context in the first game. In fact, it almost appears to be presented as a sinister quality of man, though the game doesn't tell us this through narration. Such undead become insane and are corralled in the Undead Asylum, where our character begins their adventure. I've got a thing about asylums. Maybe it's because I've been in a psychiatric ward before, and maybe it's because I've long been interested in mental health issues, but they do fascinate me. The idea of an asylum containing people who are losing their minds specifically because they can't die is just a beautiful and tragic little piece of world building, and the line about them awaiting the end of the world has immaculate vibes. Exploring the asylum feels treacherous, but it's mostly quite forgiving. If we wander into the boss arena after lighting the bonfire, the game teaches us the advantage of observing our surroundings and exiting as quickly as possible to return later. The lesson here is to observe the terrain and be tactical. Second chances are possible. In continuing to explore, a few problematic hollows can grief us, but we get our weapons and armor and are allowed to approach the boss from above or through the main door. We get our Estus Flask from Oscar of Astora by trying the stairs and having the boulder knock us down. Crucially, the boulder does not kill us. It's surprising, but we are immediately given the ability to heal with the flask or at the bonfire. Oscar explains his mission and ours, which is fine, but this isn't where the story becomes compelling for me. So far, this game is mostly about what other people want us to do. Anyway, we can drop down on that demon and get some easy damage. And overall, this boss is mostly intimidating, but not unforgiving at all. We can get decent mileage by even dodging away from his attacks, which is perfectly reasonable for a tutorial boss in this game. We exit the Undead Asylum, and on a more personal note, I love the crow that carries us away. It's a neat little twist that reinforces that this strange and seemingly hostile world will still be populated by entities that may wish to help us in our quest. Firelink Shrine gives us a similar experience. We meet a kindly cleric, a crestfallen knight, and a speechless maiden. What ails these knights at arms but their solemn duty handed down also to us? Again, people sing the praises of the vibe of this place, and I have to agree. Heading into the graveyard and catacombs below tends to feel like certain death early on, as does heading down below to New Londo, so most players head into the Undead Burg. I got stuck here for hours back when I first played this game years ago. Now I'm able to work through it pretty well and appreciate its little tricks, like enemies behind corners or rolling barrels down staircases. I don't love how sort of washed out it feels, but for a desiccated castle, I think it looks alright. We can reach two more demon bosses by going up or down, and these also have lessons. The Taurus Demon is a cool looking boss, but it has essentially the same lesson as the Asylum Demon, that being to look around and investigate the boss arena, now with new environmental deaths. This would be a very interesting fight if not for two factors in my mind. First the, toes on the First, the toes of the demon have a damage hitbox. I don't know what it is with Miyazaki, but I need the development team to put those grippers away. Get them out of here. Second, in Dark Souls 1, characters can only roll in four directions. Left, right, forward, and backward. Rolling backward is suboptimal because of how iframes work, and rolling from left to right on the bridge is asking to be knocked off, so rolling forward is what you're taught. This is a good piece of tutorialization since rolling in the direction that an attack is coming from specifically is how to optimize the dodge roll. Your roll has iframes or invincibility frames, describing a certain series of frames of the animation of the roll where your character is unable to take damage. This is not intuitive and therefore needs to be tutorialized. In a way, the Taras Demon is good for this, but it's a little incomplete due to the way it's executed. On the other hand, you can just beat him by dropping on him and running back and forth, which is the path of least resistance. This is also the case for the Capra Demon, which does have the added bonus of teaching the player two subtle things. One is how to funnel multiple enemies in a confined space. The other is to approach boss fights carefully, because if you run past all the enemies, they will be waiting to kill you when you finish the fight. 
This isn't a constant in the game otherwise, but I like that as a possibility and think it makes approaching this fight interesting because you have to be careful. Otherwise, the only bosses we have to worry about in these areas are above or below. Going above, we can follow through on the shortcut we reach after talking to Best Boy Solaire and running from the dragon. And, if we're very crafty, we can get right past the dragon and run straight through another gate into the Undead Parish. The alternatives are more treacherous, but definitely worth trying if you're getting frustrated or don't know the game as well. We can meet Andre the Blacksmith to upgrade our weapons, and approach the Bell Gargoyles to ring the first Bell of Awakening. The miniature Tower Knights, Balder Knights, Hollows, and a single Sorcerer block our path. The Sorcerer and Hollows in particular are a challenge, because his buff makes them more dangerous, and their numbers can overwhelm us if we're reckless. After that, we can free Lautrec and approach the Gargoyles. We can also summon him and Solaire for this fight. A quick word on Solaire. His introduction was a breath of fresh air when I first played these games, because I really thought I was going to have to do everything alone. The first half of the game is quite forgiving in this way. Only the three previous demons necessarily need to be approached alone until you meet Guinevere. Solaire is charming and has an odd but very warm personality that is such a breath of fresh air in this oppressive atmosphere. His lightning miracles are also a welcome addition to the fight against the Bell Gargoyles, because they're weak to light. The game provides you with lightning resins earlier in the Undeadburg if you're willing to dig around a bit, and those are useful here. With Solaire, your resins, and a little aggression, the Gargoyles are total chumps. Nevertheless, it's a fun fight and very memorable as the first major skill check in the game. There's another NPC we meet on our way back down from the Bell Tower, Oswald the Partner from Kareem. Kareem clerics use miracles of Gwyn's pantheon, but specifically governs Sim, the domain of the mother goddess Velka, one of the few heretical deities. We'll return to this later, but for now, it's important to note his place in what is otherwise rightfully Gwyn's church, also serving indictments for the Blades of the Dark Moon, as well as pardoning Sim. On the gargoyles themselves, it bears pointing out that some people have forwarded the idea that the Dark Souls games have some superficial Christian elements but ultimately can't be meaningfully analyzed from a Christian mythological, theological, or philosophical perspective. I could not possibly, even as an atheist, disagree more with this idea. Dark Souls does not merely deal in loosely Christian aesthetics due to its Western medieval influences, it specifically utilizes those elements to create deeper meaning. Miyazaki has commented that the world of Dark Souls is inspired by his experience reading Western fantasy and only being partly literate in the language he was reading, creating a kind of gap in his knowledge. We can't allow the deliberate gaps in Dark Souls that mimic this to mislead us. This imagery is deliberate. There's a real allusion to the god of Abrahamic faiths and the architecture erected in his name. Heading downtown, we can clamber through the depths to fight the gaping dragon. This boss is genuinely a bit of an eye roll to me, but on a regular new game cycle, he's pretty doable, again with your Lightning Resins and Solaire, to exploit the same weaknesses as the Gargoyles. I just find his moveset a bit awkward, and again there's that hitboxing on the toes when he walks. You can cut the tail off to get a special weapon though, which means there's a neat surprise in this fight for players willing to mess around. You have to explore the depths a bit to find the sorcerer that you can kill to not have him fire sorceries at you from the balcony above the boss arena. The Gaping Dragon does, however, have an interesting design in the sense that it mimics a dragon but is really more of a demon or other creature. Having something like this adjacent to Blight Town in Quelex Domain is a nod that the further you go, the stranger and more frightening this world will become. As an aside, it may be helpful to do a little more exploring at this stage. From here, as with the case of which Bell of Awakening to ring first, there's a choice of directions. We can move on from the Gaping Dragon and adventure down the long way, but I chose to reroute and prepare for the fight ahead. This highlights the options available to the player at all times. Having a tough time here? Try that path over there. In search of a swankier hat, I ventured into Darkroot Garden, and wandered into the arena of the Moonlight Butterfly, a haunting boss fight that presents the player with an early premonition of the horrors of the work of the Duke, Seat the Scaleless, originally met in the opening cinematic. Many works of sorcery are originally his works, and the Moonlight Butterfly, like many other creatures, appears to have originally been somewhat human, or perhaps of another race like the gods. It's little moments like these that I value so much in Dark Souls, because if you're looking for an explanation about why this creature exists, you can come up with one. 
but the reality is that it's memorable precisely because it's so bizarre and provocative. The same could be said for another early boss in another direction. Pinwheel is deep down in the catacombs past hordes of skeletons and tons of traps. He's generally seen as kind of a neato fanboy, imitating the garb of the Great Lord. Pinwheel's own ability to duplicate himself ironically adds to his feeble copycat characterization. We disturb him in his workshop, and although, like the butterfly, he isn't a difficult fight at the proper level, he does allow us to obtain a potentially useful item, and he is a sort of strange and frightening presence in a world that sometimes defies logic. Dark Souls needs this kind of energy, the potential for anything to be around the next corner, in order for its atmosphere to truly work. We can go beneath Firelink Shrine and past New Londo to take the elevator in Blight Town down for a slightly quicker descent. I think if the player couldn't get the Master Key, this might feel like a bigger reveal, but truth be told, when we fight through these areas, Blight Town often feels annoying more than anything else, especially at lower levels when you can't just wreck every tough enemy. I skip as much of Blight Town as possible every time, not because of any one mechanic, but because it's just less frustrating and annoying, and way quicker to come at it from Firelink. By contrast, getting invaded by Maneater Mildred in the Swamp allows us to summon her to fight Quelag, which is a very direct way to make that fight easier. In general, this fight isn't too bad. You can get stuck in Quelag's legs and hit by her giant explosion attack, but overall she's pretty sound. What's interesting is that this boss fight is exceptionally difficult for magic users, pyromancers in particular. This will be a theme for some bosses in these games. But what the first two Dark Souls games have as an advantage is that the game incentivizes carrying a weapon that is upgraded with regular Titanite up until at least the late game, where basic upgrades will do just fine. And in Dark Souls 1, you can carry just a lightning weapon in addition to your regular abilities as a sorcerer or pyromancer. If you are expecting to be able to kill Quelag with spells early in the game, you'll likely be disappointed. The story of this boss is actually really tragic. Through some in-game item descriptions and dialogue, as well as environmental storytelling, you can glean that Quelag was waylaying and slaying undead to farm humanity as a resource to heal her sister, the Fair Lady, who saved Blighttown by attempting to swallow all the poison of the region, and so the afflicted came to worship the sisters as their saviors. It's nice that you can encounter these little stories along the way as you progress through the game, but I'd say this is the first one that's really laid out, if you can find the pieces where they hide. By now, you'll probably have also encountered some environmental storytelling, in that the rats you fought against will give you humanity directly or drop it on their bodies. These rats, of course, consume human remains in the sewers. Humanity can also be obtained by killing NPCs, killing invaders, or looting some corpses. Why do undead lose their humanity? Why do undead resemble the pygmies from the opening cutscene? Who was the furtive pygmy exactly? This game has answers, but the most obvious is the evident fact that the furtive pygmy's lord soul is nowhere to be found. You can only find the others. But sometimes, when you kill certain enemies, the souls you absorb contain humanity. The essence of humanity, what separates humans from undead, is little pieces of the soul of the pygmy, split and fractured across all the descendants of the pygmies across all the souls of man. This can be a little difficult to pick up on at first, but it explains why Quelag wants these souls for her sister, why giving the Fair Lady Humanities eases her suffering, and why Humanities heal our bodies and stave off our curse. It's all quite interwoven, but that's enough of this area for now. You can ring the bell here and work your way back to Firelink if you have the key, or to Darkroot Garden through the elevator in the Valley of the Drakes if memory serves. You will have gotten a cutscene where you can see the giant opening the gate to Sen's Fortress. I actually ended up quitting the game at about this point, the first time around all those years ago. The reason might not be what you think. Sen's Fortress wasn't too rough for me. In fact, I didn't really attempt it at all. I actually went a little further down and met the demon boss Ceaseless Discharge. I didn't know about the hidden bonfire at the Fair Lady or that you can get a cinematic kill on Ceaseless Discharge if you bait him into jumping at you after you run to the exit of his boss arena, because there wasn't actually anything intuitive in the game to show me those things. So I just ended up getting killed by him and respawning at the bonfire nearby, with no extra humanity or souls and only five Estus to fight this big monstrosity. I gave up. It wasn't necessarily too hard, but I didn't get it. The game felt punishing in ways I didn't understand and didn't care to. If I had never picked this game back up except to play it to get footage to make this video, I think I still wouldn't get it. 
The game feels like it has a lot of jank, even in the remaster, which is what you'll be seeing on screen, and it really drags down the experience for me. The dodging is clunky, and the handful of really strong peak boss fights are dwarfed by the goofy Reddit ones. Later games just have so many fantastic fights and combat loops that this one tends to feel like the daughter and grandfather that everyone slows down to walk with because they love him. I'm perplexed by people who think of this game in terms of it being their favorite in the series for reasons other than nostalgia or enjoying hit trading in full Havel's armor or turtling behind shields. I can understand if that's what you want, but otherwise this feels like a weaker entry in the series, and to be honest, we haven't even gotten to the bad parts yet. I say all of that, believing in my heart that there is also an understated beauty here. When the combat clicks, it really clicks, and everything is so strange and wonderful once you allow yourself to stop worrying and bathe in the music and vibes that I do get why people like it. I don't think it's the best from Soft Souls like, but I understand the appeal. This game does also have something over one of its successors. I sing the praises of the combat loop of the Dark Souls 3 boss fights often enough, but they are definitely a case of using essentially two buttons on your controller, unless you need to heal or count your joysticks as buttons. You need your roll button, and you need your right bumper light attack button. That's basically it. Dark Souls 1 has a different appeal. The combat is slower, and physical damage subtypes matter more, and your weapon can easily get stuck hitting the walls of a tight corner. So if a weapon has a different heavy attack move that allows you to swing differently or do a different type of physical damage, mixing up your attack strings isn't just for PvP anymore. It's a feature of your PvE experience as well, and that's nice. I am going to skate over PvP in this game, as I find it pretty deplorably bad. Nobody likes getting chain backstabbed. The PvP covenants are conceptually interesting, and I do appreciate the idea, but the mechanics make for a very shoddy execution in this game, specifically in my personal opinion. There's something there if you want it, but I can't defend it. Returning to the progression path, Sen's Fortress is near where you met Siegmeier, and makes for a fun series of devilish traps and tough enemies. Moving through this area is pretty fun once you get the hang of what you're expected to do. The traps can be frustrating, but this game gives you infinite tries and a bonfire before the fortress. So what are you afraid of exactly? Don't let it psych you out. These games are mostly bark and only a little bite. You can actually kill a number of the enemies using the traps or run past them entirely. Once you clear it, you can summon Tarkus to fight the Iron Golem boss. The Iron Golem is one of those enemies where damage types do matter, but Tarkus can actually kill him for you, so again, it's pretty forgiving. He's little more than a trial, more of a last trap in a long line of traps than a boss. Past him lies an Orlando. This is the last part of the game before the experience becomes less linear in terms of which bosses you're able to approach, where things really open up and we get to start revisiting characters from the opening cutscene besides the daughters of Isolith like Quelag. I actually don't mind this so much, as I think the real story of these games is always the player's story, so the weaker story beats in Dark Souls 1 are always the ones that are just Gwyn's story. The opening cutscene we looked at earlier is cool, but it's a lore dump. I don't care that much about this, at least not in comparison to what my character is actually living. On the topic of linearity specifically, I imagine a few people consider the first parts of the game very non-linear, and in a sense I think that's true, but I also think that there are some limitations on this. For starters, you have a choice of which bell to ring first, and sometimes you have a choice of how to approach each bell, so that's non-linearity. But you do have to ring the bells, and you do get funneled into Sen's Fortress, and you do have to approach An Orlando from one direction, and you do have to beat Ornstein and Smo to get the Lord Vessel. In tandem with this, the game places very artificial-feeling limits on how far into the Tomb of the Giants and Lost Isolith you can explore, and you can't get into the Duke's archives at all. I don't think there's a great reason for this, especially not when the Four Kings and Sif can be done early. Still, you do have some amount of choice and freedom, so it's not for nothing. I actually like the tense navigation of fighting the Painting Guardians on the rafters, or approaching the Silver Knights on the ramparts in An Orlando, because you only ever need to beat it once as opposed to navigating Blight Town both ways multiple times. An Orlando is an almost perfectly designed level in the game, and it really capitalizes on the sense of grandeur in the story. Seeing An Orlando for the first time is more rewarding than a dozen opening cutscenes. 
This is our story. We fought hard to get here, and now it's time for the Slam Jam Brothers. For areas, the Undead Parish, Blighttown, and Sen's Fortress are the major increasing skill checks prior to An Orlando. Similarly, for bosses, the Bell Gargoyles, Capra Demon, and Quelag feel like the major skill checks prior to Ornstein and Smo. This time, no clever tricks and summons will solo this fight for you. Solaire can help, but he often goes down just before or just after the start of the second phase if you play too passively, meaning you have to get good, as they say. For your build, there are also a number of checks here, which is why having a giant blacksmith here is a strong choice. Unfortunately, if you didn't get the large ember and didn't get enough titanite going into An Orlando, you may have to run all the way back through the previous areas. This is tedious and annoying. However, provided you've paced yourself, the giant blacksmith can catch you up to speed, and you'll be ready to slam and jam in no time. With a boss weapon, a lightning weapon, a well-upgraded fire weapon, some pyromancies, some sorceries, or a really big heavy weapon, you can deal decent damage, and provided you're light rolling or have some decent physical and lightning resistance combined with a large enough health and stamina pool, this fight is eminently doable. This will be the last time the game gives you everything you need directly before a fight in such an easy manner, with the exception of the potential to summon Solaire in two later fights if you play things right. Slowly, beautifully, the training wheels come off. Ornstein and Smo are one of the 12 times that I think the Dark Souls games really nailed an interesting idea for a boss fight with multiple opponents. People are fond of calling these gank fights, but I personally feel that a gank tends to imply something is unfair and unbalanced. In the case of the times in Dark Souls 1 where these fights work, namely this one and the Capra Demon, it's usually because there's a way for the player to even the fight. The Capra Demon has the uneven elements of the terrain in the boss arena, and Horny and Smeg have their varied movement speeds. Ornstein is faster, meaning the dominant strategy for the first phase is to keep away from Smo and fight Ornstein. Meanwhile, the hitboxing in the two different second phases is more forgiving in Ornstein's case, meaning the easier route in one half makes the other half harder and vice versa. Having one of the enemies be faster and more aggressive feels fairer as well, so we avoid the sorts of issues people tend to have in the Throne Watcher and Defender or Godskin duo fights. The presentation of this fight is also immaculate. We'll learn more about these guys later, but becoming acquainted with Ornstein and Smo this early gives the player something to chew on as the series progresses. One of these is an honorable knight and the other an executioner playing at knighthood, making the very idea of these two collaborating smoothly seem preposterous, or just unlikely. After this fight, we meet the illusion of Guinevere. We find out later that she left An Orlando to marry a character called Flame God Flam, and we'll have to revisit that later. She gives you the Lord Vessel and tells you about your mission. She's definitely very beautiful, and should you choose to darken An Orlando, the boss fight with the real god presiding over it, Dark Sun Gwendolyn, will immediately be open to you. The sunlight illusions will be dispelled, and the city will pass into eternal night. Gwendolyn is an interesting character. Born under the sign of the moon, he was raised as a girl, but is generally treated as a male character otherwise. He sort of defies the boundaries of gender, and fans frequently identify him as a kind of femboy or quasi-transgender character of many possible genders. His boss fight sucks. You chase him down a seemingly infinite corridor, dodge his attacks, and get a few in yourself before rinsing and repeating. Defeating Gwendolyn rewards us with his soul, but also his armor set which can be purchased from a vendor later. It is the Moonlight set, and he is a Faith Sorcerer, implying a connection to Seath the Scaleless, inventor of such sorceries, a point which is further affirmed by Gwendolyn's snake-like appendages. He is the leader of the Blades of the Dark Moon Covenant, cementing his connection with punishing sin against the gods, a connection also with Velka. Destroying the illusion of Guinevere is one example of a sin, but indictments can be served by players as well. There is another hidden boss in An Orlando available through the painting underneath the rafters we passed by earlier. If we go back to the Undead Asylum, we can challenge a version of the Asylum Demon and explore a little to find the peculiar doll item in our old cell. This doll enables us to get sucked into the painted world of Ariamis, presumably the name of the painter, and we can navigate this treacherous area with tons of neat twists and turns and strong enemies to challenge crossbreed Priscilla. What she is across of is a little open to interpretation, 
but she seems to be a cross between the race of gods and a dragon, presumably a pale dragon. She's likely related to both Gwyn and Seath. She actually tries to talk us out of fighting her, and if we do, she turns invisible and is a relatively engaging one-on-one -on -one fight. If not, we can exit the level behind her and leave her in peace. I think this is a cool addition to the game, and appreciate that we can just leave her alone. Priscilla also becomes relevant in a future game, but that's a story for another time. For now, note that slaying her is considered a sin also, cementing a further connection with this mysterious hidden mother goddess Velka, alongside crow enemies that appear to be Velka's servants, and a rapier bearing Velka's name, among other things. The endgame takes us back through some old levels and into some new ones. We can teleport now, so we have a couple choices. We can talk to Framped, the giant serpent and Firelink, if we haven't already. We can also avoid him, if we have so far, and go to Andre to get the crest of Artorias and adventure through the woods of Darkroot Garden to find Great Wolf Sif. He's a pretty simplistic but fun fight, and beating him nets us the Covenant of Artorias. In the event that we do the DLC first and meet him here second, he'll remember us from there, and we'll get a different interaction with him. This has cemented Sif as a kind of sympathetic figure in the Dark Souls pantheon, and we can see why. He does not want to hurt us, he is only protecting his master's memory. After beating him, we can take the reward from his fight in the Covenant of Artorias Ring, and descend into New Londo. His boss souls grant us a few types of weapons, both of which can be useful. One version of the sword we can get from the soul can slay the ghost of New Londo without the use of the transient curse consumable, while the shield we get from it is a great shield with extra stability that I would recommend if you prefer to block through fights in this game. Let's talk shop in New Londo. This is one of the two non-DLC late game areas that I actually like. You're given the ability to beat back its tough enemies at the beginning, and you can choose to run past some of them, although there's always a significant risk in that, and I genuinely would recommend taking at least large parts of the level slow and steady. The vibes are immaculate, and it has a neat puzzle where you can let the water out and descend into the lower levels. You have to wear the special ring you got from Sif to challenge the boss, which feels a little odd only because the Sif fight was better than this one, the Four Kings. First of all, there aren't four kings. If you don't kill them quickly, there can actually be multiple more than four, and they will keep spawning in. I don't like this. If there were only four and they slowly spawned in, that would maybe feel more manageable, but the boss arena is a big empty arena, and to make matters worse, the attacks from the kings are obnoxious. Their melee attacks are all well and good, but their magic attacks will follow you to the ends of the earth, and if you dodge them, they will eventually loop back around, sometimes through the floor, and hit you anyway. Their grab attack is seemingly almost magnetically attracted to you, which is frustrating. I genuinely think the people who complain about Dark Souls 2's hitboxing, who ape this game endlessly, are huffing some extreme nostalgic copium. This fight is janky as all hell, which is going to become a theme for the endgame, and is sad, because having tougher fights like these should ideally feel like a series of Ornstein and Smo moments, where there's a newer, higher level skill check awaiting you. The other serpent we can talk to after the Four Kings, if we didn't talk to Frampt, is Koth. The Kingseeker and Darkstalker are both setting up different endings for the game, but in their own way, they're also remarkably similar. Their methods of guiding undead, of guiding players to their own suffering and fulfillment of a larger goal, is pretty consistent. If we refuse to follow Kingseeker Framp's path and link the fire, he will nevertheless appear before us, having seemingly accepted an end to the Age of Fire for now. The serpents appear to really believe in the idea of an age beyond fire, of something that might wait for them there. Are they vestiges from the Age of Ancients, seeking a way back to reclaim their dragon nature? They appear invested, either way, in correcting the course of things, and it is the sacrifice of the vestiges of humanity that enable this. By the cry amen and the slaughter of the unworthy, the world slippeth back into place, whatever betide. The Duke's archives are my other favorite late game area. They're strange and wonderful, and also have some interesting puzzles that you can solve by exploring. The level has a fake-out where Seath will kill you and you can't kill him, and this respawns you in a jail cell in the archive itself. When escaping, the environment is really haunting, in no small part due to the tentacle monsters aggroed by the grating music. Once you get out of that area by killing a snake and getting a key, you can adventure onto the Harry Potter staircase section, and traversing this takes you to a bonfire and a secret shortcut into the Crystal Cavern. This is another puzzling and visually interesting area, 
and once you figure out using the falling snowflakes where you can walk on the invisible platforms, it's a pretty easy run to the boss. To kill Seath, you have to break his crystal or bait him into doing it. In general, this fight is conceptually cool, but very mechanically frustrating. Because the arena is a little small for his hitboxing, you can cut his tail off for a cool weapon, but I wasn't able to in this footage because he turns just a little too fast, and it takes a few too many cuts in the right places, and in the confined spaces, his tail attacks do too much damage and have such broad hitboxes. The knockdown they do is also rough. I could spam roll and it would still feel like it took forever. If you fight him normally, he's relatively easy. Seath is the original sorcerer aside from Izalith, and as such, he's physically frail and intellectually advanced for a dragon. Living in a haunted library full of powerful crystals and devious experiments, he stands, or slithers, among the more haunting interactions in this game. I just wish his fight was more engaging. Conversely, traversing the catacombs to the Tomb of the Giants is a huge hassle. In general, this area is obnoxious. You can get a skeleton lantern from killing all the lantern bearers from the catacombs, but this is rather long and tedious, not to mention quite dangerous when you get to the wheel skeletons. Alternatively, doing Lost Isolith first and finding the Sunlight Maggots can net you a helm that lights the area. This is also a bit out of your way. The quickest way to get a light source is to follow the prism stones through the dark to Patches, let him kick you off the ledge and pick up the loot. Exploring this area is, again, rather tedious, and the enemies are quite unforgiving. You do get a bonfire a decent portion of the way down, and you can run relatively quickly from there to the area boss, Gravelord Nito. Nito suffers from having infinitely respawning skeletons in his arena. You might have gone out of your way to get a decent divine weapon ahead of time, and you'll need it if you don't want to be facing multiple skeletons at the same time as Nito, including giant skeletons if you stray far enough. Nito's moveset is pretty acceptable if you stay close to him and only back away when he uses his explosion attack, and baiting the explosion this way does temporarily slow down the skeletons, so that's generally the best approach. However, being a bit slow in his moveset and having so many skeletons, plus the possibility for the player to get stuck in the map environment altogether, makes this a miss for me. Nito's one of the few characters from the opening cutscene that we actually get to directly meet, so like Seath, it's a little disappointing that his fight isn't more engaging. Shout out to all the cleric and paladin players who get to roleplay hard in this section of the game, and shout out to Nito for just chilling in his grave and not really being a nuisance to anybody until we roll up and reckon. In going back to this section of the game and mulling it over, I actually feel this specific character is the most underdeveloped. The Four Kings, the Witch of Isolith, and Seath the Scaleless all have their own little pieces of significance, but Nito is really just a king in his kingdom. He isn't trying to save the world or conquer it. He seems to just want to be left alone in peace. Maybe that's actually what's wrong with him, or maybe it's our quest that's the problem. The last late game area is Lost Isolith. Returning to where we killed Quelag, we can kill her brother, the Ceaseless Discharge, who can be a little obnoxious, but is easily killed by luring him to the first part of his arena and knocking him off the edge. This is another boss who is just doing his own thing until we show up, and this fight again gives us the creeping sensation that we might be the bad guy here. All these bosses are intimidating, and we're killing them either for our own ambitions or Gwyn's, but they're just living life, and are our goals really that worthy? Questions for later. Moving on, we can get a second invasion by Kirk in addition to the previous invasion, and we can fight the demon Fire Sage, a second reskin of the Asylum Demon, now with the Stray Demon's magic explosion attack. In general, the reuse of this boss feels very lazy, and we can understand why that might have been when looking around this area in general. This place feels unfinished, and that's because it is. Late in its development cycle, this game was rushed, and the half dozen random Taurus Demons and Congregation of Capra Demons drives that home. There isn't a lot of thought to this enemy placement. The shortcuts and loops and bonfire placements in this level reveal an area that is mostly just empty space and random enemies. Visually, it's provocative in how intimidating it is. In terms of gameplay, it's shallow. We can find Solaire here, and if we didn't give the Fair Lady 30 humanity to open a shortcut, he'll have gone nearly hollow, so we kill him, which is sad and poignant for such a bad area. But the worst of it is the eventual area boss. On our way there, we get our third invasion by Kirk, and later we can find his armor abandoned near the Fair Lady, implying he was killing undead for the same reason Quelag was, to heal her. The area boss, after we fight him, is the Bed of Chaos. This boss appears to be a transformed and transfigured demon version of the Witch of Isolith and her two daughters, 
the result of an attempt to kindle a new first flame using her Lord Soul. You have to break the two orbs on the sides and then run forward in front of the boss to get it to break the floor so that you can jump down under it and run up and kill its core, a bug. Unfortunately, other spots in the arena can break too, and if you fall through them, it's just death and there's nothing you can do. Through multiple tedious runbacks and attempts, we can kill this boss who did nothing wrong other than exist, and we're finally ready to confront Lord Gwyn. But first, we have the DLC to attend to. As a parting word to the lion's share of the base game of Dark Souls 1, I think it's fitting to end in Izalith because of what Izalith represents. In terms of Sin, the Witch of Izalith did little more than do for her kingdom with the Chaos Flame what the First Flame and Gwyn did for Gwyn's kingdom. Even her self-immolation ends up serving her kingdom like Gwyn's does, except for her it is a selfless moment of creation, not a fearful attempt at stagnation. Maybe this distinction is why we're allowed to meet what remains of Gwyn, but are only shown what Izalith becomes. This question of mirrored narratives brings up an interesting point about the late game in terms of some of the other areas as well. Is New Londo not in some ways the inverse of Nido's catacombs, with both embracing death and darkness, but with one embracing the darkness of humanity due to the recklessness of its rulers and ultimately being destroyed to suppress that darkness within, while the other embraces a darkness without, a literal darkness of the world, finding a kind of stagnation and death? Even Seath, in some ways, appears to mirror the innovation of Izalith, but instead of creating new life, he transforms and warps existing life. The end of this game is full of parallels. Like with Nido and the Catacombs, here we find in Izalith a civilization of a different sort, and we upend that civilization, presumably to save our own. Dark Souls 1 has a lot of killer-be-killed beats in its gameplay and narrative, so players might not have given it much thought early on, but by the time you're able to reflect on the endgame, we see ourselves ripping out the still-beating hearts of entire other cultures and forms of life to sustain our own, or Gwyn's. It would appear to be a prompt for the player to ask whether this is all worth it, and funnily enough, that question is what preoccupies the end of the game. Our choice will be binary, because we have to decide what we've learned here. Calm and serene thy moments glide along, and may the muse inspire each future song. Still with the sweets of contemplation blessed, may peace with balmy wings your soul invest. But when these shades of time are chased away, and darkness ends in everlasting day, on what seraphic pinions shall we move and view the landscapes in the realms above? There shall thy tongue in heavenly murmurs flow, and there my muse with heavenly transport glow, no more to tell of Damon's tender sighs or rising radiance of Aurora's eyes. For nobler themes demand a nobler strain, and purer language on the ethereal plane. Cease, gentle muse, the solemn gloom of night now seals the fair creation from my sight. The Artorias of the Abyss DLC can be accessed, if you're running some of the later editions, by killing the golem behind the Hydra that's keeping Princess Dusk captive, summoning Dusk to speak with her, killing the golem in the Duke's archives that holds her amulet, and approaching the area where we first rescued her to trigger a cutscene where a hand grabs us and pulls us into the past of this area. All signs point to us time traveling through this region, and we can meet some curious people here. Mostly, though, the features of this place, Ulysseal, that people tend to care about are the challenging areas and difficult bosses. This DLC did get a bit of a fairer treatment in development than the late game of Dark Souls 1, and it shows. For myself, I'm a little 50-50 on these bosses. I find the first boss, the Sanctuary Guardian, a little annoying. Some of the attacks are engaging, but overall its movement speed feels a little fast for this game, which can be frustrating. The Sanctuary Guardian is a demon, like the ones in the Asylum, or around the Bell Tower, or in An Orlando, and this is a strong indicator that Gwyn, as with some of the dragons, appears to have made peace with, and even partnered with, this other race. This casts Gwyn's actions in an interesting light, orbiting his attempt to hold on to power. As we progress, we see the previous days of Ulysseel and can engage with or run past some tough enemies. 
Our next boss is my favorite in the whole game, Knight Artorias. Honestly, this makes my top 10 favorite bosses in the trilogy. His moveset and the pacing of his fight is just so satisfying, and if you play aggressively enough, you really feel like you're going up against this larger-than-life hero from the past. I've heard some discourse about this fight being good because you're fighting someone on your level, and I've seen some backlash against that perspective. Overall, I think it's more or less on the money. Bosses will very rarely be exactly on the player's level, and a fight like Artorias presents you with an enemy that does more damage and takes more damage to kill than you do, which makes the matchup uneven, but that's the challenge. You aren't his equal in every way, but he is a relatively humanoid character, and so his fight does portray the fantasy of two figures clashing in single combat, which I like. This fight generates a very man-to-man -man vibe, and it makes sense to think of it that way, because this is our personal attempt to redeem a fallen knight in terms of who he tried to be, and that is also very much the story of this DLC. You can meet two more of Gwyn's knights here. Kiaren will speak to you on Artorias' grave, as she seems to have cared for him deeply, and Hawkeye Go will talk to you at length and help you shoot down Black Dragon Calamite. You have to see Calamite fly by in the valley below to trigger this dialogue, which means he's probably killed you unless you knew about this, and Go gets a cool cutscene where he 360 no-scopes Calamite out of the sky. From here, you can take him down. I remember people really liking this fight, but for me, it's a bit annoying. I don't love all of Calamite's attacks. His moveset has some interesting and annoying moves in it, so I think it's a little half and half for me. This was an early attempt at true dragon slaying by From Software, a second stab after Seath's fight. And it is admittedly an improvement. The pacing is quicker, which simultaneously takes advantage of the potential in the combat system, while also revealing the clunkiness of some of these earlier iterations on the mechanics. The hitboxing can feel a bit odd for a fight where damage is so high and performance is so tight, but when it comes together, I can see why it's popular, or especially why it was at the time. Overall, I don't like this fight as much as many other people, but I can see its charm. The next fight, however, I actually like a lot. Descending through the Ulusil Township after Artorias takes us to the Chasm of the Abyss, with spooky floating humanity enemies echoing the dark nature of man, and a really memorable final boss. Manus is, as far as I can tell, the primeval man, in the sense that he's actually the furtive pygmy himself. His body has been unearthed from its burial henge by the residents of Ulusil in a ploy by an untrustworthy serpent similar to the fate of New Londo. Because this is the past, and because Sif was the companion of Artorias, we can meet Sif and rescue him in advance of fighting Manus. You'll be able to summon him when you get snatched inside the boss arena. Manus as a boss fight is truly incredible. The pacing of his attacks and his sheer aggression encourages you to play the same way. If you summon Sif, the two of you can take him from different angles, and it's just incredibly fun and heated to fight through this exchange in a relatively confined, but not overly claustrophobic area. He's probably the real final boss of this game in terms of being punishing, engaging, and fair. Defeating him frees Princess Dusk from his grasp, and with that, we can end things. We can enter the true Firelink Shrine and find our god. The run-up to Gwyn is very cool, and helpfully provides you with late-game upgrade items to finalize your build if you haven't already. The Black Knights prior to the boss are the real knights remaining from Gwyn's campaign against the demons. Gwyn himself looks different from the opening cutscene, which is intriguing because many players interpret this as Gwyn going hollow. I want to tell you that this is not possible. Gwyn isn't hollow as such, because hollowing is what happens when a human loses their souls. Gwyn looks that way, similar to a hollow human, because he's spending his soul to prolong the Age of Fire, and he can't keep this up much longer. Gwyn is fast, and his theme is tragic and memorable. He punishes the player's every move and takes no quarter. He can be parried, and doing so does open the opportunity for a critical hit, so there is a sense of fighting a larger-than-life figure and being able to outplay him one-on-one. -on -one. Overall, it's not a bad fight, just not quite as mechanically deep as many might have liked. Killing Gwyn requires us to immediately choose the endings in which we link the fire 
or otherwise ascend as the Dark Lord of Man. Oddly enough, this takes us immediately to the next game cycle, where we take our current build and start over at the beginning. The game cycles mirror the story of the Cycles of Fire, and, intriguingly, no matter what we choose, it all begins again. Just as when Gwyn linked the fire, it faded once more until it becomes our duty to do so. There's something depressing and haunting about that, and we get the impression that, in trying to change the world, all of our attempts were futile. The world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper, Gwyn. For thine is the kingdom. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest, thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like, states brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark illumine, and what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. The beginning of Dark Souls 2 is more moody and emotionally direct to the player than the opening cutscenes of the other two games. For starters, though the dialogue of the cinematic is draped in myth and vague poetic language as always, the character we see in the cutscene is actually us. The player is being addressed directly by an old blind woman in red, evocative of the spider-thread-spinning woman of the Kurosawa adaptation of Macbeth called Throne of Blood, but more specifically to the story, she's the first of four such women we meet as we begin our journey. The Dark Souls series has always been heavy with Western inspiration, so using this kind of imagery feels right at home. The old woman tells us that long ago, a land called Dranglaic existed, and that we will one day stand before its decrepit gate without really knowing why. This haunting exposition is paired with an understanding of the player as being someone who has died and gone hollow, losing their memories, forgetting even the faces of those they knew. Arriving in the dark ruins, the player appears to stand before a gate, even as the old woman mentioned, and ghosts leer and darkness swirls, as if we were crossing into the land of the dead. The player hesitates, and then dives, falling into darkness. The area in which we awaken is called Things Betwixt. I've always been fascinated by this area of the game. It's undoubtedly the most mysterious and haunting location, but in Dranglaic and the convergent lands that meet it, Time and space feel murky. We can recall the words of Solaire that the world itself is unbalanced, with eras fading in and out. At the top of a tower scraping the sky, we may find an elevator to a lake of lava, and through a tunnel to a far-off misty castle we may find a keep wreathed in rain and lightning. But that gate looms large and imposing, not like the wreck from before in the howling night. How can this be? The bearer of the curse is traveling through not just space, but through time, and this small pocket, this is what lies betwixt. We have fallen into the past of our world like Alice in Wonderland, and this is a dark storybook fable. Here we can meet three more firekeepers, for that is what their attendant calls them. She alludes to the existence of a fourth, another sister, the one who sent us here to this place. She told us of Dranglaic, and we are here because we are cursed. The firekeepers aid us in recalling our name and creating our character, gifting us also with a human effigy which takes the form of a humanity and allows us to recall, if only briefly, our human form, should the curse take us. These firekeepers are also the introduction of a respec system where the player can redistribute their stats, although sadly one cannot change one's appearance or name except that one can also use the coffin by the shore to reassign one's gender. Curious. The starting classes of Dark Souls 2 include the Sorcerer and Cleric, like the previous game, with no Pyromancer this time, and no Hexer class either for the fourth school of magic unique to this game, an expansion on the idea of dark sorceries and miracles. Pyromancies now scale with both intelligence and faith combined in any number, up to a cap of 60, 
like most other single stats, whereas hexes scale off the lower of intelligence and faith with a cap of 30-30 evenly. There is the deprived class with minimum stats and explorer whose main stat benefit is adaptability and who begins the game with extra items. On adaptability, there's a lot that could be said. Personally, I prefer a game where the basic mechanics are more or less accessible and understandable early on, and like so much of these games, without outside explanation it can be difficult to figure out how much to level adaptability, if at all. However, I do think the idea of leveling a stat for the usefulness of items and even invincibility frames is interesting. It just seems to be a very fraught mechanical choice with some unhappy knock-on effects for players. The dodge roll mechanic from the previous game is about as slow, but due mainly to how each action the player character takes experiences a delay, as opposed to feeling clunky, whereas the lock-on mechanic is slippery and encourages locked-off combat, which means the average spellcasting build benefits from leveling a weapon. This is, admittedly, a clever way to guide the player into a combat style that parallels melee builds, at least for some encounters. The locked-off strafe is also faster than the locked-on strafe by a reasonable margin, so if you're having trouble with a boss, try locking off and managing the camera yourself. It may take a couple goes, but in the end the fights can feel more fast-paced and involved, which has its rewards. Alternatively, the player can choose to begin their journey as the bandit, the swordsman, the knight, or the warrior. Each of these classes has an interesting distinction based on what you're going for in your build. For example, the Swordsman is the clear choice of dexterity builds, and allows the player to use the power stancing mechanic from the very beginning. Power stancing adds utility to the left bumper on the controller, where previously without a shield, both the left bumper and left trigger would be near useless. Now, that left trigger also parries, and that left bumper allows a weapon on the offhand to be swung with an animation alongside the weapon in the right hand. This mechanic was so popular, and added such mechanical depth to the combat, that it returned in the critically acclaimed Elden Ring. Like in Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2 also gets some utility out of heavy attacks, especially because physical damage types are even more important in this game than the others, with Pierce and Strike being the clearly advantaged PvE options. Build variety, weapon variety, and improved connectivity also made this game a new favorite for PvPers, despite the introduction of the Soul Memory mechanic, a record of total souls attained per character, limiting connectivity significantly. Dark Souls 2, and in particular the Scholar of the First Sin edition that this footage is from, has often been criticized for having numerous enemies, and build variety will be another player tool to conquer this obstacle. Some weapons swing with longer reach, or in a side-to-side -side arc that allows for hits on multiple enemies. <laughs> Some weapons swing with longer reach, or in a side-to-side -side arc that allows for hits on multiple enemies. So like some spells, players can upgrade weapons for a crowd control option against mobs. The bandit class grants a bow as a starting weapon, and now would also be a great time to let you know that a bow build is viable in PvE, in this Dark Souls game specifically. The bow animation and damage are both forgiving enough, and bows can be aimed manually with a lock-on. I demonstrated this feature in a four-part series I did about how to easily beat this game and have a lot of fun doing so. Feel free to check that out if you want to see some more gameplay. The final two classes are the Knight and the Warrior. The Knight has lots of vigor and a decent amount of strength, which means it's a strong choice for tanky strength builds, although the deceptively short range on its main weapon may prove challenging for new players. Finally, the Broken Sword of the Warrior indicates that perhaps the player isn't intended to stick to only starting weapons, as the Warrior has some of the best starting stats for the popular quality build with both strength and dexterity investments, as well as having more starting armor than the knight or the cleric or the sorcerer, or the deprived, who has of course no armor but the imported set shared between all characters. As a final note on the character creation, I actually like this one best, and I think it matches the slightly more mellow storybook feel of this game, and the art style is suitably pretty for the graphical fidelity which has been updated since release with the scholar version of the game. I think I've made some of my prettiest Dark Souls characters in this game's character creator, and the colors and textures just speak to me aesthetically. If you're willing to spend a little time with it, you can make something enchanting. That's enough for beginnings. We can emerge from the things betwixt into a tutorial area that uses messages on the ground and limited encounters with enemies to teach us things about the game. 
and we can even skip all of this entirely like I always do in order to reach the beautiful and majestic Majula as soon as possible. This is our hub world, and it feels suitably dreamlike and peaceful, despite not being too far from danger or fear. Many NPCs will return here to sell us items and help us on our journey. For starters, we have Saldan, who stands by a monument marking the player's deaths, or if the player is online, the total number of deaths worldwide. Saldan is a crestfallen like another friend we met in Firelink Shrine in the first game, and he gives us a covenant that allows players to aid us in PvP if we're invaded. Another covenant is available in Majula, this one mainly existing to make the game harder for additional challenge if desired. If the player wants a different weapon, and particularly if they started as the warrior, doing a little jump near the cliff will help them obtain the Morning Star. Other NPCs in the area to start with include Malin and Sweet Shalquar, who sell you various armors, items, and rings. Revisiting these vendors across your playthrough may grant new and interesting options. Meanwhile, there is also an Emerald Herald who will give you an Estus Flask and allow you to level up. The Emerald Herald is an odd one. She appears to function as a firekeeper, like the old women we just met, and over the course of the game she reveals a few things to us. For starters, she tells us to seek great souls in adversity and to seek the king. In truth, this is classic from software disguising game mechanics as vague NPC dialogue, because it is a great number of souls that will open the way to Vendrick, the previous king. Along the way, the Emerald Herald will reveal that her name was Shanalot, but that was given to her by the ancient dragon from the area above Aldia's Keep, as she was nameless. She carries also a feather that allows her to travel from place to place, and it seemingly is a remembrance by a child of a dragon who was sequestered away from the world. This, to me, immediately brings to mind Priscilla from the painted world of Ariamis. The Emerald Herald also curiously shares a line with the old Firekeeper from the opening cinematic when she says we will stand before Drinklaic's gate without really knowing why. It's an odd thing, and funnily enough, a crazed hollow man trapped within Aldia's Keep may have the answer, as he calls Shanalot the last Firekeeper. The Emerald Herald herself states that she drew the player to this world, and so we are given to understand that she is a younger version of the old woman we meet in the opening cutscene. In fact, multiple voice actresses are listed for her in the credits. Here, at the Far Fire with the Emerald Herald, the Estus Flask is upgraded with Estus Shards and Sublime Bone Dust found throughout the game. Alternatively, the player can use common consumables to heal, and an infinite number of these can be purchased from the Hag Malentia, once we meet her in the Forest of the Fallen Giants and she returns to Majula. In fact, Malentia also sells us the key to the Blacksmith's Hut. Lenegrast is a proud and short-tempered man who nonetheless has not forgotten his purpose despite looking dreadfully hollow. Once his hut is unlocked, he will sell the player a strong selection of starting weapons, and the game truly begins. Down the road from Ajula, the Forest of the Fallen Giants is a war-torn battlefield of hollowed soldiers and dead giants growing into trees. This is the site of the retaliation of the giants against King Vendrick's persecution of their people, and it is the last giant that is our first boss. He seems to be angered by the sight of us and charges for one last desperate battle. Also in this area, we first meet the Pursuer. Carried aloft by a giant crow, the Pursuer is a boss who is visually reminiscent of elements of the Armored Core games, and who will spawn in various other locations later, trying to track down the player. It's a neat little mechanic and a fun, hard fight for the early game. We can reach a later area through here, but we'll pass on that for now. Heading down another passage from Majula through a series of waterways, we can arrive at one of the most visually stunning locations in the game among many, Hyde's Tower of Flame. There are another two bosses here, one being the Dragon Rider, who is a bit easier. His boss arena can be opened by fighting knights and pulling levers, or the player can risk a more intimate encounter and potentially cause the Dragon Rider to fall to his death. The other boss is the old Dragon Slayer, and to reach him, one must defeat the dragon outside his keep and pull the lever to lower the drawbridge. When you two dragon slayers face off against each other, you may note that he bears a strong resemblance to Ornstein from Dark Souls 1. In fact, he's even found in a similar location within a sunlit cathedral. Perhaps one of these isn't the real Ornstein, but then, who is? Pondering that question, we can move past his boss room to meet Targrave, who may later allow us to join the Blue Sentinel's Covenant, an echo of the Blades of the Dark Moon from the previous game to help newer players. 
Moving past the Dragon Riders fight, we can meet Lycia, who sells miracles and after moves to Majula to open up a second passageway in the one we took to reach this area. Moving further still, we enter a series of hallways and elevators, descending into water to reach No Man's Wharf. This is the introduction of the usefulness of the torch mechanic, originally planned as part of a larger mechanic when Dark Souls 2 was slated to be an open-world RPG. This element remains where the player can light torches, increase visibility for greater lock-on range, and scare some enemies. We can here meet a number of NPCs, among them Lucatiel and Carhelion. Carhelion teaches sorceries and moves afterwards to Majula. Lucatiel is a knight from a far-off land searching for... something. But with the hollowing from the curse, she is losing herself, slowly but surely. Her adventure parallels our own, and we quickly become friends. Circumventing this area leads to the ringing of a bell that calls a ghost ship into the harbor, and boarding this ship allows the player to initiate the Flexile Sentry boss fight, where the water level in the lower level of the ship rises over time, hindering mobility. Afterwards, we can take this ship to the Lost Bastille. The Pursuer seeks us even here, including in an area we can reach by defeating his boss fight. Progressing through this area allows us to discover Macduff, the mad blacksmith who, with a little encouraging, sets up shop to help us in our journey. Macduff must see flame in order to begin his work, which allows him to infuse weapons with stones that add different types of damage and scaling. Visually, he is reminiscent of Andre, but he is tired, worn, and gruff. Progressing from here allows us to converse with Lucatiel once more, and use a fragrant branch of Yore to encounter many enemies at once. We have a few coherent choices now. On the first hand, we could try to bait out these enemies a few at a time. The boss fight to follow is a damage check, so being able to deal enough damage to these foes is a must. We can also use the area within to try to fight these enemies one by one or two by two, or blow up the explosive barrels to deal damage to them in groups. We also have the choice of running past these enemies, but we must choose the correct path and be quick, as the left hand path requires that we open a door. The downward path takes us to a ladder that we can climb to get behind the enemies, and if we're quick enough we can enter the boss fight. Some animations, like accessing a fog wall, are interruptible by enemy attacks, which appears to be a tool by the developers requiring that we beat certain types of areas by circumventing the challenges within. I personally believe games should allow saves before bosses, but if you're going to have boss runs, I must agree that there isn't much point without some sort of challenge. Dark Souls 2 has a weapon durability mechanic that allows weapons to degrade much quicker than in other games, and this means exploration is balanced by resting at bonfires even more so, but also that picking up and buying a repair powder is a must. I also personally wish that developers would consider removing weapon durability from more games, as I find it can often impede the experience, but I do at least find it interesting here. More areas in Dark Souls feel like a tense crawl through Lower Undeadburg before the Capra Demon, or the first time exploring New Londo with its ghosts, and I appreciate the challenge. Again, choice of melee armament will aid you here, not just for wider attack patterns, but for speed and range. Once we are past these soldiers, we can now enter the Rune Sentinels boss fight. I love the Rune Sentinels. They are jailers of undead who have been quarantined here, but the armor they wear is actually just an animated empty shell with skeletal decorative elements. Visually, it marks the status of a prison guard of the dead. This boss fight is also clever in that if the player's damage is high enough, and the player is smart enough, remaining on the first platform allows each rune sentinel to be challenged individually or almost individually, making the fight much easier. Otherwise, if the player drops down, they are in for a three-on-one fight, which at a low level can be quite daunting. Summons are available for this fight that can make it an even three-on-three, -three, however, and that's also a theme for Dark Souls 2. If you're having a hard time, summon for help, and if the enemies have you in a tight spot, bring a crew of your own. This can make tough bosses, enemies, or areas feel not only easier, but more engaging and fun. Dark Souls 2 also has the greatest number of summonable phantoms, with many simply appearing to be odd builds with odd fashion, who have utility in certain kinds of fights and encounters. If, even given all of this, this fight feels like too much for you, then don't worry. Like the Pursuer and Old Dragon Slayer, this fight is technically skippable by breaking through a wooden wall 
and using a shortcut to head to Sinner's Rise. Beyond the Rune Sentinels, we can encounter a number of cells containing hollows, as well as the Belfry Luna. The Belfry Luna and Belfry Soul are night and day versions of the Twin Bells from Dark Souls 1, this time telling a story of a prince and a princess. They are guarded by the Bellkeeper's Covenant, and here you can fight a boss reminiscent of the Bell Gargoyles in the first game. Like the Four Kings, these gargoyles can actually spawn quite a few at a time, so it's the type of boss fight that may be best returned to when your health and damage are slightly higher. Beyond here, towards Sinner's Rise, we can unpetrify a man, perhaps also best returned to later, who calls himself Strayed. He was imprisoned here by a king before Vendrick, and in fact, many kingdoms have risen and fallen between Gwyn and Vendrick. He's an intriguing one, but further on, we can fight the Lost Sinner. Three things should be known about this boss fight before even watching its cutscene. The Lost Sinner turns out the lights in her arena, so you'll need to have explored and found the key to open the cells to light the two oil flames outside in advance. The area prior is full of water, so bringing a flame butterfly to light your torch when you're already there is ideal. Second, summons are available for this fight, namely Lucatiel again and Selsword Luet. Luet in particular appears to be a nod to a player known as the Wall, who carried two shields and wore Havel's set when invading an Anorlando near the Silver Knight archers. This video was actually uploaded by only Afro, who also created the legend Giant Dad. If not, then oh well, lucky coincidence. Third, if you use a bonfire ascetic at the Cinder's Rise bonfire, the New Game Plus version, or Bonfire Intensity 2 or more version of this fight, brings in two pyromancers to help the boss from nearby prison cells. This male and female pyromancer pair appears to be a reference to Laurentius and Quilana from the previous game. Why reference them? Well, the cutscene before the boss gives us a clue. The Lost Sinner appears prone against a wall when a seemingly insignificant bug crawls into her eye, and she responds animatedly, crying out and jumping forward with her sword to slash and extinguish the light. If we do defeat the boss at a higher bonfire intensity, while more difficult, it also yields an additional boss soul, the Old Witch Soul, which can be transformed into the Chaos Blade or Flame Weapon Pyromancy, and whose description states that it is a remnant from ages past. In total, this is a clear nod to the Witch of Isolith and Bed of Chaos in Dark Souls 1. Like how Gwyn attempted to prolong the Age of Fire and suppress the Age of Man, the Witch of Isolith attempted to do similarly by using her own soul to create a new flame. The Bed of Chaos was this flame, progenitor of the demons. The Lost Sinner is an echo of this fight, and interestingly, she attempts to actively choose to fight in the dark, isolated from all but her fellow prisoners, suffering for her sin in an age prior. Defeating her allows the player to progress to a primal bonfire and return to the Farfire in Majula. Back near the place where we first entered Majula from the Things Betwixt, we can head through a narrow passage to an area barred by a stone statue near a befuddled knight. Benhard of Jugo is one of a few NPCs that we're about to meet in rapid succession, and if we summon him and help him survive enough fights, eventually he gives us something very cool. It's not of much consequence to the lore, but it might catch the eyes of a few players. Unpetrifying the statue with the fragrant branch of Yor allows us to meet Rosabeth, who will help us if we're an aspiring pyromancer, and in general she's a treat to meet. We can actually dress her in any armor we have in our inventory. When we do eventually pull the lever, it's actually a trap, and a group of hollows and a basilisk jump us. If we get the bonfire or simply run forward, we can eventually progress towards an area where the road diverges down three different paths. For now, we'll take the path through the Shaded Woods. This is a curious area that can be treacherous, as the mist hides actual enemy shades, though these can be distracted by hitting the trees with faces, but it also attracts them to those trees. Nearby is the head of Vengarl, who, if we explore and defeat his body, will also be an ally to us going forward. He's quite strong, so I'd recommend it. But further on, we reach the Shaded Ruins bonfire. From this bonfire, we can speedrun the boss, or we can explore a little for some good items, unique encounters, and a tasty lore drop. For example, if we buy the Ring of Whispers from Sweet Shalquar and Majula, we can speak to Man Scorpion Tark, who can be summoned for the Scorpionist Nashka fight. Tark and Nashka were once mates, but being long-lived, they eventually came to be at odds with each other, and he asks you to help him slay her and rewards you for doing so if you speak to him. 
Tark lets slip that he and his mate were both creations of some sort of master of theirs, results of some experiment. They seem to be an allusion to Aldia and his experiments, but at this stage we won't have reached Aldia's mansion or met Aldia himself yet, so that's only a premature hint. Scorpionus Najka is a fun fight, being a sorcery equivalent of Quelag, and you can see how a scholar studying flame and heresy would recreate monsters like the Daughters of Isolith. She can go underground and attack the player from there, but there's an obvious safe zone that I kind of wish didn't exist. The tough thing about defending or recommending Dark Souls 2 is that the gameplay experience has, on the one hand, a great deal of depth and challenge, as well as a lot of provocative content filling in the rest of the world of Dark Souls. But on the other hand, sometimes even when the encounters are fun and challenging, the game pulls its punches for seemingly no reason. The boss run to Najka is forgiving, and you can summon for her, so what's the problem with putting the player in a position where they have to deal with being endangered by a special move? I think the thing that bothers me about this is that in a lot of other ways, Dark Souls 2 is perfectly willing to ask the player to think and adapt, but in this case, you just stand on the obvious safe spot and you can be fine. Past Najka, we reach the doors of Pharos. This is a unique area with a series of unlockable doors that hide various loot. The area boss, however, is a bit obnoxious. I find the presence of the smaller status effect rats a bit more annoying than the Royal Rat Authority itself, but it's generally just a less atmospheric Grey Wolf Sif fight, resembling a wolf more than a rat. He guards another audience chamber for the Rat King, which is definitely cool, but the fight itself isn't the best. That will become a theme as the next area is the Brightstone Cove Seldora. As we enter, the player may note the remnants of pieces of an old area that resembles part of Firelink's shrine. This is probably the third coolest thing about this area, the sense that we've all been here before and that history repeats itself while leaving behind those aspects of what we remember that made it meaningful. Maybe this is off-putting to some, but I find the melancholy of it rather provocative in a good way. Shortly after, we can begin to encounter spiders. These freak me out, as all spiders do, but you can light your torch and they'll be scared of you. The other letdown I mentioned comes after, with the Prowling Magus and Congregation boss fight. I actually find these enemies very interesting in a way nobody else seems to, but on a regular new game cycle they aren't challenging at all, so they're more fun to talk about than actually play with. This group of holy men, or holy hollows, are actually in a church of the goddess Velka, as signified by the presence of the Pardoner in the level above them. As previously discussed, the Pardoners are priests of Velka and deal in the forgiveness of sin. I find it very interesting that thus far, the two times we've encountered this mechanic are both in a church, and both churches serve the undead, in one case guiding the chosen undead just beneath the wall between Lordran and Anorlando, and in the other case, existing in a similar church, also located near an area that looks specifically like Firelink Shrine. It might not be the same church, but it is a similar kind of church, because history repeats itself. I find it interesting that the Prowling Magus, preaching to their congregation, can cast hexes, denoting a connection to the dark, and that the congregation are hollows. All of these games have a lot of enemies that have some variation on humans gone hollow, but it feels like there might be something more significant about hollows, hexes, the church, and the pardoner. More on this when we get to the third game. The Prowling Magus and Congregation isn't the last lackluster boss in this game, but we do get a break here with an excellent area and an excellent boss. The Brightstone Cove Seldora is a kind of crystal mining cove occupied by a duke. Seath and the duke's archives serve this role in Dark Souls 1, and as we navigate this area, being careful to bait out difficult enemies and use the torch to scare away spiders, we come across larger and larger webs. I remember begging and praying that this wouldn't be a spider boss, and I lost all hope upon entering the arena. You can summon multiple phantoms for this one, which makes it feel like a real adventure, but intriguingly, we don't get the duke himself, but rather the duke's dear Freha, his pet spider that he apparently loved so much that it grew and grew like the most messed up version of Clifford the Big Red Dog. Actually, the developers at From Software have drawn on Harry Potter before for the duke's archives, so this parallel area might be a second Harry Potter reference. I wouldn't put it past them. The Duke's Dear Freya is, despite my fears, a great fight. There's a few neat mechanics, but interestingly she also uses magic. You have to damage her by hitting one of the two heads on either side, and the pacing of the fight is fun and fair. 
It might be my favorite of the four Lord Soul bosses. Once you beat Freyha, she actually drops her soul like she's an enemy dropping an item, which implies that it was less her soul, and more specifically a soul that she picked up and had on her like an item. Looking at her boss arena, this could be explained by the fact that an actual dragon appears to be at the center of her nest, presumably left over from ages past. Could this be the corpse of Seath the Scaleless? It might not be, but defeating Freyha with a higher bonfire intensity causes the player to be rewarded with the old Pale Drake Soul, granting us either the Moonlight Greatsword or Crystal Soul Spear, both relics of Seath. So either way, Freyha appears to be a reincarnation of Seath in some capacity. We can kill the Duke after her fight and take the Primal Bonfire back to Majula. As a final note, Freyha can appear in advance of her boss fight outside her actual boss arena in some circumstances, which is part of an abandoned mechanic lost in development, where certain bosses like the Lord Soul bosses and others like the Pursuer would engage the player outside their boss arenas. I would have liked to see more of this as I think it adds to the tense dungeon crawling of Dark Souls 2 and gives its areas more character. Back in Majula, Lycia can help us move the Iron Gate and navigate to Huntsman's Copse. This area, once used to hunt undead, is now occupied primarily by them, and leads into the Skeleton Lord's boss fight or the Executioner's Chariot boss fight. There can only be one chariot around these parts, I'm afraid, but this isn't a normal boss encounter, as we have to navigate the area and kill sorcerers that resummon skeletons while attempting to hide and lower the gate to challenge the chariot. It's a fun, environment-based encounter, and the Executioner's Chariot can actually be iframed with your dodge roll if you're nice with it. Alternatively, you can run between alcoves and slay the offending Sunday driver by knocking it off the edge, or challenging it normally, depending on how you engage. Your other boss fight will take you past Creighton, who you may free to get his bonfire. Creighton has some beef with a little rascal named Pate that you may have come across already. Both men seem dastardly, but between the two of them, who is telling the truth? The two have a fight later on, and you can aid one or the other, so deciding for yourself is critical. I'll leave this one to you as so much of these games requires guesswork, and I'll soon be committing to my own theories as we progress. The Skeleton Lords spawn smaller skeletons when you kill them, making this fight a sort of paste combination of the Rune Sentinels and any mob encounter. Overall, it's an interesting concept, and I always have a lot of fun with it, although I admit it's a bit simplistic. Huntsman's Copse yields to Harvest Valley, where we can meet a woman named Cloanne as we try to navigate pools of poison and large intimidating enemies. Interestingly, this is probably the first boss of this game that I'm overall negative towards. The last giant is close to being a tutorial boss, so it's not like he's supposed to be overly complicated, but even he is more engaging than the covetous demon. This guy's area is way more engaging and interesting than he is, which I suppose isn't saying much, but this is one of those moments for me where Dark Souls 2 isn't winning any prizes. He does have an interesting move, where he eats the player alive and unequips their gear, but it isn't even all that easy to bait him into doing it. Overall, he's a bit of a letdown. The next boss encounter, on the other hand, doesn't disappoint. As we progress higher and higher into Earthen Peak, we can burn a windmill on our way up and even find a hidden bonfire. If we do both of those things, and if we summon, we'll have made a relatively challenging fight, at least at low levels, a bit easier. Mythia the Baneful Queen is a fantastic fight where visual design, sound design, and boss arena meet. I even enjoy her moveset with how her tail can trip you up. Being a headless half-gorgon and half-lamia who carries her own head and screams sorceries at you is something else, but the poison pools in her boss arena actually heal her just as they would damage you. Fire is useful here, but if you didn't already know that and if you didn't burn the windmill or you were expecting something easier after the Covetous Demon, you might be tripped up by this one. Overall, I don't find Dark Souls 2 an overly difficult game, but it still has its moments where it gets me, and every now and again, I remember what it was like the first time. I think the overabundance of secret mechanics and hidden items actually pushed me a lot to explore, because you're so frequently rewarded with useful and unique things that you couldn't have anticipated would be there, and the next reveal after this boss fight really sells this. If you hadn't realized that you were traversing space and time when you move between areas, the change from Earth and Peak to Iron Keep might seem harsh. It's a castle sunken in lava, hanging over a tower in a valley of poison. Physically, that isn't possible. 
But a lot of things that aren't physically possible are happening here. The world is bending in on itself, and as we come to see in the final game, the developers weren't communicating this by accident. These things shouldn't connect, shouldn't fit, but they are both here. The wonder and confusion and further sense of awe I felt transitioning from area to area between Majula, Huntsman's Copse, Harvest Valley, Earthen Peak, and Iron Keep was truly something the first time I played this game, and I still get little echoes of that every time. Around that next corner could literally be anything. Iron Keep is a bit controversial. It's the end of its particular sequence, so it's the hardest and most brutal. You will feel punished navigating this area. You will be concerned about falling into lava. You will be dunked on by weeaboos who swarm you if you don't bait them out. You will be caught in traps that burn you alive or cut you to ribbons. You will be decked in the schnoz by fiery demons. This area is the Dark Souls 2 mid-game at its most heinous, because everything comes together to punish you. It's one of those kinds of you-love-it-or-you-don't moments in these games. You could say similar things about Blighttown and Dark Souls 1. The most controversial make-or-break element of this and of Dark Souls 2 for a lot of people seems to be this. You can't just run through it. If you try to run past everything, this area is designed to screw you over. If you are expecting that to be your dominant strategy, then there are going to be several areas in this game that will torture you. If clearing a level in a game methodically isn't fun for you, I can understand that. But I do have to ask, is this bad design? I don't think so. I don't think it's necessarily unfun, either. I think Scholar of the First Sin pushed this element of the game to its breaking point, but overall, I find the challenge engaging. I remember being tripped up by the first time I fought through the little hollows that the mage buffs, and like me, I think most people kill those guys. It's a lot, and I'm glad every area isn't like this, but I don't mind having encounters like this either. As I've said before, I prefer to not have boss runs at all, but if you have them, I think the point is for it to not just be dead space. The principle, I think, highlights how unfun they often are, which is why I value the ever-present shortcuts and extra bonfires in Dark Souls 3, but I do have to wonder whether constructing every area to be sprinted through like a madman really is inherently superior design. I suppose it's subjective, but I like the challenge here, and I think with the right mentality a lot of other people could too. This doesn't have to be all that hard either. With the right spacing, a little kiting, and solid use of the environment, you won't be doing all of this for that long or that many times over. It's a challenge for your brain, not your fingers. If you can beat the Smelter Demon, the worst is behind you. The Old Iron King is intimidating, but your greatest fear here is being knocked off the map. With a clear head, you'll be victorious in no time, and reaching your third primal bonfire. Don't give up, skeleton. If you end up trying the Old Iron King on a higher bonfire intensity, you may not be surprised at this point to learn that he drops the Old King's soul, which is an allusion to the Four Kings, who like Seath were granted a fragment of Gwyn's soul. We'll actually speak more on the Old Iron King later, as being a king makes him somewhat important to this game. With a few souls under our belt, we can head back to Majula to visit Sweet Shalquar and start purchasing more rings. Another one of these is important for our next path, down the big well. Cloanne will be here and will also begin selling useful items. We can also speak to Gilligan, who will have joined us in Majula if we freed him in Earthen Peak. Majula is getting quite cozy now but we need him and Shalquar to help us navigate down the well. If we successfully navigate down the well, we can get to the Grave of Saints and fight to the Royal Rat Vanguard in no time. Of the two rat bosses in this game, this is the one I actually like. Kiting the rats between the statues to try to checkmate the main rat is pretty fun, but you'll still feel threatened by the prospect of being overwhelmed without just being surrounded on all sides. It's unironically one of the more balanced multi-fights in the entire series. Beating this boss allows you to speak to the Rat King and join his covenant to protect the rats, so if you like rats, maybe this one's for you. Dark Souls 2 chose to follow up on an element from Dark Souls 1 that I've seen very few people talk about, which is that the rats that fed on human corpses, and therefore dropped humanity items in the previous game, appear to be becoming more human, with societies and hierarchies and even a king. You can see how multiple cycles of the flame being rekindled would engender that kind of stagnation of humanity as a resource. It's a brief but pretty underrated element of the game, and thematically something that Dark Souls 3 does manage to follow up on in its own way. Heading further and further down will take us to the gutter. I like the gutter, and I'm not afraid to say it. 
I know a lot of people enjoy Blighttown, but to be honest, traversing Blighttown and Dark Souls 1 both ways, up and down and all around, wasn't that fun for me. I think the first time down was extremely tense in a way the gutter doesn't quite replicate, but where Blighttown's tenseness was acquired by precarious navigation and status effects afflicting the player between annoying enemies, the gutter does have some status effects, but mainly asks that the player navigate a maze. I like that. It's simple and fun. I don't know that I'd call it a special wonder of game design, but I think I like when games have things like this in them. It's pleasant, even when it isn't. There's that sort of excitement from exploration that I talked about earlier. Dark Souls 1 showed me a coherent world, and I labored to work out how to fit it all together. Dark Souls 2 has areas that are labors, for sure, but it mostly just wowed me with the wonderment of new and unpredictable mysteries behind every corner that drew on a certain calculated incoherence, a certain quality that I can only put down to the opening cutscene. I had this recurring stress dream as a child, where the world was mostly the same, except the weights of things were inversely related to their size, so the world was strange and disturbing because small things were impossibly heavy and large things could just float away. That's what the world of Dark Souls 2 reminds me of, of a child's stress dream where things are unexpectedly heavy or could float on by at any moment. I don't know if it's the best game in the trilogy by all standards, but by some standards that matter to me, it's up there. Exiting the gutter takes us to Black Gulch. This is a tight area with multiple hard enemies and many statues that spit poison at you. Perhaps more dangerous is the fact that these statues can actually stun you in such a tight space when you're overwhelmed by tough enemies. The boss of this area, the Rotten, is rather straightforward and not overly difficult on a regular new game cycle, so it tends to be my least favorite of the Lord Soul bosses in this game, although we haven't even gotten to some of my favorite bosses yet. Defeating this boss on a higher bonfire intensity will reward you with the Old Dead One's soul, which is of course a reference to Gravelord Nito. More importantly, lighting this fourth primal bonfire invites Aldia to choose to speak with you before you leave. Aldia is one of the most provocative lore elements in this game. His voice sounds like he's contacting us from far away, even though he seems capable of appearing anywhere. He appears as a fiery tangle of roots with a yawning maw and blazing red eyes, but don't be distracted by his appearance, because his dialogue is important. He appears after you light your fourth primal bonfire after you reach the Undead Crypt, and after you reach the Dragon Shrine. Like the Emerald Herald, his words are more significant than they might once have seemed. If you beat the Ancient Dragon in Vendrick, he becomes the additional final boss after Nishandra, and grants an additional ending. What's interesting is that in this case, we've already met Aldia before he speaks to us. Remember Man Scorpion Tark? He tells us that his master who created him never found what he sought, and in the end, he became something other than human. If you kill the Duke's dear Freyha, and of course the small hollow Duke we find after it, Tark will thank us for killing his master. It seems that according to Tark, the Duke created all these monstrosities with his experiments, except that we know from Aldia's keep and drops from enemies like the Mastodon warriors after Nashka or before Drangleic Castle, that Aldia was that creator. And what is a duke, anyway? The title signifies royalty, but beneath a king. Surely Aldia, brother of Vendrick, would have some sort of title himself. It seems that he was able to escape his hollow form that we find after Freyha, in the form of something else. Roots, flame, who truly knows? But Aldia is full of secrets. When he returns to us in time, Aldia tells us the truth. Once, Gwyn, Lord of Light, banished the Dark, which stems from humanity. This granted men their current, fleeting form, as props on the stage of life, as Aldia calls it. But he seems embittered, even angry. A lie will remain a lie no matter how beautiful, he tells us. His fault was an inability to shed the yoke of fate. But what is Aldia the scholar of, exactly? What is the first sin? If you were listening closely you may realize he already told you. But after our three encounters with him, Aldia awaits us at the end of the game. We must reach him to give him our answer. Light? Dark? Or something else entirely? Our peace. Our end. 
Returning to the Shaded Woods, we can take another of those three paths we encountered before to a door that opens up to allow us past the Shrine of Winter. The door requires only that we have so many souls in our memory, but having defeated all the prior bosses will do. We may then enter a tunnel where on one side the distant Castle Dranglaic appears at most shrouded in mist, but emerging from the tunnel on the other side, we meet with the bridge to the castle in a storm of rain, thunder, and night. Slaying enemies directly in front of the gate causes the golems to come to life and open the gate. Inside, the ghost of Chancellor Welliger speaks to us. As a fun fact, this character has one of my favorite lines in the game, when he talks about Nishandra enchanting Vendrick and convincing him to attack the giants. He says, The queen brought peace to the king and his kingdom. A peace so deep, it was like the dark. Beyond him, statues continue to come to life, and once we light the area bonfire, we can kill enemies in front of doors to cause them to open. Each door has a rune sentinel that will attack the player, but only one door leads to an audience with the queen. Another door leads downward to another bonfire and passage. We can speak here, at Black Gulch and at the Shaded Runes, with Dark Diver Grandal. If we speak with him at all three locations, he will allow us to join his covenant and open the chasm so we can defeat all its enemies and light all its bonfires. The thing that's interesting about this covenant is that it's a kind of area-dependent co-op covenant, which is neat, and not something you see in these games that often. Once you beat all three of Grandal's areas, it also leads to one of the best bosses in the game. As a bit of advice, you can reach this boss through any of the three chasms, so picking the easiest one for the easiest boss run will help. The boss is the Dark Lurker, and I always recommend players go for this one. It's an insanely challenging boss, but also a very beautiful experience, probably one of the most balanced and also difficult boss challenges in the base game of Dark Souls 2. Also, when we beat him, we get the last of our drip from the first game, which personally I wanted to get as fast as possible for this video. Progressing onward through Dranglaic Castle, we can meet with a painting of Queen Nishandra that, for reasons unknown to the player character as of yet, curses us if we get too close. We can actually meet Nishandra in person in the upcoming audience chamber, but it isn't necessary, and she's a liar anyway. The Twin Dragon Riders are the next boss, and while I've heard people complain about this one, I've actually found it sufficiently forgiving. I mean, if you have a buff item and a weapon with strike or pierce damage, you'd eat these guys alive. But even a regular weapon with decent speed and range does well if you've been upgrading it. The lock-on camera is a bit slippery at times, a fact which will have escaped no one who has ever engaged in the discourse around this game, and which I've hit on already, but I ultimately think it's more than manageable, and even incentivizes not playing locked-on, including creating a build that can specifically do so, and I think once you're willing to bend your own personal rules a bit, it's pretty fun. The game will, time and time again, punish you for playing by your rules, which is true of these games in general, so just remember to do what works, and not be bullheaded. Beyond here, a little exploring, which I'm dishonestly told never hurt anyone, will take us to the Looking Glass fight. This fight was sort of the precursor to later PvP boss fights, and can actually summon a player into our game if we're playing online. Otherwise, we get an NPC stand-in to fight alongside the boss when the boss decides to call one in. Overall, I'd say it's fun and fair. It's also one of the Benhart fights, which if you're keeping score, will have brought us up to 2 out of 3 so far. The visual design of the Looking Glass Knight sort of resembles some of the dudes in armor bosses that we've been seeing already, but its visual design also incorporates elements of the reflective and multitudinous. At a surface level, this is quite obvious given the giant mirror, but the Looking Glass Knight's armor itself is so polished it almost looks reflective, and its helm has multiple faces. In a way, setting this character as the guardian of the entrance to the shrine below is fascinating because he seemingly exists to show us ourselves, a reflection of our being. The lightning attacks are also initiated in an arena with rain, which is an underrated mechanical element exacerbating the Looking Glass Knight's damage. After the overly cinematic Looking Glass Knight is defeated, we can descend into the Shrine of Amana. Everybody complains about this area, but I actually love it. Shrine of Amana is a test of your attentiveness, memory, and patience. Lighting a torch will tell you which areas of the water can be walked on and which will lead you to your doom, but rolling extinguishes your torch, so it's best to be utilized sparingly. Flame butterflies will be your friends here. Baiting out or sprinting for each individual enemy when possible, and killing everything that is directly aggroed to you on your path is the best method. 
You can easily first try this area if you're prepared and know what you're doing, but it plays a lot of tricks on you and punishes you hard for the slightest misplays. A lot of Souls veterans tend to make mistakes when they treat each Souls-like game like it was their single favorite Souls-like game, which is a mindset that tends to lend itself to arrogant gameplay choices. This area is specifically designed to blast, vaporize, claw, eat, and smash you to death if you don't play by its rules. If you do, you will have cleared one of the most beautiful and atmospheric levels of the game, with a haunting singing in the background by the Malfinito, who are the female children following the footsteps of, or perhaps trained by, Gravelord Nito himself, singing to comfort the little ones. Could this be a reference to Spirits of the Dead? Or perhaps the small skeletons we met outside Nito's own boss arena in Dark Souls 1? Either way, it's a somber and enchanting addition to the arena, which visually is one of my favorite in the game. This is the apex of Dark Souls 2 dungeon crawling. Tense, awe-inspiring, patient, and beautiful. At the end of the Shrine of Amana, we beat the Demon of Song, perhaps drawn in by the singing of the Malfinito themselves, and it's another fight that I'm actually rather fond of. Conceptually, it's weird and even a little gross, a face with hands inside a giant frog skin, but I like the rhythm created by needing to hit the green insides of the boss and not the outer skin. Once we're past this boss, we take an elevator to the Undead Crypt, speak with Aldia again, and progress to meet the male halves of the Malfinito, the Finito, who guards the crypts in question. Lighting a torch in this area will aggro them, so stick to the darkness, and instead, Try to move through the subsequent areas quickly without striking any bells. You can destroy the statues and rocks, which may be helpful when they bar your way forward. The bell summons enemies from the statues that will be rather tough to fight altogether, but if you keep moving, you can escape to the shortcut. Grabbing a nearby bonfire and pulling the lever will open your quickest boss run to my favorite boss in the base game. Velstat is a wonderful fight, an honorable knight still protecting his final charge, his king, even in a crypt. His great hammer is also actually a giant bell, and his armor is all golden, which makes it all the more curious that his only magic abilities seem to be dark. Like Artorius, he retreats to buff himself, but his combat style is more deliberate and less frenetic, seemingly designed to catch the player out when they think they're safe. It's a tough battle, but it's a soulful one, an honorable duel with the last devoted knight of a king whose kingdom has begun to forget him. Just take care that the bell doesn't hit you on the backswing, a move that has caught out many a player who assumed they were safe behind him. Once he's beaten, we can see the king at last. Vendrick is totally hollow, a shadow of his former self, stalking his arena aimlessly with no memory or purpose except his sword. He doesn't attack us unless provoked, and we aren't ready to kill him yet, but we can retrieve his ring from his discarded clothes and speak with the Emerald Herald. Returning to Majula allows us to level up, and returning to the Shaded Woods allows us to take the third path to Aldia's Keep formerly barred by a door that required the symbol of the king, which we may produce by wearing Vendrick's ring. If we've met with Lucatiel in all the prior areas where she appears, she may meet us here, just shy of her goal. She is losing everything, and as her final act, bequeaths to us her signature sword and begs that we remember her. As the player, I've always felt, in a sort of sentimental way, that it was my duty to do this. Lucatiel may die in this game, again and again, every time we play, but she dies with honor, and we remember her. She escapes the curse, in the only way a human from this game can, save one. Just beyond, at the entrance to the manor, Lucatil's brother invades us. He seems to have gone hollow and forgotten himself as well, for he is a rather easy duel for the strongest swordsman in Mira. In the end, these two siblings never reunited, despite sacrificing everything. This mansion holds many secrets, but if we run through it, Past all the experiments of Aldia the Duke, we can find at the end a dragon for us to fight. This boss is a great example of how, out of all three games, Dark Souls 2 is, in a way, the most friendly to ranged builds. It's surprisingly easy and fun to beat fights like this with a bow, as I showcased in a previous series of videos on my YouTube channel, but overall, this enjoyable fight gives way to a vista of arch trees expanding into the great beyond, a remnant of the world that came before. Taking the elevator up, we emerge into the Dragon Eerie. And after we speak to the Emerald Herald and navigate the Eerie by breaking as few eggs as possible, we can cross the swaying bridge to light a bonfire and speak to Aldia again. This area is deceptively easy. The smaller knights, with one or two individual exceptions, will not attack you unless you run away from the larger knights. 
Fighting these individual enemies one at a time gives way to the ancient dragon, who peacefully speaks to you and offers the Ashen Mist Heart, a crucial item. All information in the game leads to the conclusion that this is a false dragon, and that the existence of all of these dragons here is evidence of Aldia's attempt to reach immortality, to escape the curse. Perhaps even Shanelot is one such attempt. Triggering this boss fight is somewhat annoying, but by running between the inner back toes of the dragon, we can bait repeated stomps and over time kill him without breaking too much of a sweat. This is necessary to obtain a giant soul, indicating that this attempt at creating a dragon is actually a twisted giant, and that all these worshippers are gathered here to pray to a false god. The Ashen Mistheart allows for the traversal into memory. Our first order of business is the three giant trees in the forest of fallen giants. Up near the Pursuer's Arena, we can speak to Benhart once outside the memory and inside again. Traversing this area allows us to pick up a giant soul and leave while attempting to survive Vendrick's old war with the giants, where they retaliated for his conquest of their people. Down near Pate, we can enter a different memory and speak with Drummond, a commander of Vendrick's army, and circumvent the area in a similar manner. I think these runs actually show off how intuitive the structure of a lot of Dark Souls 2's levels are, where it almost feels like the developers are walking you through their world, taking you on a tour of sorts. But since you make the choices, it's your adventure, danger notwithstanding. The third memory is behind a locked door and a king's gate underneath the main area bonfire, near the elevator we first took down to the last giant boss fight, which is fitting because we're about to meet him again. These memories are the past, after all, and we can summon Benhart or Drummond here, depending on whether we're doing Benhart's quest, to face the last giant as he once was, the giant lord, king of all giants. This encounter seems to be why he first takes notice of us when we arrive in his arena at the start of the game. He recognizes us, and attempts to take revenge for our past actions, which from our perspective, we hadn't taken yet. Beating this boss gives us another giant soul. We can now return to Vendrick. He's a difficult fight, mainly because he can two-shot most builds, and sometimes he can stunlock you. Sticking to his left leg towards your right is the dominant strategy. He must have been a great warrior in his day, but now he's only a dark shadow, a hollow shell of a man. This fight isn't technically impressive, but it is basically the last truly bad fight that we have to put up with in this game, so in a sense, it's all uphill from here. But this isn't the last we've heard of Vendrick. Before we see him again, we'll have to beat the DLC, which means there's nine bosses to go. We can collect the items necessary for entering their areas in Drangleic Castle, which we probably already picked up by running there, and in the Well in Majula, which we can access by taking the ladder to a hidden room, opened with a key we got from the giants we would have had to have killed to access Dark Diver Grandal in Black Gulch. The last item is actually also in the Forest of the Fallen Giants, like so many other things, and we can reach it by killing Salamanders. The easiest way to do the first couple of these is with throwing bombs or arrows, but as showcased here, you can do them with melee. These are a few of the enemies in the game that I think are creatively designed, but not all that fun to fight. Almost everything about them would be forgivable if they didn't spin so fast. An enemy that sluggish shouldn't be able to spin to win on my ass while charging his fireball spam, at least not intuitively. But we've loved and lost, suffered and conquered, and now it's time to strive for something more. All things are void of terror. Man has lost his terrible prerogative and stands in equal amidst equals. Happiness and science dawn, though laid upon the earth. Peace cheers the mind, health renovates the frame. Disease and pleasure cease to mingle here, reason and passion cease to combat there. Whilst each unfettered over the earth extend their all-subduing energies and wield the scepter of a vast dominion there, Whilst every shape and mode of matter lends its force to the omnipotence of mind, which from its dark mind drags the gem of truth to decorate its paradise of peace. With our necessary items obtained, we can pick up any healing items we might have missed, buy our max stock of life gems, stock up on weapon buffs, and head to our first DLC, The Crown of the Iron King. All DLCs ship with the Scholar of the First Sin edition, but I chose this one first 
because it ties into a fun previous area, although to a certain extent they all do. We're exploring an old portion of the Realm of the Iron King that we beat previously, doing a little wellness check on his subjects. Everything is awful. Navigating down past a few gauntlets takes us to a foyer where we can explore a little bit more through some more gauntlets to obtain a scepter and activate some elevators to reach our first boss, the Fume Knight. If you're not careful, this guy punishes you hard, but he's a pretty exhilarating fight for the pacing of this game, on the same level as Velstat for me personally. In terms of the pacing of Dark Souls 2's fights, you might have noticed that it's similar to Dark Souls 1, but that individual actions can feel a bit less weighty. A lot of the time invested for an individual action is actually on recovery frames, so if you need to roll after you swing your sword, it can feel like you're waiting a long time to escape that vulnerable state. In Dark Souls 1, the actions took a similar amount of time to complete, so the pacing was similar, but the way the animation frames were allocated makes the fight feel different. Leveling adaptability is obviously a must, but I personally think all of this speaks to why a faster paced combat style can feel more engaging. Rain the Fume Knight is a beautiful and straightforward experience with a little interesting story. He apparently had a rivalry with Velstat, to the point that you can trigger his second phase instantly by wearing Velstat's helm into his arena. Both knights are not what they appear in the sense that they choose to serve a similar figure, with Raim being cast out of Vendrick's kingdom and seeking a desiccated former king's service. His appears to have been a lonely journey of a knight errant, who in his loneliness sought strength, casting aside his shield and later his smaller sword to wield a large fiery sword, symbolic of his service to his new ashen mistress and fallen king. This DLC also contains the Iron Passage area, which is rather infamous. I don't like this area mainly because it's difficult to circumvent, and mostly seems to exist to be the world's second most annoying boss run back. The fight with the Blue Smelter Demon itself is interesting, and mostly appears to be a reskin of the regular Smelter Demon boss, which was already a bit challenging among base game bosses, but its damage and resistances are based around magic instead of fire, and its attacks stagger to a degree that it punishes you if you're expecting it to work like the other Smelter Demon. Overall, it's an engaging fight, but I wish the area prior wasn't so awful in every way. That will become a theme as we continue to explore the memory hidden in the armor of Sir Alon, who trained the Knights of Iron Keep that we faced earlier. The area before this fight is obnoxious, but it is possible to run past it all, if you don't feel like fighting through it every time, which, with the addition of the Salamanders, is a bit much. I've been harsh on Sir Alon before, but for this video, with the exception of a couple situations, I've mostly chosen not to summon, and in this case, I fought him solo. I find the timing of his fight a little difficult to get down, but overall he's challenging but not impossible. I think with the difficulty of the fight, the run back is annoying, and I am glad future games like Elden Ring removed most of this sort of thing. Sir Alon should be enjoyed for what he is, a difficult fight with the former close friend of the Iron King who left when he became offended by the moral character of the kingdom that the Iron King chose to build, which led to the Iron King flinging himself into the lava and becoming the demon that we fought earlier in the game. The next DLC that we'll be looking at is the Crown of the Ivory King. As opposed to a fiery tower of ash and soot, we're entering a frozen city of ice and wind. On approach, the Queen calls out to us. Right away, the setting has so much tense anticipation built into it that I think it's easy to understand why this DLC is so many people's favorite. When I played through this game with my friend and community moderator Kelsey, one of the things she pointed out to me is that her favorite DLC was actually the Iron King's DLC, specifically because of how great the Fume Knight and Sir Alon boss fights were. Even the Blue Smelter Demon is admittedly pretty good. This DLC allows us to adventure through this mystical frozen city isolated from the rest of the world, cut into a wasteland, concealing many secrets. Initially, your goal is to retrieve the eyes of the priestess, to see the first boss so that we can speak to the queen. Defeating Ava is no easy task, as the boss has a decent health pool and can deal a good amount of damage. In the way that most of the previous area was built around fire damage, this area is largely built around magic damage. Ava is a standard monster fight otherwise, where dodging into the boss and hitting it on its back half is the main combat loop. I think cats are cool though, so it's not too bad. After speaking to the queen, Alsana, 
who is comparatively meek when juxtaposed with her sisters, one of whom we've already met in ashen form, we can take on the duty of laying her husband the king to rest. We find out he and his knights sacrifice themselves to contain the Chaos, which is seemingly a clear nod to the Chaos Flame of Lost Isolith. More on that in a moment. What's very interesting about this is that we actually get to adventure around the Frozen City meeting the knights of the city of Ilium Lois and sending them back to Alsana to prepare for a fight with the Ivory King. As we explore the city, we come across the kinds of encounters that we've come to expect, including those with strange creatures, scripted invasions, dangerous traps, and beautiful vistas. If we explore fully, we can actually find the key to a room with a bonfire and a coffin. The coffin will take us to the worst area in the game. There's no way to spin this. The frigid outskirts is maybe a pretty interesting area in concept, but an obnoxious one in execution. What makes it the worst is the reindeer. Everything about this area would be more or less forgivable in the scale of the early Dark Souls games, but this enemy type is insane. They appear seemingly out of nowhere, their hitboxes are heinously unforgiving, their health pool is indecently high, and they're overall a problem if you plan on having fun here. But it's okay, my little cutie pies. I'm here to tell you about how to have fun in the frigid outskirts, or at least how to make it bearable. Always remember not to let your preconceptions dictate how you play these games. Step 1. Summon everybody. You have a crack team to play the role of D&D party right here at the start. Vengarl is your tank, Manhunter O'Hara is your ranger, and Abyss Fiva is your cleric. Together, you can take on anything. You'll want to move between the runes during sections when the blizzard clears, because the reindeer specifically spawn in during the blizzard. Unfortunately, the developers didn't actually make it possible to perfectly, totally avoid the reindeer by timing your runs between the runes, so sometimes the reindeer will appear. Continue by paying it no mind. At the next rune, you will have options. You can wait for your party to catch up, kill the reindeer and proceed, or you can allow your party to distract the reindeer for you as you continue to make your way to the boss arena. If you plan on doing the boss alone, your main option will be reaching the boss arena in this way and sending your phantoms home, as they've fulfilled their escort quest. I know it sounds silly, but I've been using this tactic to make this area bearable for years. It's not exactly stellar design, but there are tools at your disposal to make it bearable. The fight is a two-on-one featuring Ava's siblings, Ludd and Zalan. One of the two will hang back until the other loses a certain amount of health, so your best option is to use a good buff and aggressive play to kill the first one and take the second one on solo. He'll try to use a buff that allows him to heal, so this is a damage check of sorts. But overall, I don't hate this fight. I just hate the reindeer. Thank you from software, very cool. Back to the fun part of the game, we can approach the Ivory King with two summons and four knights that we collected from around the city, like our very own Pokemon team, and we can do battle against the knights that fell to the chaos until the Ivory King joins the fray. He rises out of the old chaos, inspiring the sense that the real chaos is beneath, where the knights of Ilium Lois were charred black like Gwyn's black knights. Are there demons down there? Whatever was down there, the Ivory King fought to suppress it, and it's our job to lay him to rest. I like bringing summons here because it's such a massive melee that it really instills this feeling of taking losses and winning at great cost. You can see here that Twiggy Shea actually got knocked off the map by the Ivory King, at which point I audibly gasped because it felt like watching a friend get cut down in the final fight. I finished off the Ivory King, and her sacrifice was not for naught. The final DLC, my personal favorite, is last. Instead of fire or magic, this area is based on poison, and it actually isn't obnoxious at all in that regard, which is pretty wild for a From Software game. An entire poison DLC, and none of it makes me roll my eyes and wish I could skip the area? Honestly, I respect it. We see a true, real dragon at the start of this fight, only our third in the entire series. Sin lets us know that he's here and he's watching us enter his domain before flying off. This area has a cool puzzle where we can change the terrain using blocks that we can strike, which will be helped along by the use of a bow or items. Navigating across enough of these can take us to a bonfire that's a bit nearer to our destination, and Sin reminds us that he hasn't forgotten about us as we enter the tombs of the warriors that guard his domain. It took me a while to figure this out at first, but on later playthroughs it was painfully obvious that you need to destroy the statues of the bodies to reveal the ghostly swordsmen in their true form to allow you to damage them. This area feels like delving into a real ancient catacomb with 
loads of treasure, tight corridors hiding traps and enemies, and hypnotic singing that lures us deeper and deeper into the level. We can eventually make our way into a mysterious cove of strange monsters called the Imperfect. They drop dragon bones, which suggests that they are not attempts to create false dragons, but rather some sort of offspring underneath the lower places of the world that perhaps could have been but never were dragons, not unlike some friends we made in Dark Souls 1. Continuing onward, we can place a key item from a previous part of this area into a pedestal to activate a bridge and take an elevator back up. From here we have two choices. For now, I'd like to navigate to a side boss of this area separate from the others. This fight is really intriguing because it's another PvE boss fight that mimics PvP encounters, and it's a gank fight of three enemies with unique builds that you can summon two summons for. Making this a 3v3 is pretty fun, and your summons can also help you navigate the area by doing things like lighting the way with sorceries. They're a swell couple of chums, even if they are a bit strange. This boss is a series of NPCs that have their own sort of playstyles, and the player can approach them in different ways to try to shut them down. Overall, much like an invasion, there will be a certain degree of hit and run tactics required, but the boss arena is built for this, so I think it's fine. I always find this one thrilling, and the area before it is pretty easy, so there's not much to be bothered about. If this was the lowest point of this DLC, it's a pretty high low point. Taking another path downward, we traverse a series of bridges and ledges and tight hallways past a handful of knights. These were a group of dragon slayers that set upon this city, Shulva, built on top of a cavern harboring a slumbering dragon, and in their haste to conquer Sin, they awoke the power underneath, and Sin's poison engulfed the city. It's a sad tale of an extension of Gwyn's dragon hunt with his knights, where even in later ages, a hatred for the dragons teases out the dearest and most painful emotions of their would-be slayers. There's a re-emergence here of a theme from the previous game, where perhaps those creating the conflict in this game, which is the reason we play at all, are actually the real antagonists, or at least they are fools being manipulated. If we can make it to the bottom of this cavern, we can face the city's queen just outside the dragon's lair. Elana the Squalid Queen uses Dark Hexes and Pyromancy along with summons to defend against the player, and one of her summons is someone we recognize. Here again we encounter Velstat, who it seems had some relationship of service to Elana before he was a knight of Vendrick, or perhaps his service to Vendrick extended to the Queen, Nishandra, and Elana is able to call upon him because she is, after all, her sister. She is the third sister that we are able to face in the DLC, and upon defeating her, we gain access to Sin's cavern. There is one quite difficult element of this fight. Sin is a true dragon, an everlasting dragon from the Age of Ancients. <coughs> Sin is a true dragon, an everlasting dragon from the Age of Ancients, and his subterranean lair reflects this. As such, his scales originally are stone scales of immortality. The game's developers took this surprisingly literally, such that Sin's skin won't cause your weapons to rebound the way that some stone surfaces will, but they will make similar noises and have similar effects on your weapons. Over the course of this fight, striking Sin will cause your weapons to degrade quickly, as his immortality is what separates him from false dragons, or the odd outlier like Seath the Scaleless. He's still a great fight, despite some degree of RNG causing him to fly around the arena. Just bring a repair powder or two, and you'll have a great time. This was the first time in these games that I think the developers really nailed a dragon fight. Calamite comes pretty close, but I think Sin is a little bit more well-polished, and he makes for a beautiful end to these DLCs. If the player heads back to the Shrine of Amana, there's a side path that can be taken to unlock a small room where King Vendrick discarded his soul, his armor, and his crown. Having gathered all four crowns in the Ashen Mist Heart, we can return to the Undead Crypt where we first met Vendrick after Velstat and enter his memory through his discarded robes. Vendrick will speak to us, describe his own failings and the threat posed by Nishandra, and grant us his blessing. We can now wear any of the crowns to prevent ourselves from going hollow when we die, which shows that, in a way, Vendrick came close to conquering the curse. We also learn that he knew Nishandra's true nature, but it seems like he really loved her, despite her status as a fragment of dark of the Abyss. 
It seems Nashandra and her three sisters were all fragments of Manus, and their darkness is his darkness, the darkness in man. It would appear that there is only one thing for us to do. We return to Castle Drangleic and use the King's Ring to open the door. We speak with the Emerald Herald again, where she warns us that if we attempt to take the throne, Nishandra will pursue us. But we don't need to be warned, because that's what we want. Down deep into the underbelly of the castle, we find our fog gate. We can summon many of the friends who helped us make it this far now, but this time, we're doing this part alone. The twin knights of the Throne Watcher and Throne Defender are the last guardians of the throne. They buff their weapons with lightning and can resurrect each other if the other should fall, but in time we can outmaneuver them, and they fall together. Nishandra then approaches. She no longer has her earlier beautiful form, but instead appears altogether dark and wicked. Her fight, however, will be entirely achievable for us at this point. We have come this far to slay her, and we won't be stopped. As she perishes, however, there is one final test. Aldia speaks with us again, and now he demands our answer. What is it we want? He appears to test us, this scholar of sin, and his fight has this somber tone, where he seems to be exerting himself to engage with us, almost as if he weren't really here in quite the same way as the others. After we defeat him, he continues to speak. We can seize the throne, or we can walk away, seeking what? Beyond the scope of light and dark, what else is out there? What more could there be? Are these our only choices? It seems our kingdom, whatever it may come to be, must in time fade and be forgotten. And what is our desire after all? Good to conquer evil? Lies to fight the truth? Although it may be impossible, perhaps it is our nature, or our duty, or our prerogative to seek it out there, somewhere, eternally, beyond the limits of darkness and light. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. The opening of Dark Souls 3 is appropriately a balance between poetic language and direct lore drops. On the one hand, like with Dark Souls 1, we get a pretty steady drip of names and initiating conflicts where the bell tolls, the prior lords of Cinder rise, we see all their names, we find out where we are, and we start out as the player in the cemetery, which is admittedly a nice thematic touch. On the other hand, if we're talking about nice thematic touches, the really great elements of the intro aren't the boss roll calls, it's the little things like, so it is that Ash seeketh embers, or the pilgrims discover the truth of the old words, the fire fades and the lords go without thrones. What's interesting about that phrase is that it's what the Firekeeper says to the player character and to the assembled lords once we fetch them for her. But intriguingly, because calling on the lords to rekindle the flame occurs when the link of fire is threatened, they, like the unkindled, are only called upon to rekindle a flame that is not being rekindled already. This element of the intro is actually very deep because in a later secret area, we can find out the truth behind Firelink Shrine, that our first boss, Udex Gundir, was once a champion, but his firekeeper perished, and so the flame was abandoned, and darkness took the graves. However, when the narration says, the pilgrims discover the truth of the old words, the implication seems to be that this is specifically a double meaning. When we say the truth of old words is discovered, we usually mean that an old phrase is given new meaning. Confirming this reading is the fact that we see something in this opening cutscene that we don't see in the base game. What is with this group of pilgrims from Londor, hollow clerics seeking a Lord of Dark like Yul? 
who we can meet in the Undead Settlement and who has failed to die as was ordained for all these people? Why do they look to be struggling not to drown in a sea of ash? Where else could we see such a sea of ash? What does this visual signify? Where, or maybe when, are they? And indeed, what other meaning could the lords going without thrones have? Before we get too far removed from our character's story, I'd like to talk about what we're doing here. Not here in the sense of rising from the burnt ashes of undead bones in the cemetery, or here fighting Udex Gundir after he has been infested by the dark, or here as we return to Firelink Shrine again, but here at this point in the essay. I don't usually like giving too much summary of the events of a film or book when I write about those kinds of things, but in the interest of making this essay about the Dark Souls video games more accessible, I realized I had to balance the dual tasks of explaining my thoughts on the mechanics and narrative while also walking you all through the experience of playing the games, so that you can see what I see. People often talk about the story of these games being hidden, as I've said, but I don't think that's actually true. I think the lore of these games is sometimes more or less important from others, whereas the story is our story. We don't really need to know about all of those things, like the various souls of the lords in Dark Souls 1, with the exception of the Furtive Pygmy, which we actually learn the least about in the opening cutscene ironically. And I think the beginning of Dark Souls 3 demonstrates that, because the pretense for defeating the lords in this game is so much thinner, where we simply need to fetch them and use them as kindling for the flame, which was the function of seeking the lords in Dark Souls 1, but with added window dressing. Dark Souls 2 hit on this on a more intimate level, where it's the Emerald Herald that tells us to seek the Great Souls for the purpose of seeking adversity, which is a more direct way of affirming what the player is there to do. I'm reminded of a series that Aaron Hansen used to produce for YouTube before he started Game Grumps called Sequelitis. He made an excellent point about the fact that sometimes games go out of their way to give the player some kind of incentive to do things that they were already going to do, which ironically can defeat the momentum of what the player is feeling. Showing the player they can do something that is in and of itself fun will often trump telling them that one day maybe they could, provided that the presentation in both cases is maximized. Dark Souls bosses are heavy on presentation in the actual areas, cutscenes, fight mechanics, and music, but light on presentation and dialogue, which makes random snippets about some dude you'll fight in five hours feel a little irrelevant in comparison to the adventure you're having right now. Being in the moment in these games counts. The Emerald Herald just mentions that the player should seek souls in adversity, which functionally means we should explore. Seeking four lords with names and titles can feel oddly disjointed as a plot justification, and I use the term plot loosely here because it actually has very little plot importance compared to seeking other bosses as we explore. The Abyss Watchers aren't actually that much more necessary to defeat as we progress than the Crystal Sage, and introducing them in the opening cutscene doesn't really add all that much except that when we fight them, we get to say, oh hey look, it's those guys. I feel secure in saying this because while they are a lot of people's favorite fight, this is largely owed to more important elements of their introduction, like the ceremony the player must navigate to enter their arena, or their opening cutscene, and their first phase where the boss turns on itself, or their music and visual style in the second phase. We'll talk about this fight later, but I think it's a great example of a strong encounter that doesn't benefit much from the opening roll call. Moving on to the actual outset of the game, like in Dark Souls 2, we have our teleport mechanic from the beginning. In the previous game, this meant that we could return to previous locations as various branching paths took us down strange and odd turns. In Dark Souls 3, like with Dark Souls 1, the world is interconnected with the kind of physicality that you can observe from certain points in the game. But where the first half of Dark Souls 1 in some ways benefited from this by forcing the player to trek through the whole world, thus giving that realization of how certain areas exist in relation to others, Dark Souls 3's areas are made to be navigated once and then mostly moved past, returning only to key bonfires to go down alternate paths or visit specific NPCs or hidden secrets. This means the interconnectedness of the world is still visually present in some ways, but weaker in the sense that the impact is felt less by not needing to route through different branching paths. Some critics have blamed this feeling on the teleport, but frankly having a teleport function from the beginning of the game isn't just a quality of life change that aids the player, or a world building element that offers intrigue, see the lord vessel in the bonfire and firelink shrine, but also a legitimate trade-off that has specific advantages from a development standpoint. From this point on, I'd like to use a word less clunky than interconnectedness, so I'm going to be using one of my own personal making. 
Spatial Ludo Continuity. I know, it's so much less clunky. I don't know if there's a better term for this, but there should be one, so I'm using mine. A Ludo Continuity, to my mind, is the reliability that an element of a video game exists within the world of the video game while it isn't displayed on my screen, or from one second to the next, so if I'm heading down to Blighttown from the depths, I can be sure that I know where in relation to these locations the Valley of the Drakes, or Darkroot Garden, or New Londo, or Firelink Shrine are, provided that I've already wandered down those paths. For an instance of a game that plays with spatial Ludo continuity in the reverse direction, see my playthrough of Layers of Fear on my second channel. The specific spatial Ludo continuity of Dark Souls 1 is built up by the tense dungeon crawling and sparse bonfires that mean that at the best of times you'll be doing some fighting and some running through each area to get to the next bonfire, and the next, and the next, all the way to where you want to end up. This is eliminated somewhat by the unfortunate necessity of needing to teleport between disparately located late game areas in the second half, but otherwise, the spatial Ludo continuity is solid. This folds into my earlier commentary on Dark Souls 2 as well, which deliberately operates on an incoherent spatial Ludo continuity, where areas cannot exist on the map at the same time, playing with the ideas of time and space collapsing and this sort of unexpected sense of discovery where anything could be around any corner. Dark Souls 3 does, fittingly, a secret third thing, tight, ordered level design serving a specific tour through the world which, while it exists in a spatially coherent way, where you could build a model of it all in your mind, is made to be explored like the Dark Souls 2 levels in the sense that you mostly move through certain areas in a certain order, and you choose certain branching paths in the order. I'd argue Dark Souls 3 has to be this way, because the combat was changed to be more fast-paced, which means your dominant strategy of dodging into enemies and hitting your right bumper over and over again like it's a rhythm game with two buttons and directional controls could theoretically make everything too easy, so of course the enemies need to not only sometimes have absurd health pools and damage, to the point that tons of them, even in the late game, feel like the Black Knights from Dark Souls 1 when you first get into the Undeadburg, but also many moves designed to roll catch and guard, and generally they give the player a very hard time. You might think that I'm saying Dark Souls 3 is the hardest of them all, but that's only if you haven't played it. Genuinely, the only truly hard encounters in this game at this point for me personally are the ones where attack timing is either very staggered or very fast-paced, which when combined with the high damage means enemies can actually make healing in their fights a tough prospect. I say their fights because this mostly just applies to boss fights. The dominant strategy of area exploration in Dark Souls 3 is sprinting past everything to the next fog gate or bonfire. If you reach the fog gate, you have iframes. If you reach the bonfire, then even if you die, you'll respawn right there. It's not that there's no challenge, it's just that the game becomes a kind of art of tactical navigation, a dungeon crawler bullet hell, where the objective is to get hit by next to nothing that can kill you or stagger you into sometimes something that will kill you. It took me going to Elden Ring, a game that has balanced this problem incredibly well with its level design, open world design, and depth of combat, to really appreciate how flawed Dark Souls 3 actually is, but that's for another video. On its own terms, the critique I'll level is this. It might be best to allow the player to have extra bonfires, shortcuts, or even statues of some goddess to restart their boss fight without needing to fight through an area full of enemies every time they want a challenge boss. But if the dominant strategy for circumventing every area is essentially skipping it, is that good game design? Is it good game design in your third-person action role-playing game based in tight dungeon crawling to make the dominant strategy for playing your game to just kind of skip through most of it? I find this world just as memorable as any From Software has created, but upon replaying it, I don't feel like I'm being asked to engage with it except in the sense that the way in which I choose to engage with it is technically by not engaging. This is the quickest and easiest way through the game if you know where the items and bonfires are, and I've beaten it so many dozens of times that even as rusty as I am going back to it, it's a no-brainer to see things in this game and go, yeah, I'm not doing that. In the two prior games, choosing whether to engage an enemy or group of enemies felt like a calculated risk weighed against the potentially more risky play of running past the enemies. In this game, the risk is all on your dodge mechanics. If you can dodge a sword, you can dodge a level. I've shown some of this already in our gameplay of the High Wall where we fight against Vord of the Boreal Valley. I'd like to take this opportunity to give this game some credit. 
This fight is an early example of what I talked about with respect to its formula, but also its presentation. Vort might not be a difficult fight if you know what you're doing, but Dark Souls 3 was the first Dark Souls game I beat, and thus I struggled a lot on early bosses like Udex, Gundyr, and Vort. If you dodge into Vort's attacks and hit him from behind, you'll do fine. But he can get very aggressive, and the music for his fight combined with his size is pure intimidation factor. I realized at a certain point playing this game back in the day that a huge amount of these fights is just a psychological game of bosses and their music trying to spook you into panicking. If you do panic roll, you can get punished by certain specific bosses, but as long as you're panic rolling towards the boss, you'll still be safe as long as you continue to roll through the punish. I like Vort as an example of this psychological element, because he has all these things that can hurt you like his charge or his frost breath, but it's all quite easy to avoid once you stop letting him intimidate you and understand how you're supposed to roll. We next navigate to the Undead Settlement, and this is an area that I think is aesthetically a little more interesting than some of the other early areas, where we can meet a lot of interesting NPCs, find more covenants, encounter an interesting optional boss, and make our way to the next area. We'll talk about some of these NPCs later, because they're all tied up more to their own quest lines than the area itself, but the boss for this area, as much as it is optional, is also very intriguing. This was another boss that helped me learn these games when I was first playing, so it has a special space in my heart. The Curse Rotted Greatwood is a giant tree, and it seems like there might be some connection between the trees and the actual giants. Vendrick's War in Dark Souls 2 saw these giants turning into trees after death, and in Dark Souls 3 there are still some references to giants and trees. Beyond Firelink, there is a giant tree that has a chance to drop seeds when the player gets invaded. In Yorm, the Giant's Arena, the Storm Ruler Greatsword to which Yorm is weak is accompanied with a message, Only a storm can fell a greatwood. In a poetic manner, Yorm is being likened to a greatwood tree. But what are the greatwoods anyway? They don't appear to be arch trees, but if they do have a connection to the giants, then perhaps greatwoods are giants that have passed on. And in that case, the vestige of a giant in the Curse Rod of Greatwood may be rising up to meet us. This tree was once worshipped by the people of the Undead Settlement, and it soaked up all their curses until it became rotten. Once defeated, it grants us the Transposing Kiln to create boss weapons in Firelink Shrine, but the boss weapons its soul grants us include Lucatil's sword from Dark Souls 2, cementing the idea that this tree could be so old that it remains from Vendrick's time. At the exit to the Undead Settlement, there are two key encounters. We can speak with Sigurd of Katarina, a parallel to Siegmeier of Katarina from Dark Souls 1, and help him defeat a demon. Below, we encounter a Knight of the Boreal Valley, a parallel to Vort from earlier. From here, we can venture out into the Road of Sacrifices, where we'll have a chance meeting and be able to explore in one of two directions. Anri and Horus are one of a three-part parallel to the three major bosses from the opening cutscene. They pursue Aldrich, Saint of the Deep, to his coffin in the cathedral. That is also our path forward. The Farren Swamp is across the water and down the ladder, but the Crystal Sage is through the runes. The Crystal Sage is a student of the sorceries of Big Hat Logan, one of the two that we can meet in the game. And in this case, she appears to be guarding the path to the Cathedral of the Deep. There seems to be a conspiracy afoot in Lothric, and the lands that converge upon it, and this is our first hint of something truly strange after seeing the corpses of all the knights in the courtyard in the high wall. What is the significance of a scholar or crystals here, unless they have some agenda? We'll return to this later, but for now, past her, we arrive at the Cathedral of the Deep. In the graveyard before the cathedral and the adjacent chapel, we can see something is seriously wrong. A coffin has been erected in front of a statue, a statue that we see similar to those elsewhere in the game, but which might imply something about this church and this religion. There are hunters of undead here too, which are quite dangerous to us, but the further into the cathedral we get, working our way around its closed doors, the more we see signs of something quite nasty. Normally we would think perhaps the abyss and the dark had seeped into this place, and as much as there seems to be a darkness here, it appears to be something else. We've had a few signs so far of something called the Deep, which is a future age that has drawn the attention of the former Way of White worshippers and turned them from the worship of the gods as they follow in the footsteps of Aldrich the Cleric. Aldrich is gone from this place, but there are signs of his corruption. The floor of the cathedral is sloshing with deep sludge and water. The boss of the arena, the Deacons of the Deep, casts a dark curse upon the player, and a secret location in this area, Rosaria's room, appears to have been battered in 
as if when Aldrich left his coffin he was trying to get to her. Aldrich is an ally to the Pontiff, the leader of this religion, worshipping the deep that has co-opted the Way of Light, and has a penchant for cannibalism. Specifically, he appears intent on devouring gods, but we'll speak more on that later. Taking the doll from Aldrich's coffin, we can return to Farron's swamp. The swamp appears to be a twisted version of Darker Garden or Ulaseal from Dark Souls 1, hiding many similar NPCs and items. Above, on a broken section of the high wall, a demon that has lost its flame continues to prowl. If you extinguish the three flames in this area, the ritual will light three fires by a stone door that will open like the door we opened with the Crest of Artorias so long ago. We can join the watchdogs of Farron at a lonely wolf near a bonfire above the swamp, who seems to be an echo of Sif, loyal friend to Artorias. Above is the demon, hinting that we're getting closer to their home. Even the Abyss Watchers, our first Lord of Cinder and the boss of this area, appear to be a group of devotees of Artorias, in this case being Abyss Hunters who burn kingdoms to the ground when they sense the Abyss in them. They themselves seem to have been infected with the Abyss, so here they have been falling, slaying themselves to cleanse their own impurities. Upon entering their fight, they salute us and begin to fight us while continuing to fight each other. On release, this fight was considered the first real skill check since Vort, and I can see why. The second phase in particular requires an awareness of all 360 degrees of the boss's attack patterns, as well as a timed sensitivity to the hits from the fire left in the wake of his swings. Once he's down, you can approach the altar for the Catacombs of Carthus. Beneath the Catacombs of Carthus lies a lake, and beyond that lake is the Demon King. This is some sort of quasi-secret area, but it's one worth talking about, since if you've been following Henri and Horace's quest from earlier, you'll see tragedy strike as they get separated. If you search the lake, you'll find Horace gone hollow after losing his friend. If you return to Henri, you can let her know that Horace was down there, but she'll survive specifically if you slay Horace. As an aside, Henri's sex is swapped based on the player's sex, because a questline triggered through an earlier NPC, Yol of Londor, in advance of the Abyss Watchers fight, allows you to meet an NPC named Yuria of Londor. Yuria is one of three sisters, and she and one other sister appear to have worked with the Pilgrims of Londor to cultivate dark sigils and hollowing in the player and Henri to allow the hollows to rise and usurp the fire, one of the endings of the game. It's a fine ending, but overall, it isn't generally considered the true ending by the player base or myself. There's a lot to be said about the storytelling of Dark Souls, and how much of it is in each player's experience, and I think this is part of the strength of structuring this video like this. I hate video essays that are structured chronologically and use all their time just on describing things that happen, but as this is a retrospective and the Dark Souls games in particular are very different for each player, I thought it would be nice to give you a tour not only of my experience with these games, and not just my review of them, but also my specific way of understanding them artistically by weaving this narrative. If you liked or didn't like the structure, I'd appreciate the feedback. The Demon King boss fight is accessible by this lake. An NPC fought in the catacombs can be summoned here and fought again later in the ruins below. Night Slayer Sorig wears a ring of the Ivory King from Dark Souls 2, the armor of Black Iron Tarkus, and wields the Sword of Raim, the Fume Knight, from another Dark Souls 2 DLC. He seems to be a character who has traversed old kingdoms and collected relics, and we find him in the demon runes, seeking what, if anything? Another trophy for his collection, like General Grievous? Along with him, we can summon a strange NPC who makes no other appearance by this name, but if they survive the fight, they leave Cornix's set by his cage in the Undead Settlement. Cornix himself is a weird one, and when we find the corpses of Quilana and the Fair Lady, daughters of Isolith from Dark Souls 1, we can return to him the third pyromancy tome of the game, with the earlier ones being found in the swamp near the Road of Sacrifices and down in the Catacombs of Carthus. Cornix will teach us pyromancies from these tomes, and he seems elated that we've found Lost Isolith, now known only as the Demon Runes. The fire of the demons is going out. Their age has waned, and the lingering flame of their chaos has time and time again been rebuffed by the world at large. It's a sad story, really. We encounter the demons almost as gatekeepers or even predators of the landscape of these lands, but they seem intelligent to a degree, possessing life, and they're slowly dying out. 
Lorien, one of the twin princes at the head of the kingdom of Lothric, is said to have slain the prince of the demons, and their king that we find here is aging, dying, falling into nothing. Above the kingdom of Carthus has been reduced to skeletons wandering a desecrated tomb. The abyss watchers keep an eternal vigil above them, infected by their abyss, cleansing themselves, either because the abyss lingered in Ulysil, or because of their final campaign to wipe out Carthus, the kingdom of High Lord Wolnir. Who is this giant skeletal king? How does he maintain a kingdom of darkness above the demon ruins? His crown gives us some answers, said to be reforged from the combined crowns of kingdoms he conquered, appearing to be an allusion to the DLC kingdoms and the respective crowns from Dark Souls 2. Notably, a Dark Souls 2 kingdom above an old chaos flame recalls the majesty of Ilium Lois, kingdom of the Ivory King. Wolnir's kingdom appears to be founded in a similar way, perhaps even on the old bones of that kingdom, or perhaps after those old lands bled together in space and time. Wolnir's fight is one of several gimmick fights in Dark Souls 3, and it's all good fun, if a bit easy once you know his moveset. Breaking his bracelets causes him to be dragged down into the abyss that he once greatly feared. Even this mighty conqueror, like our Dark Souls 2 character, seems to have fallen to the dark. Beyond this horror of the shade is a twinkling starlit city, Irithyll of the Boreal Valley. The gate is doubly guarded by beast and by ward, but the doll from Aldrich's coffin, after defeating or escaping the monster, allows us entry. The Knights of the Pontiff patrol the courtyards, along with witches wielding flame and ragged slaves who fight us to their last. We can enter the Church of Yorshka, mysteriously named, and navigate through the lower areas of the city after speaking to Omri. We will face invaders, hidden enemies, strange and disgusting locations, and a unique little room featuring some silver knights and some paintings. These paintings actually feature Guinevere from Dark Souls 1 and Nishandra from Dark Souls 2, as well as some locations from the games. I find it interesting that the citizens of Irithyll would remember these figures, with reverence or something resembling it. We can open a shortcut and head back to the bonfire before facing the pontiff himself. A pontiff is essentially a church's head, like a pope, so we're facing down the head of this religion. Pontiff Sullivan is an interesting character. The strange beast we encountered beyond him and at the gate of Urethil seem to serve him. He has an alliance with Aldrich, and he seems to hail from the painted world. It's a strange case of one of the forlorn and diminished people of the world of Dark Souls rising to become not a hero but a villain, a usurper of the power of Gwyn's religion. What Sullivan intends is difficult to guess, but he seems to have no designs on the linking of the fire. In fact, we can find statues of a figure that appears to be him in the courtyard at the High Wall of Lothric. Perhaps it was Sullivan who convinced the princes to abandon the linking of the fire, or perhaps it was someone else, and his intentions lie elsewhere. He seems to be making war on the gods, usurping their city and power. Whatever Sullivan wants, it seems to orbit power. Power for himself, and incidentally power for his allies. Beyond his boss room, we can explore a familiar feeling area, with Silver Knight archers trying to shoot us down, and the giant tomb of Gwyn hidden behind his statue. Up an old elevator, we ascend to what remains of an Orlando. There is also an isolated prison tower bonfire, where we can meet a young dragon crossbreed, not Priscilla, but Yorshka. Yorshka is a unique character in Dark Souls 3. Like Priscilla, she's seemingly part goddess and part dragon, a child of Gwyn's or a child of a child. There has been a lot of sparsely substantiated speculation on the parenthood of many god and goddess figures, but what is interesting is that Yorshka is held captive by Pontiff Sullivan, who comes from the painted world of Ariandel in the Ashes of Ariandel DLC, and Priscilla was given a place in the painted world of Ariamas, and both are home to the Crow people, the Corvians, who are associated with Velka. We've spoken about Velka three times now, and we will again, but I'd like to briefly point out the statues under An Orlando in Irithyll, in the hidden area where we can meet the Archdeacon of the Deep who allows us to join his covenant. These are statues identical to the statue of Velka under the Undead Settlement. Always, Velka appears to have a place of extreme significance in Gwyn's religion, in the civilization he built, but in an understated way. She's a constant mentioned more frequently than any other god or goddess that we don't outright meet in some form. Maybe that's because we do meet her. Maybe it's because of her significance to Gwyn. Beyond this place, we find Aldrich. 
He is in the process of devouring Gwendolyn, as he is wont to do in his appetite for godhood. Deep sludge flows on the floor of the arena, all of it seeming to be a part of him. I recall this as being quite the difficulty spike when I first beat this game, but with some awareness of the attacks like the giant soul arrows and rain of arrows in the second phase, we can follow him around the arena and take his head. Perhaps Gwendolyn tried to lure Aldrich away from Yorshka? Perhaps he was running. Perhaps he wanted to look on the visages of his father and sister one last time, and maybe he even included his absent older brother in his last thoughts. We may never know. Once, Gwendolyn protected the legacy of Gwyn. Now he's nothing. Just a memory. A thought devoured. The night of Anorlando and the halcyon days of its kingdom, no more than a dream deferred. As an aside, we can be summoned to Henri's world here in Anorlando to help him slay Aldrich in his world as well. If we do, he thanks us, calls out to Horus, and leaves his sword with the little Lord Ludleth at Firelink Shrine. If we pursue him, we can find him fully hollowed, mourning Horus beneath the catacombs of Carthus, having fulfilled his duty. If, in the Cathedral of the Deep, or at the tower behind Firelink Shrine, we encountered the devious thief named Patches, we have a possibility before us. In the case of the tower behind Firelink, Patches will relocate to Firelink Shrine, and in the process of confronting him, we can explore more of the shrine and find many dead firekeepers, as well as a firekeeper's soul. We can purchase Siegward's, we can purchase Siegward's armor from him, and deliver the soul to the firekeeper at the shrine. Siegward's armor can be given to him at the Cleansing Chapel in the Cathedral of the Deep, and we can meet him again in Irithyll. While he's there, Greyrat the Thief can go on one of his expeditions. If they are both in Irithyll at the same time, someone, either Siegward or someone dressed like him, will save Greyrat's skin. Speaking to Siegward in Irithyll will mean you can meet him again far below. We can explore even deeper beneath Irithyll and discover the Irithyll dungeons, and even farther below, the profaned capital. Interestingly, there seems to be a kind of unique phenomenon here. What the profaned flame is, it might be hard to say. Sullivan seems to have been entranced by this flame, but the idea of a flame separate from the first flame, or a piece of it that has been profaned, is unique and not expanded upon over much. I always wondered whether the profaning of the flame was a reflection on Yorm the Giant's desire to be a lord, and it was his attempt to link the fire that profaned the flame, because he had a giant's soul with no humanity in it, but it is hard to say. In some ways, we know very little about the giants, except that they seem to have some sort of relation to the trees. If we rescue Sigurd from his cell, we can enter Yorm's boss room with him, and help him lay to rest his friend. The sword by Yorm's throne is a replica of the one Sigurd carries, and it states that only a storm may fell a Greatwood. The giants are the Greatwoods, at least poetically, and slaying Yorm brings Sigurd to the end of his quest, and it seems that he passes away in his exhaustion meeting his long sleep with the same bravado as always. Defeating all three of the Lords of Cinder from the opening cinematic will transport us to Emma, the High Priestess, who raised Prince Lothric herself. In her dying breaths, she tells us to lead Prince Lothric to take the throne. If we approach the area behind her, the room grows dark, and we are confronted by the Dancer of the Boreal Valley. This is one of the most beautiful and haunting fights in the game, as she progresses into her second stage, she draws a second sword mirroring the pontiff himself, and begins her slow, hypnotic, lethal dance. This is a great test of endurance in terms of the player's dodging skills, and that makes this one of the major skill checks of the game. Her swords were indeed gifts of the pontiff Sullivan, but her crowned veil appears to signify a direct royal lineage. It would appear that she is one of the heavenly children of Gwyn's royal family, either a daughter of Gwyn himself or a child of his daughter Guinevere. The miracle we can get from her soul is a miracle of Gertrude, which points more specifically to her being the chief daughter of Guinevere, captured and sold off or given as ransom to Pontiff Sullivan for his own sinister purposes. Or perhaps she's an unnamed daughter of the royal family, similar to another character we'll meet later. In the end, she collapses in exhaustion after we've depleted her health bar, her servitude finally at an end, and we can proceed further into Lothric Castle. Behind this area, there lies a garden sunken in darkness. Knights guard it, pus of men wander through it, and an NPC we might recognize from Firelink Shrine can be summoned in it. Behind this area, a little further down, is the Consumed King, and this is his garden. Osiris is the King of Lothric, fallen from grace, supplanted in the line of heirs to the Firelinking by the Princes Lothric and Lorien. 
His obsession with the pale dragon Seath drove him to pursue sorcery, and his body appears to have become contorted in Seath's image as he pursued that magic. He cradles his youngest child, Ocelot, but because he's violent towards the infant during the fight, the physical body has been edited out. It seems like Ocelot hides and escapes his fate, maybe vanishing like the crystal lizards we meet throughout the games. Osiris is a relatively unremarkable fight, but a deceptively important character. Some items in these games, such as the Sun Princess Ring or Divine Blessing, align in their descriptions with previous games to point to Guinevere, daughter of Gwyn, as being the Queen of Lothric and wife to Osiris. In Dark Souls 1, however, there are some differences in how Guinevere is mentioned. For example, she is mentioned as having left Anorlando to marry a character we never formally meet named Flame God Flan. What is interesting is that title, Flame God. If anything, one would think Gwyn himself would have that title, but he was the Lord of Light and Supreme Deity, whereas the line of Lothric appears to have been concerned with perpetuating his legacy of linking the fire and producing heirs for that purpose. As such, it seems Guinevere was used rather cruelly, and indeed that such an end was intended for all her heirs. But Osiris was seduced by the crystal magic he found within the archives, and like Sullivan and the scholars, he was pulled to a more sinister purpose. He seems to have attempted to turn Ocelot to this end, perhaps changing his own form and impregnating a Queen of Lothric to produce such an heir. He says Ocelot is all that he has, and that seems to be true. Guinevere is dead or fled, but either way she is gone, used up, like all the heavenly children in her father's vanity. In accordance with Osiris's derangement, beyond his boss arena, we find snake people who have seemingly perished in their path to achieve dragonhood, and similarly, we find the Path of the Dragon gesture that will later allow us to do the same. But there is an invisible wall here as well, and it takes us to the Untended Graves. This is the darkened version of the Firelink Shrine and Graveyard that we first encounter in the game, and it seems that just as the Firelink Shrine we enter in Dark Souls 1 is a much older and overgrown version of the Firelink Shrine at which we arrive in the end of Dark Souls 1 when we face Gwyn, this is a past version of Firelink Shrine, more connected to the world from which the present-day version of Firelink that constitutes the tutorial area is cut off. This is confirmed not just by virtue of the fact that the hollows here are in better shape, that we find a version of Gundyr in his prime, and he's very rude, by the way. He has a much harder to read and more punishing moveset than the earlier incarnation, and I'm not pleased with how much I died to him trying to get footage for this playthrough, especially since I failed to record some of it and had to do a bunch of it again on New Game Plus. Or the fact that if we speak to the version of the Shrine Handmaid here before we speak to her in the Hub Firelink, she'll remember us when we meet her again, but also by virtue of the fact that it's here that we meet the Firekeeper whose place our Firekeeper takes in the opening cutscene. It seems that somehow she's obtained a pair of eyes. The eyes of the Firekeeper show her a future without fire, and a betrayal of the duty of the linking of the first flame. If we give them to our Firekeeper, she helps us to end Gwyn's legacy, achieving what many believe to be the true endgame of the Dark Souls franchise. It seems that this previous Firekeeper tried something similar, and truly, why should she not? Gwyn did what he did for his own selfish reasons, caring not at all for the well-being or souls of humanity, and seemingly dozens and dozens of Firekeepers have previously lived and died for his ill-gotten legacy. But this Firekeeper made a mistake. She needed a champion to help her take the first flame, so that she could use her arts to darken it. Instead, she darkened the shrine, and so when Gundir arrived, he could not become a lord. Oddly, we meet a little lord in Firelink Shrine who is not mentioned in the opening cutscene and not like the others. Ludleth is meek and meager, and it seems he fought hard and accomplished some great feat for the sake of the linking of the fire, but he does not have the might of a lord. Could he have linked to the fire in Gundir's place? He seems to know the previous firekeeper and why she did what she did, which means he was there, but the link of fire was threatened by the absence of a firekeeper in the shrine, and Gundir's inability to become a champion. Thus, the Unkindled and Lords of Cinder, including Ludleth, begin the rise from their graves. If Ludleth has only risen from his grave now, Perhaps he was the little lord who shouldered the responsibility of linking the fire somehow, despite lacking a firekeeper to aid him in drawing strength from souls. Perhaps he's even the embodiment of players who do soul level 1 challenge runs beating the game without ever leveling up. 
If so, he's the inverse of Aldrich, and is made a lord not for might, but for the virtue in his heart, for making a sacrifice when no one else could or would. Gundir was deterred, but perhaps little Ludleth of Corland persevered. We may never know. Venturing instead above the dancer's arena rather than below, we can reach Lothric Castle. Here we meet dragons or corpses of dragons possessed by the Rising Abyss, and we encounter the Dragon Slayer armor. This is actually an empty suit of armor with a shield and an axe, discarded from a prior age of dragon hunts by an unnamed lord of some renown, presumably of great importance to Lothric. It is animated by the flaming butterflies that hover over the arena, and though it might be annoying to get knocked off the edge of the boss arena, it's overall a relatively fair fight that seems to strike the right balance for those who come prepared. Not far beyond lie the Grand Archives. These are home to another Crystal Sage and to the Scholars. Now we can see the fruits of Pontiff Sullivan's influence and intervention in Lothric. It appears to have been he who helped to influence the Archives along with Osiris, and seemingly, so much of what has happened to this place is his doing. But now we have slain him and are forced to pick up the pieces. An NPC we met near the previous Crystal Sage fight, Orbeck, will retire here after we explore all the secrets of sorcery in Lothric with him, and it seems that all he ever wanted was knowledge despite his demeanor. Navigating these archives not only paints a true picture for how damned the Kingdom of Lothric truly is, it also leads us to a series of intriguing interactions. First, three NPCs that we've already heard of bar our way. Crimehild is a student of the Crystal Sages wearing a Firekeeper's robes, perhaps turned from the duty of the Firelinking Curse towards the purposes of the Scholars, and of course, she attempts to take revenge for her masters. It makes sense that we would find her here, near the Grand Archives. Blackhand Kamui also stands here, barring our approach to the Twin Princes, whom the Black Hand served in secrecy, so he's another obvious element. His fellow, Gothard, appears to have died trying to reach him or their masters. What is not so obvious is the third NPC, Lion Knight Albert. He can help us defeat Vort earlier in the game, but if we attempt to face the Dancer, he departs. Intriguingly, he wears a set of armor from Dark Souls 2, now called the Faram set, dedicated to the worship of a god of war, also named in that game on one of the rings sold by Sweet Shell Quar. What is he doing here? What ties does a servant of Faram have to Lothric? Well, seemingly the same ties that the Dragon Slayer armor has. Long ago, perhaps even before the arrival of Osiris and Guinevere, it seems that the Lothric knights engaged in a tradition of dragon slaying, and there was one among them who was their lord, a god of war, who departed thereafter. This otherwise nameless god of war, then, would appear to be Faram, after all. All the clues are in place to imply they are one and the same, whether Faram is simply what he is called elsewhere in Ferosa by the Lion Knights, or whether that is his true name after all, is open to interpretation. Above, our eyes meet with a curious sight. Atop the tallest battlements of the Grand Archives stand three watchful angelic knights, higher and holier versions of the blue-winged knights that we fight earlier. The presence of these knights appears to correspond with the later purpose of the line of Lothric, as established by Guinevere's family in the service of upholding Gwyn's legacy of firelinking, and this is affirmed by angelic representations of a primordial serpent. It seems there are two lines of Lothric descending from Gwyn, one of Faram, our nameless god of war, and one of Guinevere and her divine children. Speaking of these divine children, below these angelic knights hanging above the archives, we find a cage. This appears to be where Guinevere's heavenly daughter Gertrude was kept, until she was stolen away or fled, traded to the pontiff or running unwittingly into his arms leaving behind only traces of miracle. It is no small wonder that they chose to imprison her in the archives where Osiris's betrayal of his wife's purpose and legacy took place. It is also fitting to think of the Dancer and Gertrude as one and the same because it fills in the gaps of what we know about Gertrude's fate, and adds a simple symmetry to the Dancer's greater stature, so much like her mother's. Lorien and Lothric also share this quality. The Twin Princes, our last lords to be collected, are not far from here. Their room is littered with angelic feathers, and Lothric greets us as if we are not the first to approach him. Quickly, Lorien comes to his side, seemingly incapable of speech, having lost something of himself in the fusion of their souls. Lothric was born to link the fire, but he was also born sickly. Like his father, he seems to have shared a certain penchant for sorcery, but his divinity cannot be denied. 
Lorien, meanwhile, appears to have been a true prince, slayer of the prince of the demons that scorched his sword black, but out of love for his brother, he held himself back and allowed himself to sustain them both. When we cut down Lorien, Lothric comes to his side and resurrects him, and we cannot progress until we have slain both princes together and obtained their single soul. Something interesting about this is that Lothric hangs off Lorien in a manner that seems to visually resemble the armor of Knight Lautrec from Dark Souls 1, which is one of the many little echoes of the previous age. Lothric seems to have turned from the duty of linking the fire, the purpose of his bloodline, and his inspiration in this may be implied to be a statue in his kingdom, seemingly a reference to Pontiff Sullivan. It seems that as he attempted to usurp the religion of Gwyn, Sullivan felt it necessary to conquer An Orlando, the Cathedral of the Deep and Lothric also, and for this he needed powerful allies. Filling the Twin Princes appears to remove the last of Sullivan's impediments on linking the fire, but it's worth asking whether we're doing the right thing here. In a way, Sullivan is not so different from us, but he used his grievance against the gods to allow himself to become a tyrant. Perhaps neither he nor Gwyn were in the right. Perhaps there should be no gods at all. To this end, there is still one important boss before the endgame that we have yet to talk about. Down in the Irithyll dungeon, there is a balcony that faces a mountaintop with some sort of curious keep built on top. Knights and characters in dragon form appear to be meditating facing this ledge. Back in the consumed king's garden, behind Osiris' boss room, we found a gesture much like this. If we use this gesture here to mimic these other knights, a curious thing will happen. We will appear to fall unconscious and hear the cry of a dragon, at which point we will be teleported to a new area called Arch Dragon Peak. Oddly enough, while the peak looked like it was under moonlight before, now it appears to be shining in daylight. We seem to be traversing time and space, but by whose will it is hard to say. This area is littered with crumbling runes, snake people who have seemingly arrived here in pilgrimage, and large, dangerous wyverns. The snake people are an oddity in that players of Dark Souls 1 frequently assume them to be experiments of Seath the Scaleless, and whether that's true may be hard to determine, but nevertheless, like Koth and like the other primordial serpents, they seem to be interested in moving towards returning to another age. Remember, the item descriptions for the covetous serpent rings states the snakes could have been but never were dragons. Perhaps these snake men are seeking their own dragonhood here in this place. It would certainly be the right place to look. There's a boss here called the Ancient Wyvern, which is basically defeated by navigating the area around it to get a cinematic kill. Once you achieve this, you will be teleported again to the next part of the area. Here you will begin to also face smaller stone dragons and summoners who call on allies, potentially others who have chosen to walk the path of the dragon. Rickard is one such ally, and you may remember him from Sen's Fortress in Dark Souls 1, further solidifying the snake connection. Further on, you can find a bonfire and summon Hawkward nearby. I've chosen not to talk much about the NPCs in this game, because I wanted to divide them up by relevance to areas, characters, and gameplay mechanics. Like Sigurd and Henri, Hawkward is tied to one of the three Lords of Cinder in the base game that are introduced in the opening cutscene. He does not, however, appear to have embraced his duty as an unkindled with enthusiasm, instead joining the Crestfallen and remaining in Firelink's shrine. He does offer some cryptic hints about how to reach the Abyss Watchers, however, and rewards you for beating them. He wears some of their armor and appears to be a former member. He can be summoned later for Osiris, and presumably he gets the Path of the Dragon gesture to join you in Arch Dragon Peak. He can also later be summoned to clear out snake enemies and reach the final altar, where the player can receive one of two stones that allow them to summon aspects of the dragons. The second can be acquired by meeting Hawkwood in the Abyss Watchers arena and dueling him there. He appears to feel that he is achieving something by taking these stones and fighting us, perhaps a greater sense of power or enlightenment. Either way, defeating him nets us both stones and ends his quest. But that is not the end of Archdragon Peak. Like so long ago with the Bells of Awakening, we can ring a bell here, and the abnormal daylight of Archdragon Peak fades into a darkened fog and storm of rain. A fog wall also appears, and when we enter it, we can see statues of some nameless god before us like the ones that were in the ancient wyvern's boss arena, which look strangely like the broken statues of the Warriors of Sunlight Covenant that we find in all three games. Then, we hear the boss music, and see a dragon rider descend from the sky. This first fight is with the King of the Storm, and it's difficult to say first... and it's difficult at first to say whether this refers to the dragon or the rider. However, upon defeating this boss, we get a cutscene, 
we find ourselves facing the rider, the Nameless King. From his sole item description and the descriptions of other items such as the boss weapons acquired with it, we can learn that he was a god of war from a previous age with the war against dragons, that he was heir to lightning and sacrificed everything. Suddenly, his resemblance to all these statues and the Sunlight Covenant's broken statues and the missing statues in Anor Londo from across Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 3 start to make sense. We are witnessing the firstborn son of Gwyn, king now in his own right, who abandoned his father's war and was disgraced in history, his name forgotten. He appears to have fled here, and his hollowed appearance gives us some clue as to Archdragon Peak's secret. Gods are not human. They do not hollow. Gwyn spent his soul to keep the first flame burning and perpetuate the Age of Fire. Similarly, when we call upon the Nameless King, we seem to be calling down the storm itself upon which he rides, experiencing the time and space that he has spent his soul to keep for himself and his comrades, and the dragon he called a friend. Where Gwyn gave up everything to perpetuate his own age, his son appears to have given up everything to live in the vestiges of a previous age, the Age of Ancients, a time apart, on the way of the dragon. Like father, like son. This is one of my favorite bosses in this game, in this series, for good reason. Mechanically, it's quite challenging, and its soundtrack is immaculate. Overall, it's a peak Dark Souls experience, as good as it gets, and its place in the story only makes the experience that much sweeter. Upon defeating the Nameless King, the storm recedes, indicating that it was his storm, and its time is past. But the power of the path of the dragon remains, and we can find clues about which other warriors from a bygone age may have walked this path. We can find a Havel Knight, or perhaps Havel himself, far above, and we can find the remains of Ornstein's armor and his cross spear below the arena. It seems that he came this far to finally be with his friend, searching endlessly until finally he too could walk the path of the dragon. But contrary to popular opinion, this isn't where the story of the Firstborn of Gwyn ends, neither here nor in Anor Londo with his brother Gwyndolin at the seat of his father's power. In either event, we are nearing the end of the base game, so we have to do a little wrap-up here. If you've been playing as a pyromancer, sorcerer, or cleric, you'll likely have needed some help along the way. There are a few NPCs you'll be able to meet who may assist you in this. In the Undead Settlement, you'll be able to find a hidden bonfire that will lead you up to a man in a cage named Cornix. He is a friendly pyromancer who will guide any player using an Intelligence Faith hybrid build through their experience learning pyromancy spells from tomes that they find in the game. Cornix is a somewhat traditional but ultimately kind soul who values your place as his pupil in Firelink Shrine. Elsewhere, below the Undead Settlement, you can reach a character named Irina of Karim. Irina is a blind nun who can only read braille tomes that you bring to her, but moreover, she's a very timid character who is tormented by fears of the dark. If you give her a dark miracle tome, she will hallucinate creatures of the abyss trying to eat her alive. It seems only the warmth of human contact can clear her head, but she can be corrupted forever if you bring her those dark tomes and purchase those dark miracles. Moreover, her guardian is Aegon of Karim, who appears to be disappointed in her potential as a firekeeper. However, if you give Arena all the normal tomes and buy all of her normal miracles, she will move to the adjacent tower among the she will move to the adjacent tower among the dead firekeepers, living in solemn solitude with a sense of true purpose. After the undead settlement in the crucifixion woods is Orbeck of Vinheim. Orbeck is a suspicious but ultimately straightforward scholar who trains you in sorceries when you bring him different scrolls as a sort of trade, knowledge for knowledge. He will stay with you in Firelink Shrine unless you buy all of his sorceries or neglect to give him scrolls. Finally, there's a fourth character here. While Dark Souls 3 does not have the Hexes class of spells from Dark Souls 2, it does have some Dark Miracles, Dark Sorceries, and Dark Pyromancies, which can be learned by giving the relevant item to Karla. Karla is a witch that we can meet underneath Irithyll Dungeon, and in general her dark reputation conceals a rather gentle and kind demeanor. If at any point these characters are killed, like a couple others, their ashes may be delivered to the Shrine Handmaid to receive their items. Let's talk a little about ashes. I bring up all these NPCs at the end here because it's important to understand that, like us, many of them are also unkindled. The Lords of Cinder are those who previously linked the flame, reborn at the tolling of the bell. But that same bell also signals the rise of the unkindled, those beings born from the ashes of the cemetery. 
The cemetery where we begin the game is full of ash, because in Dark Souls, undead remains are burned to kindle bonfires. Hence, all the bone shards and homeward bones and other similar items. We and many of these characters are those ashen remains, and we can learn a little about these characters and the world from them. For example, from Carla's ashes we can learn she is a child of the abyss in much the same way that Nashandra was, meaning that she is the unkindled remains of Nashandra and her sisters to whatever extent, or even of Manus. This would explain the Kingdom of Irithyll's determination to keep her locked away. Irina's ashes are also peculiar, as they describe a woman who wanted to be but never was a firekeeper, strictly in terms of having been someone who rather betrayed the fire. This might give us some insight into why Arena is afflicted with those sensations, those dark dreams of little creatures that bite at her flesh, and why she's blind. Arena appears to be the unkindled remains of the Firekeeper whose eyes we recover in the darkened shrine, afflicted with the dark rumors of visions from a lifetime ago. She was, after all, the previous Firekeeper to betray the fire, so the description fits. There are a couple of other loose ends to tie up before we go over the final DLCs of the series, including a couple more NPCs. Among others, at one point we can meet a woman named Cirrus, a former Blade of the Dark Moon, who appears to have left that company of knights to search for her grandfather. If we accompany her on her quest, we can find, her, we can find him and aid her in defeating him. Hodric is also an NPC that we can meet by finding a very secret area before the Curse Rotted Greatwood boss fight. These two characters are fascinating to me because they're a part of a bigger picture that we only got pieces of in the previous games. The Blades of the Dark Moon take as trophies the ears of their victims, a sign that justice has been meted out on behalf of Gwendolyn, abiding god of An Orlando. This has always been a strange but solemn ritual that never made much sense except in that it paralleled the eyes that the Gravelord Servants Covenant took. Apparently, gods like human tribute in the form of body parts. Hodric's Covenant, the Mound Makers, also take a trophy, that being a single vertebra from the human spine. They seem to be madmen, raving that this vertebrae is a shackle of the gods, but what could have given them such an impression? Well, there is an answer. The taking of trophies from the body is a rite of godly worship, after all, and there is another covenant that keeps human remains from their victims, one that the Blades of the Dark Moon, like Cirrus, seem to see themselves as existing to punish. A covenant called Rosaria's Fingers takes tongues from their victims, and their purpose is clear, to offer them to the goddess of the Cathedral of the Deep, which was once dedicated to Gwyn's Way of White before it was turned by Aldrich and the Pontiff. And deep inside that cathedral lies that hidden goddess. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. Where the sun beats, and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either. Your shadow at morning striding behind you, or your shadow at evening, rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. In the Cathedral of the Deep, at the Cleansing Chapel, we find an old man, bowed and bent before the altar. He prays to the statue of the goddess behind the statues of the deacons, and it seems he calls out to Rosaria. He calls her a merciful goddess and a mother of the forlorn. If we speak to him, he will ask us to show his lady flame, and he will offer us a scrap of the painted world of Ariandel, teleporting us inside. We find ourselves in a cave beset by rot outside a snowy field. If we return to the cleansing chapel, the man will be gone. So who is Rosaria? Who is this hidden goddess? In the questline of an NPC from Firelink Shrine, you can come into contact with Rosaria's soul, after it is stolen by Ringfinger Leonard, and taken to Guinevere's old room in Orlando. Her soul grants only one thing, a miracle of Guinevere, the only way that you can unlock this miracle in the game. Rosaria's room is littered with cribs for babies that aren't there. She's guarded by mangrubs twisted and deformed from excessive rebirth, 
and those same mangrubs guard a cage in Lothric we mentioned earlier, the one where Gertrude was kept, firing feather miracles shaped like the Holy Spear found to be associated with the Way of White. The statue in the Cleansing Chapel also lends itself to the conclusion that Rosaria was the original deity of the cathedral before the deacons turned to follow Aldrich in his pursuit of an age of deep waters. What makes this initial scene with the old man, Gale, rather compelling to me is that it's yet another interaction in a church with a man who associates that church with the worship of Velka. The undead parish had a partner who served such a function, and that appeared to be a church devoted to the Way of White, a religion centered around Gwyn, and it existed for Gwyn's purpose of shepherding undead to link the fire. Brightstone Cove Seldora had a church with the Prowling Magus and Congregation, and above that church was another partner. These men are associated with a mysterious old deity whose identity has long been in question. Gale also has associations with the Way of White, being an old slave knight, a mere human who served with no distinction in Gwyn's old wars. He uses the Way of White Corona spell, which creates a discus of holy energy in the image of the circlet of the Way of White. Curiously, new players in Dark Souls 3 are given a Way of White circlet, whose function is to restore their former status after they are punished by a hidden mechanic meant to detect and punish griefing in PvP and PvE. In other words, the item is associated with sin. Gwendolyn has always seemed to be the deity who was concerned with sin, at least by the time of the first game, because his Blades of the Dark Moon punished sin. They serve a slightly similar but distinct function in Dark Souls 3 without the same sin mechanic. A lot of people have lamented that the Blades of the Dark Moon in Dark Souls 3 function on an auto-summon mechanic to fight invaders like the Blue Sentinels, because they used to be about invading and punishing sinners. Maybe there were earlier ideas for this that were scrapped, but implicitly the conclusion appears to be that it is a priority of Gwendolyn's Blades, now Yorshka's Blades, to seek out and repel invaders. While Gwendolyn seemed like he was the prior authority on sin, this mostly appeared to have fallen to him as the chief god of An Orlando, but the partner who sells indictments used to mark players as sinners to be punished by the Blades of the Dark Moon is associated with Velka, and for a while this seems like a coincidence. But it's not a coincidence, is it? The Blades of the Dark Moon take souvenirs of reprisal in the form of ears cut from the bodies of their enemies. The fingers of Rosaria take tongues from the bodies of their victims, offered to Rosaria herself to soothe her suffering over her own lost tongue taken by her firstborn. We can see this in item descriptions, and it further enhances the parallel of Lautrec's questline, where he steals the soul of the tongueless Firekeeper, and goes to An Orlando, with Leonard's questline, where he steals Rosaria's soul and goes to the same cathedral, only higher up to Guinevere's old chamber. Lautrec's armor embodies the embrace of the goddess Fina, another old goddess who we only hear about but never meet. Many have speculated that there was some connection between Gwyn and Fina for several reasons, but I think these goddesses that we hear about have power strictly because they have favor. Hear me out. The miracles in the Dark Souls games are actually just passages of literature, stories repeated that bestow power through faith. It is faith itself that lends them their power, and without faith they are nothing, similar to how a sorcery is nothing without intellect. The statues of the goddess and all their miracles don't actually have to represent anything real or true because the faith is the point. Gwendolyn has a similar conundrum. Many have speculated, and I think this is the most likely outcome given the story of Dark Souls 3, that he not only has a connection to Yorshka, but also to Priscilla. Aldrich dreamed of Priscilla, who herself appears to be dead and gone, but who may have some connection to the little painter girl in the painting of Ariandel. This is a future version of Priscilla's home, the painting of Ariamis either within the same world or made out of its remains. When we enter the world of Ariandel, we see a cold landscape of refugees, and eventually, in a chapel, we meet Frida and her knight Wilhelm. More on these two in a moment. Further down, we can enter into the Corvian settlement. This is another supposed connection with Velka, but what is intriguing is that a version of Gale's armor is here. Perhaps Gale lived here and met the little girl we meet later, whose white hair may remind us distinctly of the crossbreeds, including Gwendolyn. She calls Gale her uncle, probably as a term of endearment, but she may be more human herself, in accordance with her size and stature. A Corvian in this settlement begs us to show her flame so that this painting can be burned. He says it's the one thing they do right, unlike those fools on the outside. Curious. 
There's a sort of refutation of the linking of the first flame on display here, but by mirroring the language. For the denizens of the painting, burning the painting is good because it allows them to move on from the previous era and into a new one, whereas linking the first flame signifies an unwillingness to let go of the current era outside of the painting. In this way, these worlds built around the phantom character of Velka are the inverse of the outer elements of the world that center Gwyn. Returning to the issue of Rosaria, while it's otherwise hard to connect her with the painting, it is nevertheless intriguing that Gale addresses her as the mother of the Forlorn, and that her cathedral is adjacent to Lothric specifically while she's missing a tongue her firstborn took from her. Some people have interpreted this to mean Leonard took her tongue, but why? He seems oddly protective of her for someone willing to hurt her. Even taking her soul seems to have been done without any major violence, as her body is still intact, and returning her soul to it can be done, quote-unquote, as if nothing had ever happened. Furthermore, it seems odd that she would be waiting here for Leonard as he has already found her. Leonard does bear some subtle marks of royalty, so that could be why he tries to bring Rosaria to Guinevere's room above the cathedral. Perhaps he knows something that we don't. Despite some insisting Rosaria is Guinevere, and despite formerly believing as much myself, I'm not sure I do. They bear only a slight physical resemblance, and Rosaria's face is oddly covered, even in her statues in the third game. Even if her appearance is supposed to be some change or revelation, why would that be? And isn't it strange that statues of women, including one that appears to be of a woman holding a baby with a giant sword, fill churches throughout these games? One is located in Dark Souls 1, near the altar for the Warriors of Sunlight Covenant. I can understand there being one at the Bell Tower Church, but having one here is odd, unless that baby is somehow significant. Could this be the firstborn of Gwyn, the heir to the sunlight, held by his mother? In that case, is there a female goddess in these games who did raise up Gwyn's heir? And if that's so, don't the statues of the weeping goddess in the Cathedral of the Deep in Dark Souls 3 become so much sadder? This ancient woman waits here for her firstborn, and she's waited a long time, so long that the world seems to have cast her aside and forgotten her, but nevertheless, here she waits. The Cathedral of the Deep is at one end of the Road of Sacrifices, which diverges from the undead settlement at the foot of the High Wall of Lothric under Lothric Castle. In the other direction lie the lands of the Abyss Watchers, Yorm, and of course, an Orlando, where Pontiff Sullivan and Aldrich have taken up residence. The three trueborn children of Gwyn are scattered. One slumbers at the end of the world, one was used to sire a line to link the fire in perpetuity, still another waits out the ages at Archdragon Peak, riding the storm. Of all three of these, the closest in some ways to Rosaria is the Nameless King. Archdragon Peak can actually be seen at a distance in the game when the player is located at the Pontiff's Courtyard, and what's interesting about that is that Irithyll is in the secluded boreal valley beyond the Forest of Farron. Up above the Forest of Farron is where the Cathedral of the Deep can be found, and we can see all of this from the High Wall. A rare piece of information to which most players will likely not be privy is that when you see the Cathedral of the Deep from Vort's Bonfire, you're not seeing it in its actual location relative to the other locations on the map. The Cathedral is moved here to assert its place closer to the center of the vista. The developers wanted you to see this big cathedral, where it should have been a ways off to the right. There's a great video by the channel Illusory Wall going over this map placement. For narrative purposes, altering the map serves to assert connections visually that may not have been obvious. For example, the cathedral overlooks other areas of the map, especially the further mountain range, where we know Archdragon Peak lies. To me, this is the final piece in an exceptionally drawn out puzzle. Rosaria is waiting here for her firstborn. Why is she waiting there? Because he isn't far. If you think about it, it's also painfully obvious. All of the associations are built right in, and it just took us forever to see it. Vatividia made some videos before the release of Dark Souls 3's DLCs that I watched religiously, pun not intended at the time, because he continually speculated that we would get a DLC more explicitly about Velka, and then that day never seemed to come. I think we can all tell why. Rosaria is more important than we thought. She's the mother of the Nameless King, and perhaps him taking her tongue is also why he's nameless. Or perhaps he took her tongue after she told Gwyn of his misdeeds. She seems to be hidden away from the world, despite being so key to Gwyn's religion, almost as if she were evidence of his shame. Instead, 
We're told stories about some other obscure goddesses who nevertheless seem to correlate strongly with Rosaria. Could she be the truth behind all these tales? The real figure behind multiple unseen goddesses from the stories and miracles? It seems that Rosaria is who she is specifically because of her firstborn, at any rate, and perhaps she is also the mother of the Forlorn because of Velka's association with Sin. In this way, her being the mother of the Nameless King is also cemented by the likelihood that she is the mother of Gwendolyn and the Crossbreeds, from whom the Painter Girl may well be descended, and for whom the paintings were made, also specifically with Velka in mind, which could be why Gale reveres her. I think, finally, after everything, all the little secrets have come together to resolve one of the trickiest riddles of the Dark Souls trilogy. And there's more to come as well, but if you thought Rosaria was a goddess with a different identity, like Guinevere, whose appearance is definitely different, unless she had been reborn, perhaps you should ask yourself who that massive grub is that Rosaria seems to cradle, and why she holds them unfailingly, blind to almost all else in the world, almost as if they were her child. Rosaria's covenant symbol is like her name, a rosary, or to give it the Latin name, Rosarium, whose beads are traditionally arranged into ten Hail Marys, in association with the Holy Mother of Christ, and indeed, a statue in a church of a mother and a baby would, in the Christian faith, represent no one other than the Holy Mother and the Son of God. Rosaria's rosary is affixed with a variant of the papal cross, signifying her former role at the head of Gwyn's faith, only with its bars inverted in descending size. Perhaps she is called Rosaria because when we meet her, that is simply all we need to know about her, mother to the son of God. The rosary is used in the Catholic Christian faith for the sacrament of confession to one's sins, and the inverted cross itself is often associated in popular culture with sin. The rosary itself is traditionally conceived of in its use not only for confessing sin, but more specifically as a way to reach Christ through the Virgin Mary. But like with all things in Dark Souls, the myth is inverted. It is the church here that punishes sin on behalf of God. It was the Christ figure that was banished from the church such that his name might not even be spoken, and Mary here was herself divine, ostensibly an equal to God used by him like his daughters for the advancement of their lineage. Not only is she not a virgin, but who knows to what she was subjected to create the crossbreeds. So much about this story paints Gwyn as self-aggrandizing, elevating himself above others for their expense, and it's a very cynical view of the character of God, but also a poetic one. Dark Souls 1 begins with a parallel to Genesis, let there be light, and then there was fire, and so on. But this god is malicious, marching humans and even his own daughters to toil and demise to further his power and his vision. The Corvian in the settlement, a little rotting, fetid thing, has more bravery than most. He calls Gwyn a fool openly, disparaging his fire-linking tradition. Fire is something else for him, not an order justifying the rule of God, but merely a transformation into the next world. It's a different way of seeing similar ideas that strikes me as oddly sweet and sincere. Beyond this settlement, we run into Wilhelm again. I haven't touched too deeply on a number of NPCs in these games, because I never looked at this retrospective as being a summary of everything in the games, despite wanting to walk you all through my full experience replaying them for the purposes of forming a narrative out of the gameplay experience. I do, however, think it's important to note that Frida is one of the three sisters of the Sable Church of Londor, which the pilgrims from throughout the game, including the opening, and Wilhelm himself, serve. The church appears to be founded on the teachings of the Serpent Koth, in a manner similar to how the practices in Lothric were devoted to Frampt. Those two serpents are still leading human beings into linking or usurping the fire, even after all this time. Maybe they'll do it forever unless someone ends this eternal dance. Wilhelm is a character I think about a lot, mainly because he has an iconic voice actor, but also because of his lines. He has a very choice condemnation for us. He says he's seen our kind time and time again, that we're someone who conceitedly seeks truth but lacks the stomach for the pain that awaits us. It's always moments like these that really connect the struggle of these games for me. We're trying to transcend what we're taught is the nature of the world, and Wilhelm looks down on us because he thinks we're naive, not necessarily because there's no truth out there waiting for us, but because if we understood what was waiting for us, we would turn back. The Sable Church are a group of potential allies and enemies in this game that could give us one ending, 
but their offshoot in the painted world will almost certainly stand against us no matter what if we walk this path. Come to think of it, it's really the Sable Church that guides us away from working with other allies in Firelink Shrine and towards their purpose. They don't want to break the cycle, they want to rule it. This puts the original Lord of Hollows or Age of Dark ending from the first game in perspective as well, and adds a little context to Aldia's words to us in the second game. In a way, Wilhelm is telling us to go back to what we might have thought was the truth in Dark Souls 1. Forget about the first sin. Forget about the endless cycle. Just be king of an era and be satisfied. Frida gives us the same advice. It's just a shame we can't take it. Before her boss fight, there is one more thing we can do by cutting the bridge and using it as a ladder to climb down the roots and reach the true depths of the painting. Down here, we will find a meadow of frozen flowers and a fight with a grave tender and the great wolf that both mourn in ancient champion. It's hard to say who this champion was or what they're meant to represent. They're obviously reminiscent of Artorias and Sif, as well as Kieran, who tends Artorias' grave. But perhaps this fight is just another way of paying respects to the PvP of the previous games, while reinvigorating it for this game by adding on the matchmaking system. I do think it would be poetic of Kiaren to have taken to the painted world in the ancient days of the Age of Fire, forlorn as she must have been after losing Artorias, to erect some sort of monument to Artorias here, or for his grave to have been ultimately moved here by the men of Farron who fled here as Ulysil slowly sank into the Farron Swamp. Either way, it does allow for a wistful goodbye to the memory of heroes we'll never see again. Up above the chapel waits Sister Frida, and if we proceeded above Wilhelm we will have encountered a young painter girl who seems to know Gale and whose duty appears to be the painting of a new world. Indeed, this is another part of breaking the cycle of the world of Dark Souls. But first, she must see Flame, and to show her, we will have to proceed beyond the broken bell tower and up through the snowy hills to the basement, where we can pull a contraption and turn a statue, just like the one we moved in the first game, to open an altar to the man concealed below. He appears to be the greatest of the Corvians, more like the ones on the outside than anything. He is Father Ariandel, the one who painted this version of the world. Upon reaching him, he greets us meekly, but asks that we bring his flail to draw his blood to quench the flame of the Lord Vessel. Sister Frida approaches from behind to stop us from intervening in her plot, and one of the tougher fights of the game begins. Frida in her day was compared to Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower in Bloodborne, but for my money, there's parts of her fight now that remind me of Melania, Blade of Mikola from Elden Ring. Aesthetically, and even in a couple of her mechanics, she's like an echo of someone we hadn't yet met when the game came out. As a precursor, you can see how much was refined in the later title. As a fight by herself, she can certainly be a challenge. There's nothing about this fight that feels unfair, except that you are going to need to dodge a lot of sequential combos, and if you aren't staggering her, you might get steamrolled more than once. In the first phase, Frida uses stealth and careful plotting attacks, switching almost entirely to a passive support role once you down her and Father Ariandel revives her with the flame for the second phase of the fight. The Lord Vessel's flame revives her because she is, after all, unkindled ash, which might imply that her sisters still with the church are as well. In that case, perhaps all three sisters are, in a way, not breaking a cycle but conquering it, seeking not a way out for the people of the world of Dark Souls, but merely to be in control. Perhaps their missions are not so different from each other. Frida rises with a black flame, the flame that comes from the darkness of humanity, and it may be that this is her calling upon her more hollow nature. Her combos become extremely aggressive, and this is usually the part of the fight that seems to get people. It's almost a marathon of sorts where one needs to conserve one's Estus in the first two phases to be able to handle phase three. Still, despite how hectic and aggressive her moveset is, it's not undodgeable or anything silly. It's quite manageable, but you may breathe a sigh of relief when it's over. At that point, you may recognize the statue at the back of the room. It's near a bonfire that transports us away and appears to be made partly out of a snakeskin and partly out of a broken statue. If you recall my earlier ideas about the statues and what they represent, the idea that Gale would be associated with this place and the idea that this is all happening in a painting heavily themed around Velka makes some sense. Accessing the bonfire takes us to the Dreg Heap. If the Ashes of Ariandel DLC was a callback to Dark Souls 1 and Koth, the Ring and City DLC is a callback to Frampt and Dark Souls 2. 
This area is thematic and visual tie-in with the final version of Firelink Shrine that we encounter at the end of the game, shows that not only is the cycle of the Age of Fire causing Lothric and the lands of all of the Lords of Cinder to fall in on themselves in space and time, it's truly doing the same to all lands everywhere. Something about the fabric of the world itself is not right. Navigating this drag heap, we can meet a few characters, most notably the stone-humped hag who seems eerily similar to a handmaid that we may have met in another time, and Lap, the lance-wielding hollow, who only wishes to recall his own name. Adventuring onward, we hear from the former rumbling of what lies beneath the dregs and what remains of Earth and Peak, before the ringed city that stands at World's End, the last embers of the Demon Prince, the one that Lorien supposedly slew that scorched his sword. If we navigate the runes and the ash and the roots clotting them both, we can eventually find a sheer drop leading into the boss fight with the Demon in Pain and Demon from below. This duo fight is mostly manageable. I sometimes find it a bit regrettable how there are some instances where the two demons inconsistently aggro at the same time, instead of one going more passive while the other goes aggressive, but for most playthroughs it seems like a small price to pay. The fight is difficult, but eventually you can put down whichever of the demons is last to fall. Unfortunately, with the last embers of their spark, they invigorate the flame of the Demon Prince, inheritor of the Chaos Flame. He has two forms that grant him different attacks based on which demon you killed last, and his moveset makes the fight simultaneously more straightforward, but also more glorious and cinematic. I think it's strange and wonderful how many kinds of demons we've faced over the games, several of which have been incarnations of the Chaos Flame and the Witch of Izalith. In Dark Souls 3, the demons seem to be a dying civilization, their old runes more tomb than home, but if all space and time are to bend at the end of the world, Maybe that is why their last great demon must be put down here. They were a great form of life once, an entire civilization, and now they are no more than the monsters rooting through the rubble of a hundred kingdoms, maybe a thousand or more. After all, you may well ask, what is a demon to a non-believer? After the end, we may look around and realize we are in what appears to be Firelink Shrine once again, but exiting this time takes us to a sheer cliff overhanging the clouds, and like when we defeated Vort, we may raise a banner and be carried down by messenger demons beyond the wall that seals off the ringed city, and into the last dark bastion of mankind. Among the first creatures we meet is a pygmy who seems to have reason to believe we should have an adversarial relationship with the gods. He does not reveal why, but he will not believe us if we contradict him, so sure is he. Beyond there, we see a Judicator who may summon Rune Sentinels and a rare Silver Knight Commander to slay us in spirit form. We can also run across Locust Men, who seem to at least be, to some extent, non-hostile, instead preaching their dark truths to us and the whole city. If it is not darkness that taints the soul of man, then what? If we attempt to observe the human ringed knights, we may see the truth. The sigil they bear on their armor is that of the Dark Sign. Here we begin to see the truth. The Dark Sign is not a curse emergent from the Dark Soul of Man. The Dark Sign is not a curse emergent from the Dark Souls of Man, but a curse cast upon it, such that when the fire fades and the darkness in mankind rises to meet it, they will be constrained, like the wall constrains the Pygmy City, like the light wards the dark. Gwyn gifted the Pygmy Lords this place, but it was to be their jail. Slowly the words of Aldia start to gnaw at us, once, the Lord of Light banished dark, and men assumed a fleeting form, he said. A lie will remain a lie, he said. And what was the first sin, after all? It would be first, if it came before the others, and it would be a sin as it betrays the order of things. Gwyn may have styled himself as the greatest of lords, a god among men, but our scholar of the first sin tells us another tale. The first sin is not, I think, the rekindling of the first flame with souls, or the creation of the chaos flame, but something that would have come before even these. First, Gwyn cursed men, for he feared their nature, and so he tricked the furtive pygmy, and jailed the pygmy lords in a false Eden, and guided men into a church of indoctrination. Undeath, then, falsely became seen as a sin, a fault, and those undead were hunted and corralled, so the sins of God against man became the sins of man against God, and truth became myth. 
if we travel through the Ringed City, we may find many strange, sad, and wonderful things. We may meet Lap on the balcony by the second bonfire, and if we open a shortcut and use a white branch to transform it into a floating humanity sprite, we may reveal a secret path to the Purging Monument, whereupon we may find him in a small chapel and speak to him of its existence and location. It is strange that the Purging Monument holds the same significance as the statue of Velka in the Undead Settlement, more or less, although underneath all the dark muck, it is near impossible to tell how it may have once appeared. In any case, we have to keep our wits about us and move forward, for as much as we may wish to help Lap, we are in danger. We are being followed. A dark-eaten dragon, the last of the ancient dragons of a bygone age, may swoop down on us or attempt to obstruct our path. We can defeat him and cast him into the chasm below for now, but it seems Lap wishes to give us one final encounter. He tricks us and reveals himself to be Patches after all, having finally regained a sense of his true identity. He takes pleasure in getting one over on us but seems to harbor us no ill will, and will even aid us in the future boss fight against the Spear of the Church. Before we go, down in a smaller room near the Ringed City streets is a woman named Shira. She refuses to leave her room but will speak to us and ask us if we remember the name of God. She also requests that we slay the dragon Medir who has dogged our steps, as he was once a faithful servant, but now the corruption of the dark has tainted him. We may choose to ignore her request and proceed to fight the Spear of the Church boss instead, at which point afterwards she will invade us in the final area. If we choose to help her, she can be summoned for the Dark Eater Medir boss fight. Either way, completing her task or defeating her in battle grants us some rare items and allows us to enter her room to take her unique armor set and weapon. When we descend beneath the Ringed City by way of elevator, secret passage, ladder, and long fall, we come down to the very place under the world that seems to have been described in the opening narration to the first Dark Souls game, or somewhere not far. Perhaps it was here that the pygmies first arose when the first flame was lit. Now it is here that Dark Eater Medir rests. This is probably my favorite boss fight in the series, although there are many others that could give it a run for its money. When this DLC first came out, people would complain this boss was too hard. I myself needed help to beat it. Now I've got him down to a science, and I've even done him hitless before, which is a rare thing for me with any boss. I believe I retried him a couple times just to see if I could get that good run here, but ended up beating him having been hit twice and using one Estus Flask to recover. Like I said, I have his fight down to a science. He's a beautiful, dangerous cinematic experience, and probably the best dragon fight the From Software devs have cooked up to date unless you're a big Placidus Sax enjoyer. For my part, he emphasizes how great it feels to fight a boss one-on-one -on -one and have their whole attention and how rare it feels to have a giant monster fight that really feels intimate and well-balanced. The part where he starts calling on dark humanity sprites feels really sad, and in general you get the sense that this was a once proud creature that, through no fault of his own, suffered tremendously over the ages until finally, at the end of time, his purpose serving the vanity of a nearly forgotten lord was fulfilled. If we take that same elevator down, and pass the statue of Gwyn and the furtive pygmy, we can approach the great church, where Judicator Argo will warn us away. If we enter, we may summon in front of a fog gate before challenging the boss. Judicator Argo is inside the boss arena, and he calls forth a painting guardian to challenge us and cast support of miracles, but neither of them are the boss. The Spear of the Church is a PvP boss, also sometimes an NPC fight with Half-Light Spear of the Church. The concept behind the fight is that warriors who visited the city over the years will have pledged themselves to defend it, and Half-Light was the last of these. So if no one else is willing, he is called forth to stop you. In general, this fight can range from obnoxious sprinting bouts with metamancers to slow, plodding combat with players who run away when they don't have their backup dancers with them, but when the fight hits normally as it should, it really hits. The variance makes me dread it every time, but depending on your build and whether you're playing offline, it can be slightly more or less annoying. Thankfully, it's not our last boss, nor is it the final fight of the DLC. When we ascend through the church, we find ourselves in a single bedchamber. On the bed rests a sleeping goddess, the youngest true-born daughter of Gwyn, Filianor. As she sleeps, she clutches a broken eggshell, what may have once been Medir's egg, for he was raised by the gods to know only their purposes for him. 
She appears to be inspired by the animated film Angel's Egg. Her slumber seems to be what protects the Ringed City, because upon breaking the eggshell and waking her, a bright light flashes and we are indeed at the end of days, perhaps the very end of Filionor's life, all of it spent for Gwyn's plot. And is there any reason in the outside world beyond this kingdom that Filionor herself would not be forgotten? Once again, tragedy by Gwyn's design seems to have been inflicted on his family, as on the world, for all is sunken into ash and crumbling away for his age of fire, for his petty ambition and his lonesome fear. Out in the ashen wasteland, beyond the thrones of ancient men, we find Gale. His cloak is tattered, his sword is chipped from endless battle, and he seems to gasp dust, as if ashes were filling his lungs. But he is alive, and he is feeding on the pygmies who remained in the Ringed City. He recognizes us, but is deranged, and becomes more so as we battle, like an animal or a demon. His fight is fast-paced and requires understanding of some of his hitboxes and movesets in order to navigate it well. But if we chip away at his massive health bar, we get a cutscene. It's important to understand this moment. Gale set out to do what no one else had thought to do, which was gather together the dark souls that lie within the essence of mankind. But when he finds the pygmies, descendants of that one furtive pygmy who split his own soul long ago, their bodies are all decayed, and so to take their souls, he not only kills them, but takes their blood into himself by consuming their ashen corpses, making his blood a vessel for the dark souls of man. Why does Gale do this? His blood will act as the pigment for a better world, for a painted world, to be created by the little painter girl in Ariandel. Item descriptions tell us that Gale indeed knew what he was doing, and that he could not survive his endeavor. He fought until the end of time, until endless cycles buried the world in ash, until everyone was rotted and dead and decayed. He fought long, and whatever else he might have been, a slave knight of no renown, he was also our friend, and we aid him in his struggle against an unjust world. By what right did Gwyn? who used his soul for his own power and lordship, cursed the pygmies and their descendants, for whom the furtive pygmy split his soul. By what right does God punish man for his nature, out of a fear unbecoming of a lord? By what right does the jailer, the slaver, use and then dismiss the slave of no renown? Under the lashings of fate, he seized the whip, an Ouroboros of power, an act that would surely mean his end, but he did not do it for himself. And so, at the end of ends, here stands the bird of Hermes, eating his own wings. Gale's moveset is provocative. Initially, he bounds forward like an animal, flailing and swinging his broken sword wildly. After a brief cutscene, he sees the blood of the Dark Soul flow from his wounds and rises, hollowing, Having finally fulfilled his purpose, his cloak begins to swirl around him in a tempest that strikes at us. He mixes up his crossbow and sword attacks and calls upon miracles. When we injure him, he seems to sob and cry out in agony even as vestiges of the dark of humanity escape him and lightning crashes down around us. He adds increasing variety to his movement, adding in teleportation mix-ups. The flow of combat is a tragic rhythm of war and grief, of one man's struggle to rescue all of us from this fate that we see cast into the ash of ages. We have to slay Gale, that lonesome slave knight, and it's worth asking ourselves once we do and once we deliver the pigment of the Dark Soul that we receive upon his death to the little painter girl in Ariandel, for whom did he truly fight? We know it was not for him for everything he did served his own annihilation. In the end of the world, he still fought on until he could be slain, in the final fulfillment of his true goal. He ate the dried blood of the forefathers of man to take into himself the greater part of the dark soul, the soul of man. We know he did not fight for Quinn, who cursed man in fear and jealousy, but could it have been for one small girl long ago and far away? A painting is a captured vision, a framed time and place, a memory that never was. Gale fought for mankind against the curse of God. He hollows when he finally taps into the blood of the Dark Soul. 
Gale's revolution was for a world he knew he would not see. He never would return to call that gentle painting home. But from his blood came the pigment, and we see it when he staggers to his knees, the oncoming living stream of darkness. Or is it something else? When the light and the fire were always to cage man and make him a slave, what could the darkness hold for him? The curse comes from the light, from God. The liberation of mankind is something Gale will never know, but he did snatch a chance for that idyllic future from the jaws of fate through his own sacrifice. What kind of world will the little girl paint? Will it be a captured time where mankind is free of its curse? Where it can embrace whatever its true nature may be? Only the little painter girl can decide that, but now she has everything she needs. We only have to fulfill things on our end. Gale gave mankind a future. But that future needs the painting. And all around the world is collapsing, falling in on itself, crumbling to the ashes of endless fires, and we have another promise to keep to that world. If we return to Firelink Shrine at the end of the game, we could submit all the ashes of the Lords of Cinder we have defeated to their thrones, and the Firekeeper will step forward to call them into one blazing inferno and send us to the final fight. All the lords from Lothric to Lordran have coalesced into one being at the final Firelink Shrine, reminiscent of the same one we found at the end of Dark Souls 1, covered in ash, burning away. If we teleport farther out using another bonfire, we can exit into the kiln of the first flame and see the world itself is becoming kindling for Gwyn's madness. As he cursed mankind, so has his malignant will afflicted the world. Now. Here we have traveled to end it all, to stop this cycle and break it before it reduces the world to nothing. To stop us is the unbridled will and coagulated force of every Lord of Cinder that came before, born again into the soul of Cinder. This boss has several movesets that it can swap between in its first phase, using a standard sword, a curved sword with pyromancies, a spear, and a staff with sorceries. If we can conquer all of these, it will rise again calling on the soul of Gwyn that must surely still remain somewhere deep within. It gains access to miracles, calling lightning down upon us and engulfing its sword in flame. This fight is a reflection on all that came before, and if we best it, finally it will fall, and all that remains before us is the first flame. As I have alluded to already, there are several endings to this game and to this series. You may of course link the first flame. This is the most obvious and default ending, so it's curious that it's implied to be one of the worst ones for the world. Of course, the Lord of Hollows ending is not much better, but if you have a certain fondness for the Sable Church and want to get married to Henri, you may. If you so desire, you may summon the Firekeeper to have her commit the ritual that quells the first flame into nothing, so true dark after fire may settle. This neither usurps the Age of Fire nor continues it, but instead allows the cycles of the world to continue such that one day there may again be a future Age of Fire, or Dark, or Ancients, or Deep Waters, or anything else. No one has the right to dictate for their ego's sake the direction of the world, not even Gwyn, and certainly not us. However, if you feel different, you can crush the Firekeeper as she darkens the flame and sees it for yourself, taking it into yourself. This is perhaps the worst and most cruel ending, but the option to do so reminds us that this is our choice. We could be anything. We came from Ash, and to Ash we will doubtless return. Lord or Vessel, Warrior or Sage, Hero or Villain. No, I think there is only one way for this all to truly end. We allow the Firekeeper to cast the world into darkness, and in the night that reigns, we hear the whisper of her voice still. loss of something ever felt I, the first that I could recollect. Bereft I was of what I knew not, too young that any should suspect. A mourner walked among the children, I notwithstanding went about, as one bemoaning a dominion, itself the only prince cast out. Elder today, and a session wiser and fainter too, as wiseness is, I find myself still softly searching my delinquent palaces. And a suspicion, like a finger, touches my forehead now and then, that I am looking oppositely for the sight of the kingdom of heaven.
What I hoped to accomplish with the first sections of this essay is to lay out for you exactly what my experience returning to Dark Souls was. The first use of this is, as always, to explain the game to those who have not played in a manner which adequately communicates the experience of playing it. The second purpose of this is to present the games together, descriptively, chronologically, and therefore also with a sense of order to its bosses, areas, and associated ideas. By approaching the game as it was played, I hope to draw attention to the way the narrative and mechanics come together. This section will deal with the way those elements of the games unify to generate a poetics of the games, from which in turn we can intuit a poetics of gaming. From there, we can approach contextually specific ideas about poetics and about the meaning generated by the games in that way, especially underrated elements of their philosophy, and how that philosophy and gaming itself as a practice come together. William Carlos Williams once said that a poem is a machine made of words. In the beginning of an article in The Velvet Light Trap titled From Beats to Arcs Towards a Poetics of Television Narrative, Michael Newman articulates something similar when he opens by saying that, quote, television is a story machine, end quote. For our purposes, first it may help us to identify what kind of machine we are engaging with here in Dark Souls. The video game is undoubtedly a story machine, but it is also a play machine. In Lodology Meets Narratology, Similitude and Differences Between Video Games and Narrative, Gonzalo Frasca contrasts the two approaches, with an attempt to fuse the two ways of seeing video games. What I have set out to do in this essay is similar. My thesis is very simply that the Dark Souls games have, implicit in how they have been constructed as texts and as games, utilized a particular kind of approach to design best seen through a fusion of poetics and analysis of play, because there is a structural synchronicity in how these games work as games, and how they work as texts. The Dark Souls games are story machines, and they are play machines, but they have progressed further than many other games into the realm of a kind of storytelling and play fusion particular to video games. I'd like to make some acknowledgements here for two reasons. The first is that if you've seen poetics used in this context, especially in essays originally written to be listened to on YouTube, you may have seen videos like Two Modes of Film Analysis, Poetics vs. Hermeneutics by the YouTube channel Film and Media Studies. I'd recommend this video as a breakdown of the distinction between poetics and hermeneutics that I mentioned earlier, just so you have a decent frame of reference for when I'm using one or the other in this essay. Another great video was actually released while I was working on this essay, so I retreaded my steps to make sure I mentioned it here. Aristotle's Poetics Explained and Why It Matters for Screenwriters by the channel Studio Binder. Both of these videos have useful references for those interested in literary and film studies. The second video, I think, is a useful jumping off point for my second motivation for making these acknowledgements, because the tradition of using poetics to analyze storytelling really is at least as old as Aristotle. A lot of Aristotle's older ideas about story structure and epic poems are still dominant expressions of how storytelling works in modern art analysis, and although I don't spend much time with Aristotle here, I would be remiss not to mention his poetics. In order to draw out those aforementioned ideas about the character of poetics in gaming as an expression of the uniqueness of From Software's Dark Souls trilogy, I felt I had to showcase the games in a manner which showed both elements to you by bringing them down and making them real, by playing them and showing you what it is that I have played, which is why this essay is so long and why it has ponderously explored different areas, NPCs, game mechanics, build variety, boss fights, and so on. I have tried to showcase, as much as I was able, and as much as I thought was relevant, different elements of Lars Konzak's two levels and seven layers of describing and breaking down a video game respectively, in Computer Game Criticism, A Method for Computer Game Analysis. Konzak's analogy is to a chessboard, where the relative virtual space in a video game is like the pieces on the board, with all their internal logic, and those elements with the two players and the surrounding space make up the playground. Additionally, the seven layers are hardware, program code, functionality, gameplay, meaning, referentiality, and socioculture of a video game. I would posit that the nature of how Dark Souls is constructed, and one of the reasons why it's so uniquely famous as a game series as well as being so infamous, is its marriage of gameplay, meaning, referentiality, and socioculture. I attempted to explain this as I was moving through each game and breaking down its different elements, but there's very little guidance from the developers to the players, and comparatively less in Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 compared with Dark Souls 3, which tends to have some helpful developer messages on the ground even late into the game. 
a more traditional tutorial and a number of NPCs who explain things comparatively well. However, Dark Souls 3 also benefits from two changes over time, the first being that it was the fifth Souls-like game that From Software produced, and it was born into an overlapping age where an increasingly centralized social media coexisted with numerous forums and then rising avenues of game critique, from YouTube video essays to more traditional blogs and games journalism outlets. In fact, Dark Souls 3 and Sekiro showcase the end of an era for From Software releases and the discourse around them, as Elden Ring would bring a much larger player base to the company's games, similar to what Dark Souls 1 did to Demon's Souls. To wit, the referentiality of Dark Souls draws on series such as Berserk, but without much over-explanation in the player's face, and this referentiality implies to the player what they might be able to do if they pick up an impossibly large sword or other weapon, for instance. When Dark Souls 1 was new, this kind of referentiality was important because these games were just breaking out into critical success, but still had much of that success within and among insular communities. Speaking to players through implication using the language of geek culture of the time, that being pop culture references, was a way of speaking to players without actually instructing them in anything. Similarly, because so many of these people congregated in so many online spaces, the playground of Dark Souls extended well beyond any limited group of players, logged into their PC or gaming console, sitting in their chairs or on their couches wherever in the world they might be, cooperating or antagonizing each other on From Software's servers and in the host game's world. The playground is now discursive, existing in verbal debate, because in-game knowledge, whether it's knowledge of meaning in an opaque narrative, or knowledge of gameplay in opaque mechanics, is reliant upon that element of socioculture found in social spaces online. What's interesting is that lore channels like the Silvermont or Vati Vidya or Zeostorm or Ashen Hollow began, whether they see themselves this way or not, as acting contributors to that discourse, and as the audience of From Software Games has expanded, the stories have become slightly less opaque. There are fewer mysteries in Elden Ring of the order of, for example, the purpose of the Church of Londor, or the identity of Velka, or the nature of the First Sin. There are still some, but despite the lore still being something to be retrieved and pieced together, it does nevertheless feel very retrievable. The era of Dark Souls was an era of the irretrievable. We may never get a consensus on everything I've discussed with you here, on Rosaria and Velka and Guinevere and the Church of Londor, and if you're a bit of a fool like me, maybe that saddens you. But if we are wise, we should recognize that chasing this mystery as an act in itself has given us meaning. I've platinumed all three of these games, but having those achievements doesn't give me the joy that exploring those games did, and that beating them again and again still does. Having those mysteries to decode is itself a gift to the community, and maybe we're lucky to have something so unknowable and so worth attempting to know. Here, too, knowledge and meeting are gamified, and this social space with all of its uncertainty becomes a part of the playground. These From Software games are social games on a level that it's difficult to conceive of outside of an era of the internet, from which even this essay is written. There needs to be a mass access to mass communication spread out over different platforms and democratized into the hands of many users in order for this kind of experience to occur. This is a unique cultural moment that has produced these gems. Provocatively, Konzak references what is described as Johann Huizinga's theory that games and play are the genesis of all culture. Certainly, it seems intuitive that culture itself is a matter of social interplay. If there is any truth to this idea, we might be seeing with Dark Souls as a series a kind of potential for a new culture, a new genre. What is a Souls-like? Well, as Iron Pineapple would tell you, a Souls-like is a game that's kind of like Dark Souls. However, a true Dark Souls-like would be a game which also utilizes these social spaces, as well as the meaning and gameplay elements of the video game itself, to create an end product which reproduces the fusion of elements I've just described to you. I think it's a shame that while many developers have started to see the appeal of elements of From Software's third-person action role-playing game design, they don't seem to have developed as much of an understanding of how the other aspects of Dark Souls have complemented that design and made it such a cultural icon. Comprehending this formula and spreading a more accurate understanding of it is a part of the purpose of this essay. I'd like to further expand on this aspect of these games using the logic of ludology. In I Have No Words and I Must Design Towards a Critical Vocabulary for Games, Greg Kostikian writes that, quote, 
MUDs and RPGs are multiplayer social games. In both game styles, you meet other player characters, PCs, and interact with them. You establish ongoing relations with other players. You learn about the world itself, and inevitably, you acquire other goals as a result. One of your friends may have a task he or she wishes to accomplish, and likely there will be opportunities for you to become more powerful along the way, if you help them out. The nature of the world itself, if well-designed or well-conceived by the game master, and the connections you make with other characters, provide you with alternative goals. There are times in games of this type when players feel lost. They're not certain what to do next, where to go, how to reach the next level of power, or even if the motivation of reaching the next level is sufficient. As a role player, there are times when I've been bored, when my character has been sitting around and in with other PCs, arguing about what to do. In MUDs, there are times when I felt bored at the prospect of going out and killing more gnolls, and wondered what else there was to do. What's going on here? Just this. These moments result from the fact that goals aren't explicit in MUDs or RPGs. The goal of the character advancement is implicit, but at times that isn't enough. I'm trying to find the next interesting thing to do. I'm searching for a goal. In other words, the game is failing me. In the case of an RPG, it's failing me because my Game Master isn't being a good Game Master at that moment. A good Game Master will sense when his players are getting bored and give them something to do. If nothing else, he can have a bunch of orcs show up at the inn and start busting heads. That gives the PCs a goal right quick. Self-preservation is a good goal. In the case of an MUD, it's because the design isn't supporting an adequate diversity of goals. Simply slaying monsters and taking their treasure does pall after a time, and a well-run MUD will provide other mechanisms for character advancement. In an RPG or an MUD, players ultimately choose their own goals. The job of the game isn't to provide explicit goals, it is instead to allow for a diversity of goals, allowing players to pick and choose among them, to find one that appeals. This is an interesting way of parsing role-playing games, and the Dark Souls games are, after all, a series of role-playing games. In the game of Dark Souls 1, we're given an operative goal as players to escape an asylum, or ring two bells, or seek an audience in An Orlando, or find and unite what remains of the Great Souls, or slay Gwyn and take his place, either in an Age of Fire or an Age of Dark. Dark Souls 3 is similar in terms of how it lays out its goals for the player relatively explicitly. Dark Souls 2 is a little funny with its wording. The Emerald Herald tells us to seek the king, which is the kind of language our character could use to explicitly understand the world, but we're also told that we've come to stand at Drangleic without knowing why, and that we must seek adversity. The directness is twofold. The player as player character is given direct instruction, and the player as player is given a different direct instruction. We're told to look for the king, but also to look for hard challenges. You might say, we know we're getting closer as the game is getting harder. The Emerald Herald tells us all of this explicitly. I think the delineation and double meanings there is quite telling, because it says something about what we're doing when we're looking for a goal in these games. The goals of the player character are presumably informed by what the player thinks the player character knows, if one is roleplaying, because they are informed by what the player thinks they know. But the player character may be actively being deceived by characters like Koth or Frampt, or any number of others, and the information the player is given is very limited such that they have little ability to discern what the truth is or what the desirable outcome for any party might be. The limitation of the player's knowledge puts them squarely in the shoes of their character, as their ability to know better than their character is limited. This, too, is a kind of role-playing. Kostikian goes on to talk about how goals are not themselves enough for a game, and how they have to support things like challenges and competitiveness. And I'm not in love with everything he says, but does this not literally speak to the design of these games? Circumventing the areas becomes a way of engaging with one's own ignorance, not merely to compensate for limited player knowledge with gameplay challenge, but also to inform the player using that self-same process. The player's understanding of what they are doing and their willingness to do it therefore becomes linked in the process, and this, to my mind, is why so many Dark Souls players praise the element of exploration and adventure that these games are capable of entertaining. However, my understanding of this process in the Dark Souls games differs from Caustic Yen's stated characterization of video games in a major way, which is that I believe in Dark Souls there is a sense in which the game has escaped the endogenous into the exogenous. That is to say, as a social organism, it is no longer contained to within itself, and now exists outside itself as well. This returns to my earlier analysis of the synthesis that From Software have created of gameplay and meaning with socio-culture. 
For the same reason that the internet has generated norms of bowing before PvP duels, and for the same reason that there is such a dominance of what is meta, there is also a sense in which a player is engaged with the game, maybe even playing the game, productively engaging with it at the community level, even by reading or watching this essay. If I can be, as we say, in the middle of a game, in the analogy of a chessboard, playing out my next move in my head, then in a sense I am playing that game, although in a very different way. Video games might not have this same feature, with how we conceive of pauses and game saves, but socially it could still be true on some level. It is especially true of the Dark Souls games in a way that isn't necessarily quite there with many other franchises. The real Dark Souls starts here, in this very conversation. There is also another angle to this uniqueness of the Dark Souls games, and I think as much as a fuller application of ludology is necessary for the first half of this analysis, the second half requires poetics. Where traditionally in contemporary comparative literature, the popular method is to access meaning with hermeneutics to essentially ask what the text could be telling us or some variation thereof, the sometimes historically popular approach of poetics is more mechanical, looking at how elements structurally generate effects on the reader or audience. I believe a fixation on the poetic over the hermeneutic is appropriate due not only to the limitations on and highly subjective interpretive nature of the hermeneutics of Dark Souls owed to intentional gaps left in the game by the developers, but also due to the fact that the substance of hermeneutics, the meaning of the text, has previously been identified as one element of a game's design, but our goal is to understand more broadly how that design has come together. The dual, all-encompassing, and subjective nature of this task was another reason I set up to prefix this analysis with a detailed discussion of my playthroughs of all three games, which I conducted specifically with this essay in mind. Because we can identify the previously mentioned socio-cultural, mechanical, and hermeneutical fusion effect in Dark Souls, understanding Dark Souls in terms of a poetics and game design is likely the most fruitful approach. Of all the critics that have approached these games, it was H. Bomber Guy who put me onto this path with how he talked about them. I believe he, as a rare individual among many, implicitly saw this in how he viewed these games. It's written all over the different sections of his Bloodborne and Dark Souls 2 essays. I did, however, believe it was worth spelling out this framing in explicit terms. I have, for years, held the opinion that the story of a game should be understood as the experience of play. This may not be surprising at all if you deal as much in film critique, where a question of what is happening in the story of a film follows not just the characters in a narrative, but also the camera's frame of view and how it is manipulated. But to put it another way, if I asked you, what is the story of a game of chess, you might be confused and explain the history of chess or the mechanics of chess, where I want to know what story unfolded as the process of playing the game ensued. I think this way because when I was a child, I would sometimes do things like take risk pieces out of the box and play with them like army soldiers, enacting live action battles with plastic figures from a game that usually treats them as static representations of population numbers. The dice and cards in Risk are where the action exists. The pieces merely occupy a space, and then they don't. Shooting enemy troops to death is represented in the process of rolling and comparing dice, and recruitment is similarly represented through cards drawn and assembled into sets. As a type of play, I would take the Risk pieces and begin to treat them as existing in a temporal state that was easier for me to project a narrative onto when that narrative concerned the action usually represented by game pieces that weren't shaped like the soldiers who actually did the fighting and the dying. The story was, in other words, what the pieces did, a fact I understood intuitively from the time that I was old enough to get into the game box without my parents' permission. If a child understands something an adult does not, this can sometimes be the result of ideology, or rather, trained cultural norms. Because I learned to read only after I learned to speak, stories have always been inclusive to strictly verbal interaction for me and nearly all human beings on the planet. If I can explain something that happened, I am telling you a story. It might be true, it might be fictional, it might be some mixture of both. But gaming is like this. It is possible, if unusual, to read nothing while playing a game, and this becomes more common when we consider specifically complex written language. Some people even prefer to play games without reading, a fact that may present them as less erudite in a culture that associates knowledge with writing, but which does not necessarily make them incompetent at the game. Their literacy in the game itself, or gaming in general, literacy if you prefer, is at a high level of competency even if their literacy itself isn't. 
If the game, like Skyrim, has many texts within it for the player to read, and they do not read them, they may think they are not familiar with the story of their own game. However, much of the story of Skyrim is communicated through dialogue, and much of it is taken as truth directly, so this confusion occurs less frequently than in Dark Souls, where there is less dialogue, and much of the dialogue that exists is the unreliable narration of NPCs that contradict themselves or each other. Bethesda was imitating older games like Dungeons & Dragons, while From Software was imitating two major sources of inspiration those being English pulp fantasy novels that Miyazaki read when his English was less fluent, and older generations of video games that incentivized increased playtime by jacking up the difficulty of games in absurd ways. The result is a high fantasy setting communicated primarily through what the player experiences, and the majority of what the player experiences is intensely hostile to the player character. The player is therefore incentivized to treat exploration as a calculated risk, with increased attention to where they have to go and why. With less resistance, Skyrim allows the player to wander a bit more freely, which works with its role-playing mechanics centered around drawing the player into new conflicts and locations. If exploration is more risky to the point where even retreats can be costly or impossible, the player will constantly ask themselves where they have to go next and why. The question can also be understood in this context as asking, why do I have to go to these locations and kill these bosses? Sure, a couple characters in the game told me I should, but from a story perspective, why are those locations and bosses the ones? Once a player asks that question, the inevitable follow-up is, why? And sure, it's because he was an ally to Gwyn gifted a fragment of Gwyn's soul, but why did he ally with Gwyn? What was in it for him? And what was he doing in the archives? This deeper question, and many others like it, have real answers that can be found usually in the environments and in the text attached to certain items in the menus of the game leading many players to come to the belief that the story for Dark Souls is a mystery to be unlocked. This can technically be true, but it is just as true that the story of playing Dark Souls is properly centered around the player and the player character. What you did and why ended up being deeper questions than anything that could be answered by a lore video, as much as I think I've proven I'm inclined towards those, because lore and gameplay both have stories, but between the two, the latter is more key to Dark Souls. This is why I open this section of this video by discussing and quoting from people who write about video games and talk about narrative and play, because there's a perceived break between narrative and gameplay in gaming analysis where rightfully there should not be one. To speak of one in terms of what is happening on the screen is to speak of the other. This is also why, in my experience, trained and educated analysts and critics of film as a medium make up some of the most astute games critics. I sometimes use diegesis as a concept in video games analysis to invoke narratology. The menus of the video games are extra diegetic for the same reason that text appearing on screen at the beginning of a film or scene in a film is extra diegetic. They exist within the work, but not within its story. Sometimes fourth wall breaks can be executed by merging diegetic and extra diegetic elements, like a favorite joke of mine from the anime of one of my favorite gag mangas, Bobo 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 Bobo. Bo Bo. A group of characters are being introduced in turns, with their names and titles on screen, and in the English dub, when the Japanese kanji appear on one character, he says, get those Japanese words off of me. This self-referential postmodern humor is capable of existing precisely because of that distinction. It may benefit ludology as a field to develop a consistent and particular usage of diegesis for the very reason that video games have a unique relationship to it. In other words, I keep using that word because to just say what the player experiences would be inclusive of many things that I don't mean. The interpretation of a text is also culturally contingent in the sense of reading text itself as a practice being contingent upon a cultural history. Hermeneutics, what you might generally understand in the sense of deconstructing art in terms of what the work of art means, is predicated on a cultural history of, among other things, exegesis, that being the reading of holy scripture to extract meaning. The frame of mind required to ask, what does the story of the Dark Souls trilogy mean in the context of how I've been talking about it, is ironically predicated on the tradition of asking similar questions about what God might want from us as communicated by a passage in the Bible. This is ironic because, in my opinion, said meaning contained within the Dark Souls games taken together as a series of texts is anti-biblical, a refutation of miracle through violence as presented in a boss fight as well as a skepticism of religious narrative as expressed through dialogue. Let's try an example of anti-biblical Dark Souls hermeneutics to illustrate this point. 
There's a movement from Mozart's Requiem that you might recognize. It's called Lacrimosa, which loosely means tearful, and is also an allusion to the Virgin Mary, Mother of Christ. The words are taken from a Catholic hymn and are in Latin, but in English you may read it as saying roughly, Full of tears is the day when rising from the ashes the guilty man is judged. Therefore pardon him, God, merciful Christ our Lord, and grant him rest eternal. Amen. I say loosely and roughly because there are more official translations, but this was how I put it together myself as someone who does not study Latin. There are different schools of thought in translating poetry, but I don't exactly have a lot of respect for the Catholic Church's prerogatives in matters of textual interpretation, even as someone who was raised Catholic. That said, it doesn't bother me if people translate the Requiem Mass differently, and I know people will have their preferences. I currently like thinking about it this way, especially for our purposes here. You see, this idea of the Dies Irae, or Day of Wrath, is essentially how people understand Judgment Day or Doomsday. There are many differing interpretations of this concept, some of which predate the historical date given for the birth of Christ. One thing I like about Dark Souls 3 is that the entire game is essentially that world's Judgment Day. The world is full of suffering and tears, but the unkindled are called upon to rise from the ashes and face judgment. Only, the way in which this world ends is escaping the Age of Fire and cycle of kindling, and to do this is to betray God. Competing narratives throughout all three games offer differing ideas of how to best serve mankind, but in Dark Souls 3 we are finally allowed to be the answer. The definitive answer that heals the world is betrayal. Finally, at the end, when the soul of Cinder calls upon Gwyn, God himself is being called to answer the judgment of man. Do you ever wonder why the bells toll to call the unkindled from the ashes? This too is a reference to the Day of Judgment. We rise from a cemetery also because the tolling of the bell, just like the recitation of the Requiem Mass, is a funerary rite. In many Christian traditions, the notion of the Dies Irae is also a concept of justice. It is a version of justice whereupon God puts people essentially in their place, in accordance with how they lived and whether they repented. There are other ways of considering Judgment Day, however, including those found in Jewish traditions. Miyazaki and From Software have essentially forwarded their own inversion of the myth, an original take on the Day of Wrath that presents it in the terms of mankind as an attempt at healing the world. That is also a different notion of justice. Instead of putting God in his place, when we meet the soul of Cinder and what remains of Gwyn, his musical theme returns. It is a deeply tragic movement in the theme, as if echoes of Gwyn were seeping out of this ember of the dying light. Instead of a unified requiem for a dying world, as in the first game, in the third game we instead hear droplets of piano notes, like falling tears in between the choir crying for relief. In the end, for the god that feared man, I have only pity. Think of the different boss themes, their change in movement, and the boss fights themselves in their phases. Think of the laws of time and space becoming convoluted, causing reality to fall in on itself. And think of your character progressing in the physical world from area to area. Think of the dialogue, the pregnant pauses between words, how lines are chosen for their sound and meaning. Think of the text you may read on screen and the blank page behind. Think of the beginnings of animations and their ends how you and the enemies sequence them in a delicate dance. Now, understand that this is all one experience, all together. When you begin to see everything in structure like this, you begin to see a video game in terms of its poetics. I want to be clear about how I'm using language here. Poetics has a broad application, and ludology is a broad field, and even the specific phrase ludopoetics has some established uses. I was searching for public uses of the term to see if anyone had used it in the way that I had, and found some texts that came close. One use case of the term was on a webpage for a workshop by someone named Calum Roger, which sounded intriguing and seemed to mainly be about adapting poems into blueprints for digital games. This seemed close to how I was using the term, not just because it pertained to video games specifically as opposed to games in general, but also because it was essentially a reversal of my way of thinking. Instead of seeing digital games with an appropriate poetics, it appears to be the lecturer's attempt at seeing poetics translated into digital games. Similarly, a second use case of ludopoetics is in a piece by Francis Butterworth Parr titled Mock Phrases Towards a Poetics of Video Games in Contemporary Literary Culture, which deals in the consequences of this idea of mock phrases as a poetics of video games as represented in literature. This also appeared different from my use of ludopoetics as a poetics of the video game itself as a medium, but I felt I was getting warmer. 
Another use case comes from a piece co-written by Jonathan P. Ebern and Andrew Epstein called Introduction Poetry Games. The piece discusses poetry understood as play across different eras, with various associated baggage that has contributed to the current way we see play in poetry. It was provocative to see Ebern and Epstein discuss the digital component of modern ludopoetics, but ultimately, this piece felt only adjacent to what I needed. The authors do, interestingly enough, lay out a concept of a specific era of increased notions of play and poetry, specifically in the latter half of the 20th century, saying, quote, the avant-garde New American poetry that emerged in the 1950s and 1960s was even more fully invested in the idea of poetry as play and game than were many of the strains of modernist compositional play that preceded it. This was of interest to me in particular due to some of the earlier ideas of play in texts that I encountered from the era of postmodern literature from the post-World War II era and onward, although postmodernism and play is the subject of an entirely different essay. Stay tuned. There were also a pair of YouTube videos that caught my eye as I conducted my search. One was from a channel called Two Artists Explain, with explain spelled E-X-P lane. I get it, it's funny, I like it. Titled, The Poetics of Elden Ring, which discusses the Poetics of Elden Ring messages left between players in online mode. And genuinely, I feel the need to say here that few videos on this platform have charmed me more with such a pure combination of analysis and simple fun. It's great. One of the best Elden Ring videos ever made. It's also remarkably close to what I'm talking about, except instead of seeing the whole game as having a poetics, it's mostly focused on the poetics of literal written words. The words, however, occupy a digital space on the map geometry of Elden Ring's world, so it's pretty close to the kind of thing I mean by ludopoetics. The other video is a brief talk by Dr. Grant Jenkins at the Computer Simulation and Gaming Conference in 2022, titled, CSGC 2022 The Poetics of Video Games, which seemed to be presenting an opportunity for a course dealing in a poetics of video games. I wish I could have taken a course like this when I was in college, but bar emailing Dr. Jenkins to bother him about it, I'm not certain what else I can draw from this other than the opportunity to do what I am doing here. A sixth and final use case of this concept of ludopoetics arose in a blog post from Alejandro Ruiz del Sol, entitled simply, Ludo Poetic Theory. The post itself is written in response to a brief critique of Bioshock by Clint Hawking. It was when I found myself digging through old blog posts from 2007 that I realized I was really in trouble. However, Ruiz del Sol's writing is surprisingly close to my own feelings, and he wrote that blog post in 2021. It seems like he was encountering the exact same idea in gaming that I was. If I could allow myself some emotional vulnerability here, I think I found a rare living writer here who genuinely understands the problems that I thought I was alone in noticing. Here's someone still living and breathing and still making games and art in 2023 that I feel inspired to witness. Anyway, with that fangirling out of the way, I can't overstate how much I felt I was stumbling around in the dark trying to deploy this specific notion of ludopoetics that I am trying to articulate here in this essay. But reading Ruiz del Sol's writing hit me with the epiphany that I'm not synthesizing a new form of media analysis here. I'm cooperatively building with a tradition of gamer poets. Reading this short post gave me the intense, almost spiritual experience of seeing myself at the front of a long trail of people who came before and will come after. I can't emphasize enough that I'm not creating something totally new here. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Take this quote, for example. Because as far as I can tell, there has never been a mention of ludopoetics in game discussion, this can be a place to introduce or formalize the informal idea. It means proving its existence in video gaming as is, as well as finding a way to allow for artists to intentionally create ludopoetry. My argument is that ludopoetry exists just as much as ludonarratives exist, and the existence of ludopoetry further complicates ludonarratives. However, we haven't named anything as such just yet. I will try to further explain the idea here in this post, and in future posts I will focus more on specific games that I believe are employing ludopoetics. He also goes on to give a definition of ludopoetics when describing how we can see this concept paired with ludonarrative in ludology, saying, quote, Ludopoetics is the player's interaction with the poetics. Further, in video games, poetics can be broadly seen as the game's feeling, and the player enacts these actions. For what it's worth, Alejandro, I buy your argument completely. 
I personally want to articulate an even more specific notion of ludopoetics, and by the end of this section, I hope to be able to do that with sufficient evidence and analogy. Sources on using poetics as a way of deconstructing video games are, admittedly, a bit sparse. And, in fact, deployment of the concept of poetics for art forms other than poetry tends to be highly practical in the sense that each medium and sometimes genre is treated as having a poetics particular to it that can be best understood as relating to poetry at a metaphorical level. A poetics of a television series narrative might occur in story beats as arranged throughout scenes, episodes, and seasons to create a rhythm of storytelling. In fact, for writers, using the language of poetics in this way is often highly instructive to understanding their process. In a short piece in The Point of Theory, Practices of Cultural Analysis, entitled Whatever Happened to Descriptive Poetics, where he addresses Virgil L. Locke's Whatever Happened to PTL, in detail, Brian McHale says, quote, Descriptive poetics could be defined negatively as not identical with interpretation, in the sense of the assignment of a determinate meaning or meanings to a text or textual feature, though it may be dependent on prior interpretations or may have implications for interpretation. Nor is it to be identified with abstract theory, though it is undoubtedly informed by theory and has consequences for theory. Rather, pitched at a level of abstraction between theory and textual interpretation, it aspires to give exhaustive accounts of objects of various kinds, a single text or group of texts, an individual author's practice, the practices of a school or tradition of writing, a genre, period style, or the literary system at a particular period over time, descriptive poetics in its historical dimension, or specific literary techniques, devices, topoi, repertoires, etc. Thus, descriptive poetics is to be defined not so much in terms of its objects, which are obviously highly heterogeneous, as by its level of generalization. Occupying the middle range of generalization, it aspires to be sufficiently general that its findings could be adduced as evidence from more than one interpretation of a specific text, or author, school, genre, etc., while at the same time not so general as to prevent its findings being subsumed under more than one high-level theory of literature, culture, semiosis, etc. Descriptive poetics has an awkward in-between status, but in fact, its awkward in-betweenness is precisely what recommends it. In other words, the role of a descriptive poetics is to operate with concern for the moves within a piece or text, specifically in a matter that greatly encompasses the content while not restricting the analysis to a single reading, thus privileging the content as is over the interpretation resulting from the reading. In order to not have this analysis appear as total, disoriented pablum, the analyst deploying this method must, however, have a particular loyalty to a certain framework, a certain way of approaching the text. A feminist reading of Jane Eyre, for example, might use descriptive poetics to look at the text in its genre to the exclusion of neither reading Jane's ending up with Rochester as sexist, submitting an independent female character, to the restrictions of a domestic life, nor reading that same ending as anti-sexist for how the ending is a prioritization of Jane's desires occurring on terms that equalize her with Rochester, while still invariably submitting the text to a feminist frame of reference. A surrealist reading of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe could similarly leave the door open to reading Narnia as existing dreamlike for a character other than the four children, making them trespassers into another character's dream, as well as leaving the door open to seeing Narnia as specifically representing the unconscious mind of the four children themselves. And yes, in case you're wondering, you one Chronicles of Narnia fan who caught the leaving the door open joke, yes, that was intentional. Leaving the world of literature and concerning ourselves with other mediums, you can easily imagine how descriptive poetics might be useful to YouTubers who talk about other types of art more frequently. Imagine an essayist approaching the Marvel Cinematic Universe through descriptive poetics. They could analyze perhaps each shot and each scene, and how they intertwine in all their elements through the entire first Iron Man film, and even then continue this process for Iron Man 2 and Iron Man 3, and even all the other Iron Man films. This could be done, for example, as a study of the character of Iron Man in all the films where he appears, to see how elements of film like camera angle, lighting, and so on treat the character. This would give the viewer of such an essay different competing ideas of who Tony Stark really is, but it could also create a way of approaching the character analytically, and for that, you would need an analytical framework. What about choosing to see Tony Stark as a Byronic hero? 
that would benefit from adopting the framing of romanticism. What about choosing to see Tony Stark as a comically ironic protagonist? Well, that would benefit from the framing of postmodernism. You can begin to see how general ways of seeing a character, regardless of your specific conclusion about them, do imply a broad framing of the source material in some way. I actually found Mikhail's essay due to googling for useful sources on poetics approaching this issue that led me down a rabbit hole of under-discussed uses of poetics that ended in me abandoning that avenue when the most useful stuff I got were some very limited articles cited in some obscure and brief Wikipedia entries. Shout out to the Wikipedia team, but I had to go elsewhere for longer and more apt sources that would be more useful to me. There's two senses in which I was able to find that poetics would be extremely useful to me here. namely one work relating to Christian symbolism, and another relating to Renaissance symbolism. Let's explore the first of those two a bit before transitioning into the second, for reasons that will become apparent momentarily. In Poetics of the Holy, a reading of Paradise Lost, Michael Lieb articulates the distinction between subcategories of Herophanes, which in direct terms is the revelation of the sacred. He demarcates the Cretophany as existing in otherwise mundane particular objects, whereas the theophany is often a greater revelation of a higher mystery. I immediately saw use for this in distinguishing between elements of content in the final boss levels of the Dark Souls games. To wit, analogically, the cretophany of Dark Souls 1 is the scenery and map geometry revealing the landscape of the Ashen Firelink Shrine, and the greater theophany is the engagement with Gwyn himself and what follows after. Similarly, the lead-in and boss arena to Nishandra and even the sight of her is the Cretophany of Dark Souls 2, whereas the Theophany appears confined more to the final cutscenes. Whereas the sight of Gwyn is fundamental to the revelation of the ending of Dark Souls 1, the meaning in the ending of Dark Souls 2 is generated by what follows, in the seeking and acquisition of victory, the throne, or something else entirely. Dark Souls 2 is, in some ways, seeking the sacred by feeling its absence, so it touches it more closely as the aftermath of player action. Dark Souls 3 delivers on this by reversing the initial role of the environment, not as a lesser revelation, but as the greater revelation. The identity of the Soul of Cinder itself is essentially dictated to the player by the sight of the world of Lothric and beyond, falling in on itself as it all crumbles to ash, and the cobbled together identities of the Soul of Cinder are themselves a reflection of this, as well as relating to its cause. When the Soul of Cinder enters its second phase, what has already been revealed by the environment manifests in the boss itself. Gwyn's soul is the final hymn of a twisted choir that grasps at infinity, twisting the world as well in the process. Dark Souls 3 tells us this without telling us, showing us, instead, with the language of the video game, specifically the From Software team's Souls-like dialect. For the sacred to manifest in a video game is essentially for the player to meet with Herophany, to make that epiphany physical, to manifest it such that it can be touched in the digital realm by the player's interactive controls. However, for Dark Souls, an inversion of the holy is what is at stake narratively, not as an agenda to defile so much as a reversal of imagery and metaphor. By the end of Dark Souls 3, we come to see the dark not as a defilement or removal of the sacred and holy, but rather an alternative era. A force not merely opposed, but altogether distinct. This transformation of the dark and the abyss occurs on the level of the physical world and digital space, as well as the personal level of the character and their digital presence in that world. Lieb writes that for Milton in Paradise Lost, from which we quoted much earlier, Holiness is not without, but within, not an attribute of things, but of self, meant not to denigrate, but to ennoble, meant not to separate, but to unite. This is the Dark Soul and darkness itself in Dark Souls. It is a feature of the soul of man, and the age of the dark is mankind's age. From the perspective of Gwyn, the rising dark is a threat, but the way of the world is change, and so the curse on men's souls and the linking of the fire as an act of resistance against the turning of the age is Gwyn's offense against that order. To turn from fire to dark in Dark Souls 1 is to attempt to reunite with the order of the world, and mankind's inability to do so in Dark Souls 2 becomes then a matter of seeking the holy, in this sense of the idea, by seeking a unity of the self with the logic of the world, even against God. As I was working on this essay and searching for advice from friends in the research process, I received a few recommendations, and one pointed me towards the work of Giorgio Agamben and his text Profanations. Assessing the various passages, I found exactly what I didn't know I needed to hear. Quote, 
The passage from the sacred to the profane can, in fact, also come about by means of an entirely inappropriate use, or rather reuse, of the sacred, namely, play. It is well known that the spheres of play and the sacred are closely connected. Most of the games with which we are familiar derive from ancient sacred ceremonies, from divinatory practices and rituals that once belonged, broadly speaking, to the religious sphere. The girotondo was originally a marriage rite. Playing with a ball reproduces the struggle of the gods for the possession of the sun. Games of chance derive from oracular practices. The spinning top and the chessboard were instruments of divination. In analyzing the relationship between games and rites, Emile Benveniste shows that play not only derives from the sphere of the sacred, but also in some ways represents its overturning. The power of the sacred, he writes, lies in the conjunction of the myth that tells the story and the rite that reproduces and stages it. Play breaks up this unity. As ludus, or physical play, it drops the myth and preserves the rite. As aeocus, or word play, it effaces the rite and allows the myth to survive. Quote, if the sacred can be defined through the consubstantial unity of myth and rite, we can say that one has play when only half of the sacred operation is completed, translating only the myth into words or only the rite into actions." End quote. This means that play frees and distracts humanity from the sphere of the sacred, without simply abolishing it. The use to which the sacred is returned is a special one that does not coincide with utilitarian consumption. In fact, the profanation of play does not solely concern the religious sphere. Children who play with whatever old thing falls into their hands make toys out of things that also belong to the spheres of economics, war, law, and other activities that we are used to thinking of as serious. All of a sudden, a car, a firearm, or legal contract becomes a toy. What is common to these cases and the profanation of the sacred is the passage from a religio that is now felt to be false or oppressive to negligence as vera religio. This, however, does not mean neglect, no kind of attention can compare to that of a child at play, but a new dimension of use, which children and philosophers give to humanity. It is the sort of use that Benjamin must have had in mind when he wrote of Kafka's The New Attorney that the law is no longer applied but only studied is the gate to justice. Just as the religio that is played with but no longer observed opens the gate to use, so the powers, potenze, of economics, law, and politics deactivated in play can become the gateways to a new happiness. Play as an organ of profanation is in decline everywhere. Modern man proves he no longer knows how to play precisely through the vertiginous proliferation of new and old games. Indeed, at parties, in dances, and at play, he desperately and stubbornly seeks exactly the opposite of what he could find there, the possibility of re-entering the Lost Feast, returning to the sacred and its rites, even in the form of the inane ceremonies of the new spectacular religion or a tango lesson in a provincial dance hall. In this sense, televised game shows are part of a new liturgy. They secularize an unconsciously religious intention. To return to play, its purely profane vocation is a political task. In this sense, we must distinguish between secularization and profanation. Secularization is a form of repression. It leaves intact the forces it deals with by simply moving them from one place to another. Thus, the political secularization of theological concepts, the transcendence of God as a paradigm of sovereign power, does nothing but displace the heavenly monarchy onto an earthly monarchy, leaving its power intact. Profanation, however, neutralizes what it profanes. Once profaned, that which was unavailable and separate loses its aura and is returned to use. Both are political operations. The first guarantees the exercise of power by carrying it back to a sacred model. The second deactivates the apparatuses of power and returns to common use the spaces that power had seized. I think this passage from Profanations ties together notions of the sacred and profane with ludology quite well. One reason for that is, as Agamben states, to make something an object of play is to disrupt the connection between myth and rite. His two senses of play, wordplay and physical play, are of special interest to us, because in a sense to develop a poetics of video gaming is to see physical play analogously to wordplay. Gameplay and narrative in video games are talked about in two different senses because, in this light at least, we are dealing with two different kinds of play. In terms of the sacred, its holiness is disrupted by either kind of play, but if both occur at once, as opposed to uniting both senses of play to reproduce the sacred, thereby creating it, still the video game makes common to mankind what would be the domain of God exclusively, thereby profaning the sacred. 
This reproduction is, therefore, a profaning of two types, and therefore our poetics of gaming must understand the sacred in the video game as manifesting as the profane. What struck me when reading the early passages of Lieb's book where he covers notions of the holy and its origins is how strongly his account of the historical origin of the holy was to Nietzsche's notion of master morality. A master morality and slave morality have, according to Nietzsche, as originally expressed in On the Genealogy of Morality, and as subsequently expanded upon in Beyond Good and Evil, arisen in class society not merely oppositionally but relationally. For master morality, good and bad are qualities conferred precisely because of, and owe their nature to, their status in relation to the ruler or master. The ruler, being one who determines values, becomes also the standard by which they are measured. Slave morality, by contrast, is to Nietzsche a morality of usefulness. Notions of good and evil, his reasoning explains, arise here, where for example the slave feels resentment towards the virtues of the powerful, being so disenfranchised by society and so ruler and ruled develop antithetical values, such that the moral good of the ruler becomes contemptuous in the light of the moral good of the ruled. I am reminded of this for the reason that these notions of the origin of the holy map onto this moral diagram and also to the narrative of Dark Souls. Gwyn's entire contextual morality and fable-making around the Age of Fire, as perpetuated by many of the NPCs with whom the player interfaces, from Frampt to Guinevere, position goodness as being a matter of the light, in the keeping with the traditions of medieval fantasy as handed down by their modern equivalents in the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien and other similar figures. Notions of darkness and light representing good and evil have become staples of modern fantasy settings, and Dark Souls inverts this slowly at first, presenting only complications of the narrative hagiography of Gwyn, but never total inversions until the third game. The complications presented in the competing narratives of Frampt and Koth in Dark Souls 1 are exacerbated in the dialogue of Aldia in Dark Souls 2, where the player can receive explicit dialogue about the notion that, quote, once, the Lord of Light banished Dark and all that stemmed from humanity, and men assumed a fleeting form. These are the roots of our world. Men are props on the stage of life, and no matter how tender, how exquisite, a lie will remain a lie. Notions of truth, of good and evil, of nature itself and its purpose, its quality, all exist for the human and hollow in opposition to the moral assessment of Gwyn's kingdom. The resentment of man against the rule of God is expressed in the morality of how mankind operates within the rule of Gwyn in Dark Souls 1, and in the inevitability of the cycle of fire and the rise of kingdoms as expressed in Dark Souls 2. This is not exactly a rejection through opposition, but an inversion through opposition, just as the poetics of darkness in Dark Souls are themselves an inversion of the poetics of the holy, not necessarily an expression of the profane. It is tempting to see separation and segregation in inversion, but to mirror a thing for the sake of not disengaging from it but engaging with it is not a full rejection but rather a function of play. To play the game is to embrace the subject of the game, in an inverted embrace, looking through the mirror of the screen, seeing reality other than it is, and so the player, being aware of this distinction, feels in themselves an invisible discrimination, not just separated as real spaces from digital space, but as a joke would be from earnestness. To engage in play is to manifest irony physically and also ideologically, as an awareness of one's own state. Because of this, to play is also to critique and to commentate, but it is distinct from these things because it is a form of them that engages in their deconstruction as reconstruction, as a truly sincere parody that is itself more than the sum of its parts. That is the nature of play in the digital space as in the real. Later on in his essay In Praise of Profanation, Agamben goes on to say of the work of Walter Benjamin that, quote, Capitalism as Religion is the title of one of Walter Benjamin's most penetrating posthumous fragments. According to Benjamin, Capitalism is not solely a secularization of the Protestant faith, as it is for Max Weber, but is itself essentially a religious phenomenon, which develops parasitically from Christianity. As the religion of modernity, it is defined by three characteristics. First, it is a cultic religion, perhaps the most extreme and absolute one that has ever existed. In it, everything has meaning only in reference to the fulfillment of a cult, not in relation to a dogma or an idea. Second, this cult is permanent. It is the celebration of a cult sans trêve et sans merci. Here, it is not possible to distinguish between workdays and holidays. Rather, there is a single, uninterrupted holiday in which work coincides with the celebration of the cult. Third, 
The capitalist cult is not directed toward redemption from or atonement for guilt, but toward guilt itself. Quote, Capitalism is probably the first instance of a cult that creates guilt, not atonement. A monstrous sense of guilt that knows no redemption becomes the cult, not to atone for this guilt, but to make it universal, and to once and for all include God in this guilt. God is not dead, he has been incorporated into the destiny of man. End quote. Precisely because it strives, with all of its might, not toward redemption but toward guilt, not toward hope but toward despair, capitalism as religion does not aim at the transformation of the world but at its destruction. And in our time, its dominion is so complete that, according to Benjamin, even the three great prophets of modernity, Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud, conspire with it. They are, in some way, on the side of the religion of despair. Quote, This passage of the planet man, through the house of despair, in the absolute loneliness of his path is the ethos that Nietzsche defined. This man is the superman, the first to recognize the religion of capitalism and bring it to fulfillment." End quote. Freudian theory, too, belongs to the priesthood of the capitalist cult. Quote, what has been repressed, the idea of sin, is capital itself, which pays interest on the hell of the unconscious. End quote. And for Marx, capitalism, quote, becomes socialism by means of the simple and compound interest that are functions of schuld, or guilt and debt." End quote. I think that the implication of a Gambin drawing on Nietzsche and us applying these notions of class, morality, religion, the sacred, and profane through the epochs and ages is essentially this. Our morals, our practices, our communities, our resources, our epistemes, and so on are all obscured. The thing that disturbs me about this is that lots of ideologies reckon with this implication but many have an essentially conservative response, where they either try to retreat from the cold, hostile present into the womb of the prelapsarian past, or attempt to soothe themselves in that present by asserting it as universality, all that ever was or could be. These answers are uncompelling for the same reason that a suicide cult is uncompelling. If you're on the outside looking in, you know where this is going. The way forward, the future, is the only way out of the present. And this, of course, engenders questions of the character of that future and how to move towards it, which brings us back to Dark Souls. To me, Dark Souls is compelling specifically because it delves into an unreliable narrative of double meanings and political plots, featuring a tension between man and god, and with that window dressing asks the question that needs asking, how do we move forward? How do we extract ourselves from this system of moral debts, spiritual debts, and financial debts, from Christian morality, from capitalism. More textually, how does mankind break from its curse, the dark sign on humanity itself? How does the Age of Fire finally end so the world can move on and not be tortured endlessly for the ego of a would-be god or his faded memory? How do we reach the next age, the next system, a future morality or social order? It's a compelling question. In Dark Souls 3, mankind has the opportunity to escape the cycle of fire. This specifically requires quelling the first flame purposefully and embracing darkness in a grand betrayal. The weakness of the alternative morality of mankind is evidenced in the fact that this is not the same ending as the Lord of Hollows ending, nor was it available to the protagonists of Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. To reach this apotheosis of the world-building of the Dark Souls trilogy, one must give eyes to the eyeless firekeeper. Two facts, then, stand out as important to me. Firstly, Shanelot in Dark Souls 2 seems to have been made for a similar purpose, but she too was missing something, something that perhaps the bearer of the curse could never give her. Anastasia also was missing something in Dark Souls 1, a tongue instead of eyes, but in her case she embraced not the purpose of the Chosen Undead, but rather the purpose of Gwyn. It is fitting that we give her a tongue to speak, and she returns only affirming her own meekness and uncouthness. She prefers not to speak. Perhaps we should have given her eyes to see. The eyes of the Firekeeper show a world without fire, visions of betrayal. The Ashen One must guide the Firekeeper, despite the supposed purpose of the Unkindled, to undo the roots that have bound their world. But in doing this, they are bound to embrace the cycle. Not any one age, but all future ages. The course of history and not merely one era. The moral implications, I think, are clear. Agamben ends his essay in praise of profanation from the similarly titled Profanations by saying, quote, All apparatuses of power are always double. They arise, on the one hand, from an individual subjectivizing behavior, 
and in the other from its capture in a separate sphere. There is often nothing reprehensible about the individual behavior in itself, and it can indeed express a liberatory intent. It is reprehensible only if the behavior, when it has not been constrained by circumstances or by force, lets itself be captured in the apparatus. Neither the brazen-faced gesture of the porn star nor the impassive face of the fashion model is, as such, to be blamed. Instead, what is disgraceful, both politically and morally, are the apparatus of pornography and the apparatus of the fashion show, which have diverted them from their possible use. The unprofanable of pornography, everything that is unprofanable, is founded on the arrest and diversion of an authentically profanatory intention. For this reason, we must always wrest from the apparatuses, from all apparatuses, the possibility of use that they have captured. The profanation of the unprofanable is the political task of the coming generation." End quote. In the context of the poetics of the sacred, and of play, and of Christian inheritances in our modern culture and society, I think the aforementioned passages make clear that there is space for the video game to be a radical profanation, a use case of art not merely contributing to political consciousness as all art can, but actively, by virtue of how it exists, tearing down the sacred by way of profanation through play, the breaking of the unity of myth and right in a single unity of its own. Similarly, to see the video game in terms of generating meaning via its poetics as opposed to an exegetic meaning is to move away from the norms of scripture or sacred texts. Video gaming is almost uniquely positioned as an art form to provoke the kinds of interactions which will be necessary in our thought and culture if we are ever to transcend the present era and its problems. Michael Lieb opens his book attempting to couch his analysis in what he hopes to present as, quote, a sensitivity to the universality of certain religious phenomena that might be said to unite all poets responsive to the dynamics of those phenomena, whatever the particular doctrinal persuasions of those poets." End quote. I feel on a personal level that I have no persuasion in favor of any religious doctrine, but on the contrary, as an atheist, often find myself an outsider to it despite my upbringing. I do also, however, conceive of myself primarily in the sense of what I am before what I am not, and so I am a poet first in this case, as well as a student of literature, and a player of games or gamer. Being more gamer than Christian, I have no trouble seeing the usefulness of Lieb's nonpartisan attitude, and feel that despite my way of seeing Dark Souls, here lies, in the very essence of becoming cognizant of this approach, a willingness to be so all-encompassing. Reading Lieb's work on Milton affirmed to me the need for a particular language of video game poetics. What is the iamb? or other metric of digital space. In addressing the parallel of poet and prophet in the Miltonic tradition, Lieb shows a profound awareness of and respect for the function of poetry in religious and particularly Christian traditions. The purpose of this essay is not only to provide sufficient grounds to ask the question, what is the role of poetics in seeing video games, but also to use Dark Souls and its relationship simultaneously with language and digital space to present substance that might give us as audience members and gamers the requisite knowledge to begin to formulate an answer to the query. I have seen many people discuss how Dark Souls draws on Nietzsche, but far fewer discuss how it draws on Milton. I hope that with some prompting I have at least put the question into everyone's minds. Poetics can be a way of seeing video games as digital experiences with beats and rhythm, but poetry itself has clearly influenced Dark Souls. I firmly believe that poetry is the key to unlocking the strengths of From Software's game design in this legendary trilogy. Where the games often seemed obtuse or strange, even unapproachable or impossible, this to me feels, as I earlier implied, to be the mark of an unlearned language. We are, those of us who have played the ever-loving hell out of these games, learning to become fluent in From Software's design. Dark Souls is still, going into 2024, well over a decade after the release of the first game, underrated. I adore watching new players pick these games up and ask questions like, why do these NPCs talk like that? What's up with all the laughing? What's up with all the cool names for stuff? It's not just that Dark Souls has so many influences that it would be impossible to catch literally every single one. Dark Souls and the From Software games of the same genre have brought with them a certain style, a way of using sound and visuals, space and movement, voices and silence. When we learn this language, we can transform it, and more Souls-likes can be made to build upon this tradition, this genre. By implication, I've already drawn some poetic parallels using the humble voices lent to me for this project by my fellow creators on this platform. 
We've got one more for you shortly, but before that, let's talk about some of those poetic selections. Milton was an obvious choice, and I selected him specifically for the narrator-poet's inverted parallel to Aldia as a character, attempting to justify, and then either accepting in one case or rejecting in the other, the laws of God to men. For a couple other picks, I chose figures like Dickinson and Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley's poem in the earlier section felt to me to be an excellent parallel to the act of being drawn into and visiting, in one instance, another time, and in another instance, a literal painting, which was, after all, the sort of thing she was writing about. Dickinson is a poet whose work is dear to my heart. I take a small degree of personal inspiration from her, but largely I relate to her lifestyle and the way it seems to have informed her poetry, retreating increasingly into a life of physical seclusion, eccentricity, and socialization from afar, Dickinson reminds me quite a bit of my own attempt to revitalize my work as a writer while coping with depression and heavy fatigue. In particular, even as a child, I would say I always related to her interest in death itself, a quality shared by the Dark Souls games. I looked also to Keats, thinking of a former professor of mine who instilled in me an appreciation for new media. I wanted to use his words to invigorate those that might find these words reaching them with an appreciation for the ruined and the lost. I drew upon Shelley, for in particular a notion of peace to parallel Chancellor Welliger's dialogue about Nishandra and the Dark, but also to introduce a reference to H. Bomberguy's essay, where he himself referenced Shelley, inserting Gwyn in place of Ozymandias, to again call up that same notion of the ruin, but this time to affect a tone of tragedy, loss, and emptiness. Hopefully everyone can, at a minimum, appreciate the gravity with which I have treated H. Bomberguy's words on these games. Soulslikes are like rhythm games, for the same reason H. Bomberguy's language about play conditioning was so compelling to me when I first heard it. These are a recognition of the beats of Soul's poetics. Here's someone who is beginning to speak near-fluent Soulslike and translate it for an audience. I don't know if I've achieved anything similar, but then my goal was never that particular. I was less concerned with a specific issue and more with pointing to the broad phenomenon. To accompany the previously stated concepts around holy digital space as styles of epiphany, I'd like to now visit the second source I mentioned, a text by Andrew Hue titled The Poetics of Runes in Renaissance Literature, because the world of Dark Souls is in many ways a ruined world, a world existing in an afterstate, occupying the remains of the former. A chapter of this text opens, quite poignantly, with a discussion also of biblical scripture. Quote, The story of Babel spells out in elemental terms a primal poetics of runes. All people yearn to create something that will outlast themselves, yet this attempt is thwarted by the divine. Architecture is a collective attempt at survival. Without a common tongue, human communication, much less construction, is impossible. In short, the Bible in the very beginning articulates a close relationship between language building and mortality. The questions posed are far-reaching. What can we do to heal the wounds of Babel? How can we talk to one another after the rupture of universal language? How do we remember after the confusion of tongues?" End quote. Of all the stories in the Bible, as one who was raised Catholic but who was also gay and transgender, who saw deep flaws in religion and scripture, who yearned for a feeling that was something like justice, these narratives of mankind against God or vice versa were always one of the more compelling elements of scripture. When you are a child and you are told implicitly that God is against you, who you are in your very character, before you even know how to express it yourself, there are many conclusions this can lead to. But under some interpretations of the story, is Babel not also the story of the origins of Dark Souls? For God so feared mankind that he would cast them out, wall them off, give them over to false Edens, enchant them with lies and falsehoods, seal away their power and set in motion events that would cement his reign though the throne of heaven be vacant in consequence. This, in many ways, is truer to the god I always knew, the god that was used to scare little children, the god whose name came with sin and hatred, with the exaltation of the worshipper in their falsity, with lies and with manipulation and cheating, with anger and with pain. This was not a god that gave me fire out of pity, but a fire was kindled nonetheless. How should mankind react to such a god? Many of us pity Gwyn, many of us hate him, Many of us love him and hurt him reluctantly, but all of us, from cutscene to credits, are his adversary. I think there's a pitiable truth to that, an element of the art of Dark Souls' story that is true to life. The notion of memory after Fracture that Andrew Hue specifically draws attention to is one highly present as a theme in Dark Souls 2, whether it be through Strayed after we unpetrify him, or through Vendrick or the player character as they slowly lose their sense of self. 
but that notion of mankind fractured and misguided is one that plays a role in all games, as with the two primordial serpents and their different guidance, or the competing agendas of their legacy in the firelinking tradition and the sable church of Londor. In reading Quay, I found his work on poetics surrounding runes and Renaissance poetry to be very forward analytically, with him saying, quote, I argue that the yearning for timelessness that underlies the Renaissance poetics of runes is realized through the strategy of a temporal multiplicity, a process that transmutes the past and is in turn open to its own transformation, from author to author, reader to reader. In other words, Renaissance poetry, implicitly or explicitly, hopes to transcend its temporal and spatial horizons, aspiring to be a monument, yet survives in the imminent world by being recycled, cited, and transformed by successors, living as a ruin." End quote. This is a compelling way to consider the relationship Dark Souls as a game has to its influences, I feel, since where Renaissance art, in Hui's words, aspired to be a monument but lived as a ruin, Dark Souls as play presents its digital environment as runes in a typical sense, and its own temporal multiplicity, both in the sense that time within the game narrative is convoluted and in the sense that the player may move through multiple game cycles, begin multiple playthroughs, experience the game multiple times, experience the game with other players and between other worlds, creates the opportunity for the game itself to be a rune in that discursive way. This is another sense in which play itself and the poetic of the game construct a parallel to literature, and it would be hard to argue Renaissance parallels are not at least passingly aesthetically relevant to the games. Moving from discussions of time to discussions of memory, Huey notes in his discussion of the influence of Roman runes that, quote, Moreover, one must remember that these vaunts of poetic immortality coexisted with the disturbing Roman practice of demnatio memoriae. As the severest punishment of a citizen, this sanctioned erasure purged his or her name from all civic records. Statues would be removed, names chiseled out of public inscriptions, the corpse unmourned." End quote. This, of course, is a powerful influence on Dark Souls, especially in the presence or absence of the Nameless King, with his statues removed and name forgotten as punishment. The nature of the Nameless King's punishment and its reason, therefore, was of key importance for me to note during our adventure through the games, and I believe it has a special unsung significance in the form of its clear, in the context of Dark Souls 3, relationship to Gwyn's children's also technically unnamed mother, to Rosaria, to ideas around Velka and Sin itself, and so on. The Nameless King not only is driven from history, he also exists exclusively in the past, when a storm is called down with a great grave fog upon Archdragon Peak. He is in some ways himself a ruin, more a fixture in time than an actor upon it. A quotation that Hue uses from Isidore of Seville references the etymology of the idea of vestiges as vestigia or vestigium, in the sense of footprints of those who have gone before. In this sense, the blood pools of other players who have died and one's own soul retrievals are themselves ruins. These remains of what came before are engaged with as echoes, performed a second time, a kind of communication with the past. It will occur to players that this is similar to the message system in the Dark Souls games. Players leave messages on the ground, including ghostly presences of the players who made them in the case of Dark Souls 3. As was alluded to earlier, these messages have their own poetic structure, limited vocabularies with limited conjunctions, but these limitations fall away in the scope of the digital world, applied in various physical locations associated with landmarks or characters that create new meanings. Amazing chest ahead, and so on. Moving to the particulars of the nature of runes, Hui says, quote, the moral of Stonehenge and the divergent accounts of its origins demonstrate that monuments offer competing and contradictory accounts of national history. For the victorious, the runes are the totem of the enemy's destruction. For the defeated, an ignominious reminder of shame. Stonehenge, at once a surviving structure, a grave, and an imprint of the eternal marks of treason, constitutes the irony of a perfect counter-monument. The Neolithic formations have survived, but their message to posterity is a famous mystery. The anonymous Stonehenge is an inversion of Lucan's dictum that I discussed in Chapter 3, quote, Even the runes have perished, end quote. Etiam periere ruinae, and every stone has a story, nullum est sine nomine saxum. For here is an abiding rune, utterly mysterious to all. Whereas the runes of Troy and Rome are overly determined with meaning, the enigma of Stonehenge mocks us with its impenetrable silence, end quote. Sometimes Dark Souls is, in the tradition of the poetics of runes, a Troy, and sometimes it is Stonehenge. 
A certain amount of this is the variable information that a player in the game may receive. Dark Souls famously gives key pieces of information about its world and that world's people and places in item descriptions, which some players may not even encounter or pay any mind. How many times have you walked by a local or regional structure that was fallen into ruin without paying it any mind, treating it as signifying nothing more than the dirt or the sky? Alternatively, how fiercely and romantically do you remember a house or other structure from your childhood in terms of its real emotional significance in a time gone by? I'm reminded of a famous quote from one of my favorite poets, Gertrude Stein, who once said, referring to her childhood home long after she had grown up, quote, There's no there there. The word, the idea, as well as space, has structure, and therefore it also may become a rune of one sort or another. The digital spaces of Dark Souls may become runes twice over, representing aged places from prior eras slowly losing themselves to time, even as slowly they drift into our memories too. Hui is also preoccupied as we have been with Nietzsche in some small regard, as he chooses to open the fifth chapter of his book on the poetics of runes with a quote from the very same text we have been pondering here, which states, quote, if a temple is to be erected, a temple must be destroyed, end quote. I have played through the runes of the Dark Souls trilogy, but I am now called upon to build my city where Gwyn's once stood. Anor Londo's brick and mortar cannot be sustained by the ashes of its own kingdom. The old temple has failed to rebuild itself from its own ashes because it consumed itself through fire. In this way, when old ideologies threaten to drag societies back through time, they are immolating society and themselves. The kindling and the fading fire are wonderful symbolic indictments of a philosophy that refuses to die, that tries to transcend the march of time and conservatively prevent progression. Ironically, as opposed to letting sleeping gods lie, the fire consumes them into nothing by placing them in competition with a new world struggling to be born. In Christian metaphor, first, the historical Christ died on the cross at the hands of non-believers as a tragedy, but his second death in the fires of conservatism at the hands of his own faithful is a farce. Shortly following the nod to Nietzsche, Hui also makes our own earlier reference to scripture invoking ashes, this time utilizing a translation of God's punishment of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, quote, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return, end quote. The poetics of dust and ash are indeed a poetics of the ruined, and also of Dark Souls. The irony of divine punishment to which Hui points is compounded by the reversal of Dark Souls. The first to become ash in the linking of the fire is God himself. Hui even calls upon notions of incineration specifically in a sermon by John Donne called Death's Duel, where the dual deaths might there reflect the perceived dual nature of man. Again, this is compounded by the mechanics of Dark Souls, where death has great multiplicity. When players die, they return to bonfires kindled with the ashes of other humans, and the ashen one of Dark Souls 3 is an unkindled, a revived being of ash returning to the world. In commentary on the work of the French poet Du Bellay, Andrew Hue notes that, quote, In Les Antiquités, Du Bellay makes Rome into her own grave. By overturning the topographic limits of a place as that which is defined by its boundaries, he strategically reduces physical Rome to formless matter so that he can recreate it as a phantasm in his poetry. As such, he forces his readers to revisit both architecture's and poetry's primal function as the burial place and practice of remembering the dead. Rome is, at once, corpse and monument, like an Egyptian mummy. As poetry, it exists as a sema of a sema. Rome is the only monument to Rome, and only Rome conquered Rome. Rome de Rome est le seul monument, et Rome, Rome a vaincu seulement. The city loses its identity and becomes merged with the undifferentiated mass of the cosmos, and since ashes and dust as particles do not remain fixed in any earthbound location, what is left in the Roman landscape, Dubelet suggests, is la grange du rien, nothing but a geography of emptiness, scribbled marks on the dust." End quote. In this case, Hue explains that Sima in the Attic Greek etymological sense was a sign and also a grave, presumably linked because of the markers left at grave sites. In this way, per our understanding, the sign itself, the signifier standing in for the meaning we take, this is also a rune. Rome exists poetically as a sign of a sign, a grave of a grave, 
a grave of a sign, a sign of a grave. Du Bellay's meaning in saying Rome alone is a monument to Rome, that Rome alone vanquished Rome, makes of Rome an internal continuity, where Rome is Rome's sole sign. The signifier is troubled because it negates itself. This sign means death. When all the bosses of Anne Orlando or Castle Drangleic are departed, when the player may return to witness these sights, does their emptiness not suggest the same? When the player shuts off the game, do these digital tombstones crumble and wear away? Or is it stored somewhere, the epitaph of their rune? In parallel with this discussion of runes and my earlier invocation of a gambin, I am put in mind of some words from Walter Benjamin in his The Origin of German Tragic Drama, including his Meditation on Allegory, where he says, quote, In the rune, history has physically merged into the setting, and in this guise, history does not assume the form of the process of an eternal life so much as that of irresistible decay. Allegory thereby declares itself to be beyond beauty. Allegories are, in the realm of thoughts, what runes are in the realm of things." End quote. I was prompted to seek out this quotation, due also to a reference to its latter part contained in Andrew Hui's work. It is not, I think, a totally unheard of position at the time of writing that in Critique of the Arts, we should consider allegorical exegetic meaning a kind of dead meaning, where otherwise art may have a poetics that generates meaning in itself. I would feel greatly dismayed here were I to attempt to rob a game like Dark Souls which says so much by being so indirect and open, of its many meanings by confining its beauty to only those meanings I perceived. I have, at the same time, a loyalty to the openness and honesty that comes with my perspective, and so this is my Dark Souls, specifically. But my hope is that a descriptive account of the game, its mechanics, its gameplay, and all elements of design will show how and why I have this read on the setting, the themes, the characters, the lore, and all elements of meaning. For a perception of Dark Souls to be established, many perceptions must be denied. This is destructively true of those exegetic and hermeneutic meanings generated by allegory. As Benjamin puts it, quote, This is what determines the character of allegory in the form of writing. It is a schema, and as a schema it is an object of knowledge, but it is not securely possessed until it becomes a fixed schema, at one and the same time a fixed image and a fixing a sign, end quote. Dark Souls is so deeply invested in the player's interpretation that to tell you what the game means, and why, is also to fix what should not be fixed. Rather, in generating that meaning through play showing it forward, I hope to have presented you with the pieces of what this game is, and how it creates what meaning it may. The game has allowed for this, and so in discussing what it means, must we. The physicality of Dark Souls, in the sense of its use of digital space and how that trespass of our human character in the god's domain itself is a profanation, is compounded further by the play itself being a profanation of sacred imagery per Agamben's commentaries and profanations, where play makes common what is a part, and socially human what is divine. So too does the player character of Dark Souls profane sacred spaces. We see further parallels in how sin mechanics work in the games, and, in Gwyn's first sin itself, a parallel to the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A poetics of digital games and a poetics of the holy unite in these instances to produce a deep, profound experience, one which in this particular way transcends other genres or art and even other games. Michael Lieb discusses the aforementioned fruit and God's prohibition of its consumption to Adam and Eve in the garden as it relates to Paradise Lost. Of course, if we think on Eden, we can see a remarkable parallel in the Ringed City, a city from a bygone age, the first age, occupied by primordial men, infested with the dark, walled off from the world. Dialogue from NPCs in the DLC describes the Ringed City also as resting at world's end, which is a poetic phrasing used to invite notions of the end of the world, a callback to the first cutscene of the first game, but also its physical location. The Ringed City exists in both time and space at the end of the world. It is in a very real way the last concrete and distinct location as the cycles of fire cause the world to fall in on itself and crumble. The visual color and splendor of the city itself, outlasting all despite drowning in darkness, is like so many other machinations of Gwyn and his family, a deceit, revealed to us when we finally reach its front doorstep by a lone pygmy. In reaching a waking Filionor, a sin which requires trespassing into the church despite God's command, we break the spell that has contained the pygmies in rotted time, and finally the Ringed City lapses into the same final end of days as the rest of the world, and all is reduced to the ash of ages. 
The Ashen One, the player character of Dark Souls 3, is therefore fated by their name to be the last one standing in the ashes of the world itself, just as they were reborn from those ashes to bring justice to that world. The poetics of Ash, Rebirth, Mankind, God, Christian symbolism and justice weave into a narrative subversion. In Dark Souls 2, the phrasing of the first Firekeeper in the opening cutscene, a woman who herself has outlasted a great kingdom, draws attention to the loss of sight implicit in literal darkness, with the metaphorical level of darkness in the mind as one loses their memory and sense of self. This is woven into the continuing narrative of the game as we are told we will stand before Drangleic's decrepit gate without really knowing why. This holds doubly true as we are standing in the aftermath of what will become our own actions as we travel to the past, but also appeals to the idea that our character is losing who they are, such that victory on this path will mean not an exaltation of the self, but an erasure or erosion of the self, and that visual motif of darkness returns as this culminates in our character free-falling and being swallowed whole. We awaken in a land and time between that future from which we came and the past to which we will soon arrive, and throughout our adventure the organization of areas of digital space build themselves a rhythm, lands once great with lords forgotten and fallen fading into one another, some runes all but lost, others lingering only just. As one final reference to Hui's work, I'd like to leave off on his reference to Milton, building this second text analyzing poetics back into the utility we received from the first. Hue states, quote, Milton, Spencer's successor and closest reader, also thought much about runes and poetry, but his focus is not the decayed magnificence of ancient Rome, but the decayed magnificence of human nature. End quote. I think this brings us back to the important parallels in this ruined world to the state of humanity and the player. The relative silence of the player protagonist parallels the relative silence of these ruined vistas, and their coherence or lack thereof with each other may generate feelings of purposefulness or purposelessness in the audience. In fact, this distinction seems most pronounced with the reception of Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2, with players often citing this exact design feature in the reasons for preferring one over the other. You probably noticed earlier that I listed a few of the poets who are quoted in part as fixtures of this essay. I left one out. Specifically, I would ask that you consider the poetic language employed by T.S. Eliot in his poems The Hollow Men and The Wasteland. Across these, we see compelling visions of mankind reduced to dust, a lingering group of hollows, dead roots and stony ruins, deathless damnation, a presence of absence, something that lingers, a kingdom of death, a land shrouded in darkness, the shadow that grows long, the end of the world. I have no doubt, especially given Miyazaki's inspiration from English literature, that the Dark Souls games were either inspired by T.S. Eliot directly, or by work which was in turn inspired by T.S. Eliot. In fact, as the observant audience member may have surmised, I think much of Dark Souls has a strong inspiration in the traditions around Western poetry. These visions enchanted generations with echoes of sorrow, something between mourning and longing. And this is precisely the enchantment of Dark Souls something between mourning and longing. In particular, there are echoes of these poetics in the opening cutscenes of the first game and the second game, describing the character of the Hollows especially, but also the lost kingdom of Drangleic and the undead awaiting the end of the world. All great poems, all great video games, and every great work of art from the mundane to the classic, from the avant-garde to the commonplace, from the acclaimed to the unaccredited, all throughout history to me share, I think, one commonality. Good art is honest. Its honesty may be intended or otherwise, it may be unrelated to strength of craft by a conventional understanding of the medium, but to make a good work of art in this sense is, as I once wrote in a poem myself when I was younger, to cut oneself open and see the ink that flows out. Good art is naked. It lacks not necessarily complexity, but artifice. Honest art may not even be of a high quality, but it is good for the world in the way that even food prepared with little expertise in the way of culinary craft may be good for the heart. All honesty may not lend itself to truly great works of art, remembered for all time, but a great work of art is honest. What I have tried to do here is tell a story, to show first by example how gaming can generate a poetic meaning, where in fact there may not be one right answer among many inferior answers but merely a pleasing structure generating that meaning. And then I have attempted to show why this avenue is meaningful, 
to these games specifically, to gaming in general, to our lives, to our culture. This essay is not a great work of art, it's just a tribute, a self-portrait, and a story about a story. I've made no secret in the past that I've felt YouTubers are too free with the format of the excessively long video essay. These essays may range from somewhere between 5 to 20 hours when their parts are all added up, but suffice it to say that if you're writing something that's beginning to go beyond Kill Bill in length, then in proportion to the ask placed on your audience that they give you all that time and attention, you should be delivering something quite intriguing. I have in turn often felt that if you spend the entire length of the video summarizing and compartmentalizing each scene without ever digging much deeper into the material, you're essentially creating something that's all fluff. It's an inflated summary, and some of these seem to be made this way almost to give viewers something to have to listen to on their commute or while they play video games. They're practically podcasts and benefit from scripting mainly insofar as it makes them unlikely to omit a turn of events in the film. The breakdowns of films that exist this way are always the worst to me, because why watch something two to five times the length of the movie whose insights are mainly relegated to noting whether a joke lands or whether a big explosion looks cool? This is probably the worst way to write an essay. That's what I used to think, but my contrarianism isn't relegated exclusively to arguing with other people. I also use it to grow. I realized when I set out to write this essay that I was spending a lot of time myself detailing even a portion of what can or does occur in a playthrough of the Dark Souls games. If I were to detail every NPC questline, break down every hidden element of the game world, delve into every lore implication, this video would be something approaching the 6 or 7 hour mark, even if I rushed it. I'm hoping to keep it modestly watchable. It's not that short videos are superior to long ones. Theoretically, the longer video is superior because it can contain more details. However, when I find that some YouTube critics use the longer format to cram as many observations in as possible, others mostly just start listing things. I think the real difference for me is when I'm watching an 8 hour video about a video game, and the reviewer is going through each feature of the gameplay and how playing through them impacts the experience, I feel a sense of thoroughness, whereas when I'm watching a 5 part series where each part pushes an hour and is about a different element of a film, and the film reviewer in question doesn't actually talk about the benefits of different elements in the camera work or the lighting all that much, but just describes what's happening on screen, that feels more like going through the motions for fun and for profit. A paint by numbers too long review is always one that just starts giving you information that isn't mechanical, just observational. This happens, then this happens, then this happens. I liked it, I didn't like it, it was funny, it was cool, it was annoying, and so on. An incisive too long review describes a bunch of things to walk you through the process, connecting dots, and then allows those connections to yield a greater observation about what's happening within the source material. There's a method to the madness, something on the other side of the window, and this can be valuable to retrospective analysis over a review, and in the case of video games in particular, because there's just so much information. I can imagine a YouTuber reviewing a single book easily breaking down the poetics of individual chapters and spending hours upon hours on such a review, so why shouldn't they? There's nothing inherently wrong with it, but I do think it needs to yield a certain kind of analysis. I don't think it's a coincidence that the creators of and fans of this format tend to be so obsessed with the notion of approaching the work of art objectively. Frankly, I think that's clown behavior for a couple reasons, not the least of which being that I've seen people call their way too long reviews objective while yielding minimal insight and barely even discussing the craft of the film, how a specific camera angle or cut in a certain part of a film yielded a certain effect. It's laughable to call that objective analysis. It's objective in the way that the spark notes of a film is objective. It isn't exactly 100% total access to perfect, pure objectivity, but it's definitely something similar due to being mostly descriptive. But it doesn't benefit from its descriptive nature because it's so barely concerned with the poetics of the source material. It's analytical in the way that a grocery shopping list is analytical. It's just the stuff that's there, and not even in depth. Breadth is not depth. Breadth in a video communication medium is investment. Videos like these are popular, I think, not because they're smart, but because they're narratively driven. I don't mean that they're incisive narrative analysis, I mean that they're telling an actual story. You're hearing someone essentially tell you the story of them watching a film or playing a game, and that's largely why I set out to write this video this way. It was a challenge to me, like I was reporting on events in a documentary fashion, but from my own personal perspective as subject and documentarian. This is Super Souls Me. 
I ate Dark Souls every day for a month, and all I got was this lousy bias narrative. Actually, I can't even make that joke here, because it's the joke that Noah Caldwell Gervais uses to open and title his Dark Souls trilogy video essay, a fact I only became aware of when I was recording and editing this essay, and had to go back and make this acknowledgement after Demon Mama brought him up when talking about my work. I had never seen a Noah Caldwell Gervais essay, probably surprising to some people, but I felt obligated to check his video out to see if, after a novel-length number of pages, I should just scrap this bogus attempt at talking about this game series and how it teaches us to approach gaming. After all, my process has always been that if someone has done it better, I'd rather just recommend, or better yet, talk about their work, than try to do the same thing but poorly. Maybe that's what I ended up doing anyway. I do feel happy to report that Noah and I made different videos. The first two-thirds of my video are basically structurally similar to his, moving through the story and gameplay, asking questions about the ideas and design, describing different areas and characters, and so on. This is, after all, a retrospective. I differ from his takes in some significant ways. Firstly, I do think Western theology and religion are an excellent lens for viewing this story. Noah says he thinks Buddhist thought is a natural choice as a frame of reference for the Dark Souls series, because the ideas about why suffering occurs in life better contextualizes Gwyn and Sin than Western tropes of fantasy godly pantheons. My disagreement with this should be self-evident, but I stand opposite this view specifically because I appreciate Noah's reasoning. Fantasy pantheons tend to be based on Greek, Norse, Celtic, Hindu, or other ancient religious traditions, and I agree that beyond some aesthetics, these aren't the best choices. However, this commentary of pantheons versus sin and suffering frustratingly neglects the most obvious point of reference, Abrahamic traditions, namely Christianity. Portrayals of an Abrahamic-style god in Japanese media are not uncommon, and neither are Christian symbols and ideas. In fact, Japanese video games themselves frequently have dystheistic takes on modern narratives addressing theodicy. Noah also says shortly after that he chooses poetic allegory as a way to interpret the game, which I find funny in how well it overlaps with my approach, and how strongly it engenders the exact question I sought to ask about how a poetics of video games can be inferred from and seen through how we understand meaning in Dark Souls. I think with those two long video essays, not Noah's, not H Bomber Guy's, but another secret third kind of essay, are missing is not necessarily a specific contrived conclusion, they're too driven by observation to make instituting a restrictive specific reading feel like anything more than a lack of objectivity, even though the worst ones aren't even all that great at avoiding doing that. No, I understand now what I didn't previously. You're not lacking some kind of necessary specificity, your generality is your strength once you've set out to do something this engrossing. No, you're lacking a framework. If you don't differentiate between a framework and forming some sort of specific interpretation of the text, you'll be wandering through the wasteland of your own cutting room floor forever. I know the feeling. As yet another instructive example, imagine trying to see the film Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope through the lens of spirituality. You might then become interested in adopting a framework that treats spirituality in a certain way. You might then choose to examine it through a comparative religious lens, with particular attention paid to elements like differing philosophies of the Force. In fact, there's already some material like that on YouTube, perhaps I'll add my own contribution one day. But you could also look at Star Wars through a Freudian lens and diagnose… well, you know. Feel free to google Freudian and watch the Star Wars films if you don't get that joke. The further problem with not having a framework isn't just that it makes you unfocused, it makes you ignorant. Everybody has a framework, idiot, it came free with your human consciousness and historical societal particularity. No, the issue here is that if you cannot afford to think, thoughts will be assigned for you. If you do not consciously adopt an analytical framework with self-awareness, you will implicitly behave as if you have one through a lack of self-awareness, and often inconsistently in ways that make your points stand at odds with one another. If you do not ask yourself what your framework in this essay is and commit to it, then the generality of your work will begin to feel like objectivity in the same way that a narcissist believes they are seeing the truth of the world when they simply have an emotional reaction to it. In fact, this ideological narcissism is one of the major commonplaces of problematic views people tend to have about the world in general, but I'll have to leave that someday for some of my The Last Jedi videos series. Ironically, to resolve this problem is not to shy away from the subjectivity of a framework, but to choose it consciously, because being self-aware in your own frame of reference is fundamental for even an imitation of objectivity that isn't just masturbatory navel-gazing. 
Of course, I may appear to be condemning something in which I am participating. Perhaps this is me at my most masochistic. My chosen hermeneutic framework in this video was something I had as a lingering taste in my mouth from writing my Bioshock Infinite retrospective, that being liberation theology. The fundamentals of liberation theology at its most general is that it is a Christian ideology rejecting oppressive structures by seeing them as manifestations of sin. Greed is the most usual culprit, but also pride and envy and other such emotions. However, because I'm a sucker for comparative frameworks, and you can have more than one, in case you are wondering, it's really the targeted self-awareness and informed frame of mind that we're after here, not marriage to a single point of view, I chose to build on that idea by seeing Dark Souls as a series as liberatory in relation to Christian metaphor. The sin of man instead becomes the sin of God, the miracle is instead a tool and article of faith unremarkable, God and all his lineage are far from perfect, he has his power by happenstance and is hardly a judicious ruler, his gifts to mankind were deceits and curses, he lived only for himself, and his perpetual existence is itself an offense against the world, and so on. All these, of course, could then be said about a human ruler. This is an inversion, not a total refutation, but a way of embracing by opposing. In this sense, Dark Souls has a pessimistic liberatory distheism. It's not necessarily even an anti-theism or anti-religion as such, because prayer and miracle and faith, because prayer and miracle and faith can easily have a place in the player character's very way of challenging God. So it becomes that embracing for the purposes of opposition. You can end Gwyn's reign with some of his own lightning, if you like. How's that for poetic? I used the term anti-biblical earlier in this essay, and I meant it. This is all to say that I think the ideal too-long video essay on YouTube uses descriptive poetics and probably effective stylistics to document the viewer film or gamer game relationship, and break down how it works in a general but also detail-oriented manner. You've got to have a framework, but I no longer inherently dislike that style of video essay. I've seen its potential benefits, especially when it comes to video game analysis, and to be honest, if I've got days worth of footage of me playing these games in my hard drive right now, this video could be almost any length and it would still be more concise, so it's not that bad. If you're one of those YouTubers who writes long essays and tries to be objective, I would caution against thinking you can engage with meaning without generating it. But if you would just admit to being willing to take certain meaning for granted and avoid hermeneutics as much as possible, there's probably a great deal of untapped potential to do a 10 hour video looking at every shot and sequence of a film that you and your audience like from the lens of a poetics of film. That's not objectivity, it's something better and more real. Granularity. I can respect granularity. Because I was preoccupied with writing an essay that was also part instructive walkthrough and part structured narrative, I became interested in approaching the games in a way that made sense in that light. For example, I chose to take the stories of all three games together, with all their DLC, as a kind of larger gaming experience. Attempting this has been a tall order, but it does allow for even more comparative analysis and a kind of unique approach narratively. Incentivizing readings that draw together elements of gameplay, story, and structure. I also tried to approach the story using some metaphor, which has been aided by the use of literal poetry as well as contributing to the inverted liberation theology reading. As I did so, I tried to explain how you, the viewer, the reader, the player, could approach these games to have that fun for yourself, even down to pointing out how I beat certain bosses or traversed certain areas. On all levels, my goal was to make this game approachable specifically with four key audiences in mind. 1. The veteran player who is looking for a retrospective with new critical insights. Two. The new player who is looking for inspiration to give these games another try. 3. The curious potential player who would be open to trying these games but hadn't given it much thought. And 4. The non-player who is only interested in seeing a game that they won't play explained and analyzed. Once I realized that different types of video game videos and essays play to different concentrations of those audiences, I decided to make something for everyone or die trying. Which as I hit the 153 page mark feels not impossible. People who try to teach about the history of English literature writing, narrative, and storytelling often attempt to reach back through history to the oldest, most famous written stories. In the modern English language, we reach for Shakespeare with his Hamlet, or Romeo and Juliet. In Old English, we reach for Beowulf. Before written English, we reach for the Greek playwrights and poets, for competing versions of Oedipus, or for Homer and his Iliad or Odyssey. These legacies help to form the foundation for the history of the written narrative in our language, our canon. 
However, Shakespearean plays have a logic to their writing in that their meter creates a rhythm such that actors can remember their lines. They were written to be spoken, to be seen live. So it is with Homeric epics and the Greek plays. Even the oldest surviving copy of Beowulf is generally agreed to not be the oldest and most original version of the story. Storytelling in the air quotes Western canon has run a multi-thousand year arc from the spoken live experience to the recorded written word all the way around to the live expression of narrative once more via the video game. Those who neglect this new expression of the old tradition do so at the peril of their ignorance. The thrum of Homer and Shakespeare's hearts beat within these digital spaces. The influence of human thought and intention cascades through era after era. The art preserved and legacy of art passed on rescues us, our essence, our spirit forward. And is this not exactly how the subplot of the little painter girl in Dark Souls 3 rounds out the final piece of Dark Souls content we will ever get? This is very much also what the Dark Souls games are about. How do we draw all these ideas together? To play a video game for a prolonged period of time uninterrupted, moving from area to area to accomplish tasks with minimal dialogue or cutscenes, engenders questions of how this game can be measured, what its defining storytelling rhythm even is, and as we move through these questions we begin to see the game's story as itself a digital thing, as a rhythm of map geometry and enemy placement, of timed animations and hitboxes, and the video game emerges as having its own poetics. Ludo poetics, then, is just that, an effort to define the video game and draw meaning from the video game by seeing that meaning, including narrative, as arising in the beats and breaks and rhymes and rhythms of its gameplay mechanics. I have preoccupied myself here in this essay with religious symbolism in part because I think it makes clear which pieces of this meaning are the hermeneutic and which are the poetic. The point is not that hermeneutic meaning vanishes in a poetic reading of Dark Souls, but rather that a poetic understanding of that meaning bridges the gap between gameplay and narrative. The hermeneutic diagnosis of what the story really means might captivate us by presenting new, unexpected ideas or comforting reliable ones, and the poetic process of how that meaning is generated may provide us with understanding of how those ideas, should we accept them, are brought into being, but both of these views are incomplete without the other for the sole reason of our agency. We are playing a game. The player has a role in generating the work's meaning that is quite active, and so the meaning cannot be presumed, and its method of presentation to the player cannot be ignored. For one last point of reference, I'd like to return to the field of video game studies again. In Gonzalo Fresca's article, Ludologist Love Stories 2 Notes from a Debate That Never Took Place, he draws on his well of experience to try to resolve the issue of video game studies, here treated under the banner of ludology, being seen as separate from narrative studies for some peculiar reason. He ends the discussion by saying, quote, The real issue here is not if games are narratives or not, but if we can really expand our knowledge on games by taking whichever route we follow. So far, I am convinced that we should privilege other forms of representing reality, such as simulation, which are more coherent with the characteristics of games. But of course, that idea is open to debate." End quote. I hope that in both invoking a poetic understanding of video game mechanics as well as drawing upon established poetic analysis in related subjects, I have contributed to this debate. My position should be clear. Video games have narratives, but because the narrative is generated through play, they require their own specialized approach, which should be conscious of the player's hermeneutic point of reference as well as the developer's chosen ludopoetics. As I wrote this essay, I became less concerned with what specifically the From Software team was trying to tell us, and more concerned with how they were telling it, and with what meaning that conveyance in turn generated. Ludo poetics is the key. The rhythm of the game is the path forward. All these beats make a song of other instruments, a narrative from the mechanical, a wordless chant. We choose to advance the dark of humanity or the light of God. We accept our place in history or rebel against what history would compel us to do and be. We seize power, usurp power, fall to power, or finally walk away from power and accept the course of nature. For the fires of God are fed with souls, and souls are the currency of power, the echoes of human history, and the white light that casts the darkest shadow. These holy spaces, these profane spaces, these digital runes, this play of light and dark and God and man flow into a structure, a structure of poetic beats, of human verses, until you set the game down to pick it up and play again. And it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, 
the minor fall and the major lift, the baffled king composing. Hallelujah. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore? And yesterday, or centuries before? The feet, mechanical, go round. A wooden way of ground or air or aught. Regardless groan, a quartz contentment like a stone. This is the hour of lead, remembered if outlived. As freezing persons recollect the snow. First chill, then stupor, then the letting go. Do you remember the question I put to you at the very beginning of this essay, phrased otherwise? What was it, after all, that I had done wrong? Where did I make my mistake in trying to approach these games, and what, to the contrary, finally hooked me back in? What was it that took me back there again? to try and try and fail and fail, until I finally was finished once more, in victory as opposed to defeat. Well, I have an answer for you, if you haven't guessed it. When I finally picked up Dark Souls 3 and beat it, and then beat it again and again, I was sure I could handle the other two games and I was right. I played Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 in tandem, switching over to the other when I made a little progress and got stuck in one then switching back again after making a little progress and getting tired in the other. I beat all three, and after the first time, it clicked, and I loved these games, and I brought myself back around to love them all. Regardless of my preferences, coming back in 2016 after bouncing off these games in 2011 was like a warm bath of sunlight to awaken a sleeper. I felt alive. I don't always feel alive. Even as I write this, I feel I am in troubled times. I wonder about my security, my future, my success. I fear I have very little of any of them, even when I gather them all together in my cupped hands like grains of sand or piles of ash or specks of dust. What is the difference between feeling alive and feeling dead? Is it that same feeling come again to manifest itself here, in this dark room? Is it like memory in that it comes before and we feel it after? Is it like a poem in that it generates for us what we come to feel? This question of what I was doing differently can't be brought back to game mechanics. It can't be brought back to game mechanics or what games mean, not really. I only did one thing differently the second time. I had help. I bought one of those old printed guides that I saw on the shelf next to the game in the store, I googled weird questions that I had about the game's counterintuitive or unexplained mechanics, and I talked to people. I asked dumb questions. I got advice from friends, from creators, from forums, from people I barely knew or didn't know. That was like the difference between living and dying. When you aren't with other people, when you don't have community to come back to after time apart, moments weigh heavy and oppressive. Without people who came before, people who come after, or people who stand with you, what do you have when you play? I remember the voices of those who came before, and if you're listening, perhaps you hear my voice still. I remain, as ever, your faithful friend and thankful member of your community, from this day, as long as you will have me, until darkness, my old friend, comes to talk with me again.